You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah? Well, who is it, his wife? Do they live there? Well, can't somebody stop him from beating her up? What's the address there? Yeah. Yeah. You are in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah, don't worry about it. They'll be right there. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour... 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. After midnight, 33 patrolmen were assigned to regular posts, which they walked on foot. Ten others were assigned as operators and recorders in the precinct's five sector cars. These men were under the direct supervision of three sergeants. Sergeant Tierney on telephone switchboard duty in the station house, Sergeant Rosen on foot in congested districts, and Sergeant Waters on radio motor patrol in a sergeant's car operated by patrolman Mercado. The sergeants were directly responsible to Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer on the job. One of the functions of the sergeant on radio motor patrol is to respond to every call within the confines of the precinct broadcast by the Manhattan Communications Bureau. The reason for this is twofold. To provide adequate supervision at the scene of an occurrence and to ensure the immediate response of sufficient manpower in the event the occurrence is of a more serious nature than the original call to the police indicated. At 8.05 p.m., a radio call was broadcast for sector car number three, a disturbance in the hallway at 762 East 74th Street, a four-story old law tenement. As sometimes happens, the sergeant's car was closer to the scene and the first to arrive in the block. Next to the end of the block down there. Yes, sir. Well, it doesn't look like there's much to it, Sergeant. Supposed to be inside the hall. Okay. Let's go. Yes, sir. I don't see anything. Come on. Nothing. Yeah. Did you call the cops, lady? Yes, it was me. What's the trouble? Him, the crazy one, third floor to the rear. Yeah? He was beating her and kicking her and pulling her up the stairs. Who? His wife, the poor thing. It's all quiet now. He must have settled it. Oh, he probably settled it by killing her. That's how he settled it. He's crazy. He's crazy enough to kill her. What's their name? Gerard. Mr. and Mrs. Gerard. He never seen anything like the way he beats up that poor woman. Did any of the other neighbors hear this? Oh, I don't know whether they did or not. I don't know whether they care, even. All I know is that I'm tired of it. Sick and tired of it. He comes home crazy and beats her to an inch of her life. Tonight in the hall. Bad enough in their own flat, but tonight you have to do it in the hall. There's only one flat in the rear and the third floor? Yes, that's all. Just one apartment. He ought to be locked up for good, that man. Or better, sent back to the insane asylum. That's where he belongs. Why is he there? Well, I wouldn't say a thing like that if he wasn't. Oh, he's that way, all right. He don't like my cat. I think he poisoned one once. I think he poisoned Cynthia. I swear it was him. Yeah. Well, it seems to have quieted down now, but we'll go up and talk to him. Ask him if he didn't poison Cynthia. I bet he denies it. I just bet he does. What's your name, lady? M- Mrs. Asher. Mrs. Helen Asher. E-S-H-E-R. He had no business poisoning Cynthia. No business at all. All right, Mrs. Asher. You get back inside and we'll we'll take care of it. 
You send him back to that insane asylum now. That's where he belongs. You send him back there. All right, just close the door. We'll see you in a minute. I will, but don't you forget. You too, young man. We won't forget. All right, if you promise. Okay. Oh, it's going to be a great debate who's the psycho in this case, Sergeant. Yeah. Put your light on the mailbox there. Yes, sir. Well, she has got the right name. Gerard. Wait for real. Uh, Let's see what they have to say. Well, you know something, Sergeant? I don't think that cat was poisoned at all. I think it committed suicide. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you've got a point. Mm.
Yeah, I think so. You've got to make them respect you. Because if they don't respect you, you're just like dirt under their feet. I wouldn't go that far, Mr. Gerard. Sometimes neighbors are good to have. I'm not talking about neighbors. I'm talking about wives. My wife. You've got to make them respect you. Well, look. Supposing I come in and we'll talk it over. No. I don't want to talk it over. Come on, now. Open the door. Get away from there. I don't want to have to kill you. Open up and we'll talk it over. I'm warning you. Come on. You can't say I didn't warn you. No, I... I can't say that. And it won't do you any good to count the shots by fire either because I've got a pocket full of bullets and the gun is always loaded. I'm not going to run out of bullets. You can put that down in your book. What's your wife doing, Mr. Gerard? What? What's your wife doing? It's none of your business. Is she in there? Of course she's in there. Where do you think she'd be? Sergeant? Who is it? McConnell, Sergeant. Right you want me up there? Post yourself down there at the front door. Keep the people out of the hall. Okay, Sergeant. Who are you talking to? Another police officer. Oh. Is your wife close to you there? She's right here, yes. Right here, in the living room. I'd like to talk to her. No, I couldn't let you do that. Why not? I couldn't let you do it, that's all. I'm sorry about all this. I don't like to cause anyone trouble. All you got to do is open the door. But I I guess I've got a good excuse. I was in the state hospital, you know. Oh? Were you? That's for people who are sick. A person can have a sick mind just as he can have a sick heart or a sick lung. He's ill, and, and, he, and he can get better. Did you know that? Yeah, I know it. And that's exactly what the doctor told me, and I, I'm glad you realize it. Not, not many people realize that. I want to talk to your wife, Mr. Gerard. Why do you want to talk to her? I just wanted to tell her not to worry. I want to tell her that you won't hurt her anymore. What? I want you to promise me you won't hurt her anymore. I promise you. I give you my word of honor. All right. Now, how about opening the door? No, I couldn't do that. And don't you try it either. I warned you before, and I'm warning you again. I won't try it. You better not. You want to know what's good for you? The only thing is I'm worried about your wife. You don't have to worry about her. I killed her. Uh, a minute ago, you said she was right there. But she is right here, right here, where I killed her. Uh, you wouldn't do a thing like that, Mr. Gerard. I did it. I just couldn't stand it another minute. She could have realized that I have feelings, too. After all, she can't treat me like that. Somebody's got to respect you, or, or you amount to nothing in this world, nothing at all. And they try to make you dirt, dirt under their feet. And I'm tired of all that. There comes a day when, when a man has got to assert himself. Yeah, Mr. Gerard. And this is sure your day. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Tonelli. Within a few minutes, a radio motor patrol car from the adjoining sector, detectives, and an emergency service car equipped with tools and tear gas responded to the scene. Men were placed on every floor of the building, on the roof, on the fire escape, and in the rear courtyard all on the instructions of Lieutenant Matt King, commanding officer of the 21st Detective Squad. When the second call went out over the radio, I was in the office of a public dance hall on York Avenue, discussing with the manager complaints of rowdiness we had received concerning some of his patrons. The call was heard by Patrolman Farrell, who was waiting downstairs in the car. He came into the manager's office and gave me the information. I rang into the station house, and after Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, gave me whatever information he had, we made the run. There were now six department vehicles on the scene, and the sidewalk was crowded with curious civilians. Three men were on the job, keeping the crowd moving as I walked into the building where Patrolman Mercado was posted at the door. Hello, Captain. Mercado, you 
Ricardo. Where's Lieutenant King? Upstairs? No, sir. He's down here in that flat back there. He's talking to the woman who called in with the original complaint. Okay. Oh, uh, yes, sir. What about the wife? Well, the man keeps saying he killed her. All right. Is uh, that where Lieutenant King is? Yes, sir. What the... About three or four years. I couldn't say exactly. Matt? Hello, Captain. The landlord would know how long they've been here. Oh, the super. This is Mrs. Helen Escher, Captain Kennelly. Mrs. Escher? How do you do? Mrs. Escher, you know for a fact that he's been a patient in a mental institution? Well, his wife told me herself, poor soul. Where's he work? Do you know that? I think it's down in Wall Street someplace for an insurance company. He doesn't have much of a job, a little clerk or something like that. He was the one that brought in most of the money. He was always taking time off and being sick and things like that. Hanging out at the bar and grill down at the corner there. I knew something like this was going to happen. I could just feel it. No matter what he did to her, the cruelest thing even, she would brush it off and go right on being civil to him. His sickness, she said. Well, you see what loyalty got her, don't you? Yeah, not much. I'm telling you, he was beating her within an inch of her life on the stairs. I just couldn't stand by and see her take it like that. I just had to call the police once and for all. Oh, all right, Mrs. Asher. Thank you. Do you really think he murdered her in cold blood like that? He says he did. Oh, man. He should have been put away long ago. Long ago. That's what she did for trying to be loyal. I told her. She can't say I didn't tell her. Well, we better see what we can do about him. You be careful now. Don't let him kill you, too. Don't try not to. Okay, Captain. Yeah. Glad to have met you. Thank you. All right, you two come with us. You stay down here. All right, sir. How many shots has he fired, man? Four, Captain. Ricardo. Yes, sir. You come upstairs with us. Yes, sir. He fired four shots. He told Sergeant Waters he had a pocket full of ammunition. Did he shoot his wife? We well, don't know how he killed her. If he did, Ricardo and Sergeant Waters were here within two minutes after the call was put out. Oh, I see. Hello, Captain. Okay, Hello, Bender. Hello. Next floor, Captain. The couple was in their flat already. Sergeant Waters heard no shots. I don't want anybody hurt over this, man. I think we can take him without anybody getting hurt. Good. That's it. First door up there. Stay close to the wall, Captain. Hello, Sergeant. You men hold it there. Okay, Lieutenant. You've been talking to him, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Think he wants to come out now? Give him no sign of it. Uh, Mr. Gerard. Mr. Gerard. What have you got out there? More policemen? Look, Mr. Gerard. And you've got policemen on the fire escape, too. You're making a big mistake, you know. You're forcing me to kill someone else. I don't want to kill anyone else. It's going to be your fault. Everything's going to be your fault. Well, how about unlocking this door and coming out? Then no one else will get hurt. You know I'm not going to do that. You have to do it if you want to get your wife to the hospital. I didn't say I wanted anything like that. My wife is dead. No use taking her to the hospital. You better go away. Leave me alone. Captain. Yeah. He wasn't kidding. I see all four shots came through the door. Yeah, he meant it all right. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come here a second. Okay, Lieutenant. Keep your eye on the door, Mercado. Yes, sir. I'm getting a little impatient with this guy. Well, that's better than getting shot. Yes, sir, it sure is. How much do you think it would take to kick that door in, Sergeant? Not much, Lieutenant. One good boot at the lock. Unless he has an extra bolt on it or a chain. Yeah. What's he going to do while I'm kicking the door in? I was thinking about having the ESD men crack that window from the fire escape, dropping a gas shell in there. If he does any shooting, it'd be toward the fire escape. We could have the door open in the meantime. Sounds all right, Lieutenant. But when he starts shooting, how am I supposed to know whether he's shooting toward the door or toward the window? No. What do you think about the wife? You think she's dead in there? He keeps saying she is. I believe him. Go up to the roof. Take a look at the situation on the fire escape. Okay, Captain? Yeah, sure. Better get back on the door, Sergeant. If he talks, I want him to talk to you. Okay, Lieutenant. All quiet, Sergeant. All right, Captain. All right. These guys can be a lot more trouble than a red-hot gunman. Yeah. Well, you don't have to worry about hurting a gunman, man. And you know you have to take a chance. That's the only way. Mm. This fellow sure is full of fight. Yeah, I guess he is. You mind keeping those people behind the doors? Yeah, Lieutenant. 
Tell me, uh, how long was he confined, Matt? Do you know? Best information we can get, he was up there nearly four years. Why'd they let him out? That's the first question I'm going to ask. Oh. Now, watch it. Take a step down on the roof. Yeah. Back that way. The, uh, window of the room he's in opens onto the fire escape, hmm? Yes, sir. Well, maybe we'll be able to work it. I think so, Captain. Now, watch it here. Yeah. I'll go first. Uh, you've, uh, got a blank brick wall facing this building. Wild shots won't hurt anyone. No. Who's down there? There's Colleen to Luca and two emergency service men. Are you staying away from the window? Yes, sir. This is far enough, Captain. No. Colleen. Yes, sir. Come on up here a minute. Yes, sir. Have they been able to get a look into the room from the window, Matt? He's got the shade drawn down to the bottom. The window's locked. Oh, I see. The only thing they can see is that there's a light on in there. Mm -hmm. Nothing else. Yes, sir. Hello, Captain. Slowly. What's the situation? No change, Lieutenant. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to try something in a few minutes. Yes, sir. We're going to drop a couple of gas shells through the window. In the meantime, the front door will get kicked in. Okay, Lieutenant, fine. It's getting pretty cold out here. Here's how we're going to do it. One ESD man down there has a crowbar. The other one's got the tear gas. Yes, sir. All right, now we'll use the crowbar to knock out the window and drop the shell in. As soon as it takes effect, we'll hit the front door. Yes, sir. And I want everybody out here to stay undercover. You'll probably be shooting this way. Don't try to come in the window. Not until you're sure he's under control. I don't want any dead heroes. Yes, sir. All right. Go on back down there, Crowley. Let you know when we're ready. Right, sir. I'll be here. Okay, Matt. You know it works. Yeah. I think I ought to stay out here with these men. You handle the situation in the hall. That all right, Captain? Okay. It's going to take pretty close timing. Well, I think all you have to do is know we're set before you break the glass. I'll send a man up to pass the word, okay? Okay. All right, Matt. I'll see you. Captain. Yeah. Yeah, Matt. Got to be fast. It will be. Okay. Captain? I'm coming down, Mercado. Nice to ring into the house, sir. Lieutenant Gorman told him to tell you that Inspector McBride is on his way. Oh, and the PC has been notified. Uh, it'll probably be all over by the time they get here. Anything doing in there, Sergeant? I had a couple of words with him, that's all. Nothing new, Captain. Well, okay, here's the story. Yes, sir. When they break the window on the fire escape and drop in a tear gas shell, we'll kick in the door. Okay? Yes, sir. I guess it's got to be okay. You think uh, right about at the lock ought to do the trick, hmm? Yes, sir, that ought to do it. Unless, like I said, he's got a slide bolt with a chain on there, too. All right. You talk to him. See if he's still at the door. Yes, sir. Oh. Mr. Gerard. Mr. Gerard. What is it? Don't you think we've been out here long enough now? How about opening the door and talking to it? I'm talking to you. But this can go on all night, you know. Marcano. Yes, sir. We don't want to be. You go on up to the roof. Tell Lieutenant King we're set any time he's ready. Now, what do you say? Yes, sir. Now, how about it? We've been at this long enough, and so have you. No, not me. I'm going to stay here forever. Forever. That's a long time. I know it. I know it's an awful long time, but I'm going to stay here. Okay. So can we. That's your business. Get set, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I'm set. I'll wait for the glass. All you have to do is go away and leave me alone. I'm not bothering you. I don't bother anyone. No one at all. Just go away. That's all you have to do. There it goes. Get away from there. Hold it. Get away! I'll tell you! Not yet. Not yet. Bill, what are you doing? What's that? Oh. Hold it, yeah. What are you doing to me? Get that out of here. Get in the house. What are you doing? Okay. I want it done. Here it is, Jeff. Give me that. Give me that hand. I've got it. 
Sergeant Waters. Yeah? And how'd they break in? Yeah? Yeah. Now what's missing? Oh, yeah? Now what's the name of the owner there? Oh, he does, huh? Is CB putting out a call on it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me know about that. Okay. Now I'll notify the detectives and let you know. Yeah. All right. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Ethel Everett, Frank Moss, Bill Quinn, and Eric Dressler. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Produced for CBS Radio by John Ives. Art Hanna speaking. 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 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah? How'd they break in? Yeah. Yeah. And what's missing? Oh, yeah? And what's the name of the owner there? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the Nerve Center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Okay. I'll notify the detectives and let you know. Yeah. All right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It had been a comparatively quiet night, but at 10.30 p.m., the police commissioner and the chief inspector paid a surprise visit to the precinct. I conducted them through the station house and then accompanied them on a tour of the precinct returning in time to turn out the platoon for the late tour at midnight. After the turnout, the brass signed the blotter and left. I went into my office to read and sign reports and communications prepared by Patrolman Fallon, the 124 man on the job during the 4 to 12 tour. At 12.40 a.m., Detectives Frank Cassidy and Chris Vitale of the 21st Squad were driving south on 2nd Avenue en route back to the station house following their investigation of a stabbing in a bar and grill on 96th Street. Well, listen, what can you do? I asked if she wanted to go. She said it was too much trouble to get a babysitter, come all the way into New York or something like that. And she didn't have a good time at last year. Oh, this one was better. 
At least the food was good. Yeah, so I hear. Mm. 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 Look, when the light changes, what do you say we go over to that luncheon and see if that Harry showed up yet? We ought to talk to him and find out if he ran into his friend today. Well, he said he'd call me, Deep. I don't know. I don't like the looks of that guy. I don't think he's trying to help us. All right. Frank. Yeah. Take a look across there in the delicate Isn't the door open? I don't see it. There, yeah, you see? Yeah. Pull over there, huh? Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, it's open. Come on. Mm-hmm. With your eyes and my brain, we could make a million dollars. All right, hold it at the window, then. Yeah. Oh, it's awful dark in there. Let's take a look at the door. Mm-hmm. That's been ginned. Mm-hmm. I'll save you in there. Oh, wait a minute. Reach in and see if there's a light switch. Yeah. No, no, nothing. The switch box must be in the back. All right, look, you go around behind the counter. I'll go in front. Okay? Yeah. Watch it. On the floor, you know. Yeah. Anything? No. Nope. Okay. Maybe he's still in back. Yeah, maybe. All right, I'll kick open the swinging door. Just throw your light in there, all right? Yeah, go ahead. Come on. Mm. Oh, nothing. Well, they've been working here all right. Look at that cabinet. Yeah. Let's see if we can find a switch box. <clears throat> Nothing on this floor. I'm going to watch those cases. Hold it. What? I thought I heard somebody out front. Yeah. Get him up back there. Watch it. Hold it. The cop. Hmm? Who is it? Who is it back there? The detective. Come out here. Let me see it. What's a hand? A hand. Battalion. and Cassidy. All right. Okay. Come on back here. You know where the lights are? There's a switch box over here. Oh, yeah. Well, where were those million dollar eyes, dude? Oh, that's better. The hand doors on the post. I got to reach one for a Jimmy back where your flashlight. Well, I'm glad you think first and shoot later. Yeah, you're the place you're going over, huh? Yeah, it sure does. I guess I better ring in. The phone out front. Uh, what's the name of the owner? Hewlett. Victor Hewlett. You better tell the lieutenant to have him notified. He only lives two buildings down. Now, we'll go wake him up. You stay here, huh? Okay. Come on. Yeah. They did a good job in the front door. Yeah. yeah we'll be back in a minute, then. Okay. Yeah. Well, it doesn't look like they got too much out of there, huh? No. But they made a little mess in the back. Broke open the cabinet. Mm. Oh, that's good, I guess. Yeah. Go ahead. I'll check the mail, brother. Yeah. Here it is. Pick the healer. Second front. How's the inside door, huh? Mm. Yeah. Uh, hit the bell. Okay. See that showcase full of sausages there? Yeah. You know what that is? Mm. That's Polish sausage. That's good stuff, real hot. Ever try any? Mm, no, I don't think so. Hit the bell again, will you? Yeah. Krakow, I think they call it. Krakow? That's the name of a city over there. Yeah, I know. Which came first? The sausage or the city? These guys are sound sleeping, you know. Maybe his bell doesn't work. Maybe. How do you like this thing? Pull out the tube. Oh, is it? Oh, yeah. Mr. Healers? What is it? You know what time it is? We detectives, Mr. Healers. Your store's been broken into. The store what? You had burglars. Push the button, open the door, huh? What did they take? Open the door. We'll come up and tell you about it. All right. Just a second. 
How do you serve that sausage? Like an hors d'oeuvre? Yeah, it's good, that one. No, I got it. Second floor front? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can we have a square on this guy before? Another burglar? No. He got stuck up about two years ago. Oh, yeah, those two guys from Jersey. They did about 20 delicatessen. Yeah, that's right. Here, here in the front. Okay. Yeah, he caught him in the act on the 17th, remember? Two men planted in the back when he came in. Yeah. Yes? Come in. Come in. I'm putting on my pants. Did you get them? What'd they take? Well, we don't know. You'll have to tell us that. No, it's locked. Well, they jimmied it. Oh. Excuse me. Get me dressed. Sure. That's all right. Did they do much damage? No, not too bad. What time did you close up, Mr. Well, about 10.30. What, what time is it now? I was asleep. Quarter to one. Can I go like this? I mean, it's, it's all right. Without tie? You better put a coat on. It's cold. Well, I, I got that over here on the rack. Well, I'll say. Uh, do you got your keys to get back in here? Yeah, I got them. Mm-hmm. Who was it? Do you know who it was? No, not yet. Did you notice any strangers come in the store tonight? Well, it's always strangers. Not everybody's a regular. I mean anybody suspicious. That looked around a lot. No, not that I know. Well, go ahead. I got the other one. Mm-hmm. Well, now, what, what do you mean, Jimmy? You broke the front door? Yeah, yeah, that's right. They shoved the bar in between the lock and the door frame, looks like. Mm-hmm. Some people, what some people won't do. Yeah, you're telling me. Not the policeman, huh? Yeah, well, they put it out on the radio. Oh. Cassidy? Oh, hello, Captain. What we got? Burglary thing. Captain? Oh. Oh, okay. You know? were driving by and found the door, Jimmy. Mm-hmm. New door, a new brand new door. No, it can be fixed. Yeah. They don't make them that way anymore. There's one I had. Uh, have any money in the cash register, Mr. Healer? No, there's no money in there. I take it out and leave it open like that. Every night I do. Sergeant. Uh, yes, Captain. Have any cash around here at all? Yeah, I had cash. Get some of these men back on the job, Sergeant. We don't need them all here. Where did you have this cash? Well, I had it in back there in tin box. Where was the tin box? In that brown cabin? That's right. But how did you know that? You were talking in. Go ahead, Captain. Yeah. And they got it. They got the tin box. How much did you have in there, Mr. Healer? Oh, it's plenty. I have plenty in there. How much? Four hundred? Four hundred fifty dollars, something like that. How did they find it? How did they know where it was? You see where they had the no, box? No, be careful, then, Mr. Hebert. Don't touch the Way back there, a little tin box behind the ledger. I, I don't see how they could have found it. Anyone could have found it, Mr. Hebert, if they knew what they were looking for and where to look. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Now back to 21st Precinct and Captain Tonelli. Within a few minutes, the job of the uniformed officers at the scene of the burglary was finished. And with the exception of Patrolman Ahern, the first man on the job, they resumed patrol. The detectives took over the investigation, and they continued to question the owner of the delicatessen, Victor Healer, concerning any suspicious customers that may have been in the store before he closed or during the day. At ten minutes after one, other detectives from the police laboratory arrived to make an examination of the premises for latent fingerprints which might have been left by the burglar or burglars. Contrary to the general opinion, fingerprints left at the scene of a crime are seldom in themselves responsible for the apprehension of a criminal. If an arrest is eventually made through other means of investigation, however, fingerprints left at the scene are conclusive and usually the best evidence of the defendant's presence at the scene. In this instance, the experts were able to obtain no readable prints other than those of the proprietor of the store. The investigation by the detectives continued. I went back to the car, operated by Patrolman Farrell, and resumed patrol of the precinct until 2.30 a.m. when I returned to the station house where I completed some more paperwork. At 3.15 a.m., I lay down on the couch in my office 
After leaving instructions with Sergeant Waters, who was now on telephone switchboard duty, to waken me at 7. At 6.30, the muster room was still, except for the occasional call over the radio monitor and the buzz of the switchboard as the men on post rang in. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yes, he be. Well, there's nobody home there. I had the man on post go by three times. Okay, yeah. TV again, Lieutenant. They wanted to know if we made the notification for the 112th about the man who died in Queens General. I told him we're still trying. Okay. Oh, how about some hot coffee, Lieutenant? No, I just can't. Supposed to snow. I don't see any sign of it. But well, I can do without it. Don't make me mad. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right, 14. Oh, listen. If you see that department of sanitation truck, tell them to handle those garbage cans a little lighter, will you? We had two more complaints from residents on that block yesterday morning. Okay, yeah. I told Meister about the DS stuff, Lieutenant. Okay. Oh, hello, Mr. Hillis. Sergeant. Good morning. Yeah, we're up kind of early for us to have such a big night. Yeah, I know. Well, I got to open the store. Oh, were you able to get that door to stay closed all right? Yeah, the handyman from my building fixed it all right. Good. Is uh, Captain Kennelly still here? I'd like to talk to him. Well, I'll tell you, Mr. Hillis. He's here, but he's sleeping. You see, he's supposed to be off at 8 o'clock, but he's got to go down to the federal grand jury and testify about some counterfeit case he made in arrest him. Oh, sorry. Mm, what is it? About the burglary? Well, in a way, yes. I wanted to talk to the detectives that are working on it. They can tell you anything you want to know. Now, this is personal. I, I know the captain a long time. I'd like to ask him some advice. What to do? Is all right for me to wait? Maybe he wakes up. Well, he told me to wake him up at 7, but that just about gives him long enough to look over the report and turn out the platoon. Will he come back later today? No, when he leaves here a little after 8, he's not too back on a job until tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. Well, if you want to take a chance and wait around, maybe he'll have a few minutes. All right, all right, I'll take the chance. Well, it's up to you. I'll wait for a while. Well, Sergeant, what are you doing? Oh, good morning, Lieutenant. You know, we're up early today. Yeah, got to go to the lineup today and a lot of things to clean up for kind of a night that we have. Well, it was a cutting in a bar and grill on 96th Street. Dad? No, he was too upset that he sent home. Oh, uh, and Mr. Healers here had his store buzzer on. Oh, yeah. Mr. Healers? Lieutenant King, commander of 21st Detective Squad. How'd he do? Detective talk to you, Mr. Healers? Oh, yeah. Uh, Cassidy and Vitelli rolled down the lieutenant. Where are they up there? No, sir, I seen them go out of here about 4.30. Okay. Glad to have met you, Mr. Hillis. Yeah, you'll see you, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And I tell you, Mr. Hillis, the captain won't be up for a while yet. Why don't you go out and get yourself a cup of coffee and come back a little after 7? No, I have some coffee. Oh, excuse me. Yes, yeah, sure. Only place precinct, Sergeant Waters. No, sir, it's all quiet. All right, yes, sir. Uh, oh, Captain, uh, Mr. Hillis is out here at the desk. He'd like to talk to you. All right. Yes, sir. He woke up, Mr. Hillis. Could I see him? Yeah, he said he'd go in right through that door over there. Oh, thank you. I'm much obliged. Oh, it's all right. Now, Lieutenant, the captain's away. Okay, Come in. Wow. Come in, Mr. Hillis. I didn't want to take up your time, Captain. Ah, oh, that's all right. You don't mind if I shave. I've got a busy morning. No, that's all right. What can I do for you, Mr. Hillis? Well, it's about the robbery in my store. Yeah, oh, well, the detectives are handling the case. You want to talk to them? Yeah, I know. I talked to them all night, practically. I hardly get any sleep. Oh, too bad. No, that's all right. I had to stay at the store anyway until the handyman fixed the door so it could be locked up. Well... They know more about the case than anyone. Yeah. Except me. They, they know more about it than anyone except me. You mean there's something you didn't tell them? There's something, yeah. Excuse me. Oh, yes, sir. 
him on track. Jeff, now, I know she's not a bad girl. Some of it's my fault. I, I know that. Who's that? My daughter. My daughter, Alma. You think uh, she broke into the store? I, I don't know. All I know is she, she's the only one who knows where I keep the money box. In the cabinet there. No, nobody else knows. And did you talk to her about no, it? No. I didn't see her. I didn't see her for a week. She, uh, she ran away from home last week. How old is she? Fifteen. She'd be sixteen. Did you report her missing? Well, what's the use of that? I, I couldn't make her come back. Where is she? Do you know? No, I... Look, Captain, I try my best, but what can I do? I, I try to raise it right. But I can't spend 14 hours a day in the store to make a living and raise it right, too. Well, what about her mother? I don't know. Same thing. She ran away, too. She ran away, left me with all the responsibility. When was this? Six years ago. Something like that. Have you heard from her? From my wife? No. You don't know where she is? How could I know? Have you heard from Emma? Not a word. You know why she left? She left because I told her she was too young to hang around with those boys. There those wild boys in the neighborhood there. I told her I wouldn't stand for it. So she said I had nothing to do with it. She, she would do what she wants. So when I got home from the store, the clothes were gone and suitcase. Well, you should have come in and reported a message. No, I wouldn't do no good. Well, you should have let us be the judge of that. We've got a juvenile aid bureau. It's pretty good at getting these things said now. No, it's too late. Too late to get any straightened out. Thief, i got to raise a thief. It was steal from her own father. If she asked me, I would have given her the money. Said she'd got to steal it. Well, you don't know that for sure. I know it. I know it right away. What can they do to her? Is it stealing from a father as bad as stealing from a stranger? Mm, bad enough. What do you want me to do about it, Mr. Hill? I want you to tell me what to do about it. Well, I'd suggest that you tell the detectives what you told me. If I do, what's going to happen to her? Couldn't be any worse than what happens to her if you don't. No. Yeah, it couldn't be any worse. Let's see if they're in. It was uh, Vitaly and Cassidy, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I think so. Uh, uh, Vitaly and Cassidy, yes. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Warner. Uh, Sergeant, uh, Vitaly and Cassidy upstairs. No, sir. They went out of here around 4.30, and I didn't see him come back. Well, who's up there? Then just catching in. Lieutenant King just came in a little while ago. Oh. All right. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Healer. Let's go upstairs. All right. You want... That way. I'll be up on the detectives. Try it. Try my best. This way. Go ahead. What can I do with a girl without a mother? Kind of hard to do something. You've got to admit it's very hard. I, I tried. Go ahead. Uh, Lieutenant King in his office. Yes, sir. Some of the school. Feed her a buy her clothes. I don't, I don't know. Yes. To Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. Good morning, Captain. Hi, oh, Matt. Matt, this is Mr. Healers. His stall was burglarized during the night. Yeah, I know. Just leaving the 61 on it. $450, Mr. Healers? Yeah, about... He thinks he knows who did it. Who's that, Mr. Hewitt? My daughter. My daughter, Elma. You mean she, Jimmy, the door? One of her boyfriends, maybe. I don't know. She ran away from home last week, man. He doesn't know where she is. How old is she? Going on 16. Excuse me. Yeah, sure. And uh, you know where Veith and Cassidy went? Uh, no, sir. All they told me is they were going out on an investigation. Okay. Uh, uh, just a second, Lieutenant. Somebody's coming up. All right. Tell him to come in here. Yes, One of the uh, detectives just came in. How sure are you it was your daughter, Mr. Hewitt? She knew where the check box was. She was the only one. Come in. One city, Lieutenant. Where have you been since 4.30? I'm investigating the burglary. Honestly, Oh, 
Mr. Hewitt just called Captain Tonelli. He knows who did it. So do I, Lieutenant. I've got her out sitting on a bench. What? Uh, Alma? Yeah, that's right, Mr. Hill. She's sorry. The handyman told Cassidy and me all about her and the boy she hung out with in the neighborhood. I want to talk to her. Wait a second, Mr. Hewitt. Where'd you find her, V? She's sleeping in a club room. She's been staying there the whole week. She gave us the name of the boy she talked into breaking open the store. Cassidy went over to his house to get him. I got the tin box and all the money, Mr. Hill. Well, look, I don't want to care about the money. I want to talk to Alma right now. I want to talk to her. All right, take it easy, Mr. Hewitt. Bring her in, Dave. Yes, sir. Alma? My own flesh and blood. Hey, come in here. Did the casino for me? Alma? It's all there. You don't have to worry. All the money. Close the door, Dave. I didn't worry about the money. It's only about you. Only about me. Come here and sit down, Alma. That's nice to have you worry about. Look, don't get smart, Alma. Don't get smart here. All right, Mr. Hewitt. Well, she shouldn't get smart. Oh, you want me dumb. Like you want Mama dumb. Don't compare yourself to her. There's enough like her anyway with us. Compare Why did you break into the store, Alma? To get the money to go to Florida. Yeah, with this boy. She was going to Florida with this boy. Yeah, if you want this one, yeah. And then to go to Florida, you had to steal from me? From your own father? See, Captain, I told you, I tried to raise her right. Raise me? Raise me from what? All right, Elma. I like the way he says raise me. You mean he gave me something to eat and didn't raise me? I raised myself. Okay. What did I raise you right? That was your mother's job. And where was she? She's the only one that had any sense. She got out. She had enough, she got out. What I wanted to do, too, I wanted to get out. No, Elma. And now I'm going to get out. I went to Florida, I'd get out. If I go to jail, I'd get out. Anything that happens is okay with me. I don't care. But none of this would have happened if you'd done like I told you. You just stayed home and hope those boys alone. What was at home? Not you. You were always in the store. All right. Mama had enough. I had enough. Okay. Maybe now you can take a hint. Please take her outside, will I still got something to say. You can say it later. Come on, Alma. I want to say it now. You have to talk to your father. Let's go. All right, All right I got it. You see, you, you see what I've been up against? Yeah. Let me see. I tried. You know I tried, but there was nothing I could do. Just too much of a mother, and you, you can you can see that, can't you? Mr. Hill, she's 15 years old. Well, she'd be 16. Do you think it was right to let her be missing from the house for a week and not report it to the police? What could you have done? Nothing. We could have tried. It's more than you did. Well, maybe I was wrong. About that? You were wrong about a lot of things. Does that make her right? Does that give her permission to break into my store? She and her rowdies, my own daughter? No. I don't know. I'm, I'm so mixed up. I, I know she's my kid. I love her. You, you want me to take her back in the house? I'll take her back in the house and try again. I, I'm willing to do that. Is that what you want? It's not what we want, Mr. Healers. All right, then, it's what I want. I, I want to try again. I want to get her back in the house. I want to try again. It's not what you want, either. It's going to be up to the children's court. Children's court? What does the children's court know about it? It's my daughter. All I need is time with her. Mr. Hillis, you had 15 years. Now it's time for someone else. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, all right. Oh, well, I've got an alarm for you. Okay. A 1952 Chevrolet hardtop. Painted two-tone green. Pennsylvania registration unknown. Unknown. Yeah, that's right, Libby. So keep your eyes open for it. Yeah. All right, let me know if you see it parked on your post. And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. 
Featured in tonight's cast were John Larkin, John Sylvester, Bill Lipton, Bill Smith, and Lynn Thatcher. Written and directed by Stanley Mears. Hot Hannah Stevens. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, all right. I've got an alarm for you. Okay. A 1952 Chevrolet hardtop, painted two-tone green. Pennsylvania registration unknown. You are armed by transcription in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. Let me know if you see it on your post. The car was driven by suspects in an armed robbery. Okay. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. Before midnight, it had been a busy night in the precinct. There had been a mugging, a bad wreck on Fifth Avenue, and an armed robbery at a bar and grill on Lexington. After I turned out the platoon for the late tour at 12, things quieted down. I went out on patrol in sector car number three with patrolman Farrell as operator. After touring the northern end of the precinct to inspect patrol conditions, at 1.10 a.m., I instructed Patrolman Farrell to head downtown on 5th. Traffic on the avenue was very light, and according to my standing instructions for all cars at night, we proceeded at a very slow rate of speed in order to observe the benches between the sidewalk and the Central Park wall. After we crossed 84th Street, the traffic lights turned red, and Patrolman Farrell drew the car to a stop. The guy can explain all he wants to about high-pressure fronts and low-pressure fronts. All I know, Captain, is it gets pretty cold. Yep. If they just say tomorrow it's going to rain or the sun is going to shine, all right. But you've got to be a bachelor of science nowadays to understand one of these weather reports. What's that cab driver doing over there, hmm? Well, it looks like he's got trouble with a passenger. Yeah. Go on through. Let's have a look. Let's see. That's it, all right. What's the trouble, Max? I passed out dead drunk in a car. All right, Farrell, let's give him a hand. Yes, sir. Okay. I don't know why I always draw this kind of guy. Every time I... Can I Every time like... I get a guy with a tuxedo, I can smell trouble. He's got some load on, all right. Where were you taking him? Where? I asked him where. Uptown. He said, drive uptown, and he let me know. Where'd you pick him up? 52nd Street there. Right, come on, Miss. Had Lee. some babe with him. Come on, come on. He must have come out of one of the clubs. They got in a car and he said, drive around the park. Right, well, you she see, says, no, you I want to go home, she said. Guy says he wants to talk to her. So she says, okay, drive around the park a few minutes. He's out like a lion. Well, you're telling me. So, so I come in the park and I drive around like he says. Well, he's getting a little bit uh, uh, free with the hands, but this babe knows how to take care of herself. He thrusts, she parries, you know what I mean? Then, then I see I better step in because I don't want no trouble in my car. So I went back and I tell him, look, mister, I tell him, I don't care what you do at home, but in my car, if a lady don't want to let you kiss her, you don't kiss her. He said I should drive the car and mind my own business. I told him if it wasn't my business, whose business was it? Uh, where'd she go? She had sense enough to cut loose at the first opportunity, which is more than I can say for myself. See what you can do with him, pal. That's it. I'll try. All right. Where did she go? Well, we were in the park. First thing I figured I got to do was get out of there. Right, I came out of 72nd Street, and when I get there, the light is red. Right, so we grabbed her again. She dodges him. She sees the car is stopped. She opens the door and gets out. This guy's really yeah. been to the well, Captain. 
Yeah. Well, that's okay with me if she wants to beat it. And the guy don't seem to mind too much anyway. She walks across the avenue, and there's another house there. She flags him, and away they go. You know what I mean? I turn to the fellow, and I say, well, where do you want to go? And he says, uptown. I tell him, uptown is a big place. And he says, drive up fifth to let me know. So I turn up fifth. And the first thing you know, I don't hear another word out of him. So I turn around, and I take a look, at <laughs> he's out like a light. I think there's a spark of life left in him. Too. I got to draw this kind of guy. Every time I get a guy with a tuxedo. I know. Come on, mister. The party's over. All right, come on, come on, sit up. I appreciate your help. I didn't know what I was going to do with him. All right, all right, let's see you. Tell you the truth, I was going to drive the station house. You know all right? Ask him where he lives, Farrell. Yes, sir. Where do you live, mister? Fifth Amendment, Captain. Mm. We just want to see that you get home, that's all. I don't want to go. See what I mean? See what I mean? Come on, come on, where do you live? I want to go for a nightcap. You had your nightcap. Get him out of here, Farrell. That's it. Come on, mister. Get your hands off. Come on, come on, get out of the car. Let's go. Get out of there. Get your hands off. Look, we've wasted enough time with you, mister. Now get out. Come on. No. Okay, Farrell. Yes, sir. Come on, now. Let's go. Get your hands off. Come on. Let me alone. Stand up there. Go on, stand up. Hey, for this. Watch him. I'll kill you. Watch him. I'll kill you. Believe me, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I I had a few drinks. You know how it is. Come on, be nice guys, will you? Why don't you be a nice guy instead of swinging at us? Well, I'm sorry about that. I'm I'm sorry I hit you. Did I do any damage? I, I didn't hurt you, did I? I'm sorry. That's good. Say sorry, mister. I had a couple of drinks. You know how it is. Driver, get his hat out of the car, will you? Yes, yeah, sir. Come on, huh? I'll be all right, I promise you. I know you'll be all right. Yeah, put it on his head. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Look, fellas, I, I, I'm okay. I, I, I know I was a little nasty. I, I, I'm sorry, huh? Just let me go home. I'll, I'll go right to bed. I, I, I promise you, I'll, I'll go right to bed. I, I just live over on Park Avenue at 695. That's close. Yeah? Well, the station house is closer. The realization that he had been arrested took all the fight out of the man and most of the drunkenness. He identified himself as Charles H. Lowfield, age 33, 695 Park Avenue. Before we put him into the car, he paid the cab driver a $2.20 fare that was on the clock. Farrell took the name and address of the driver and entered them into his memorandum book in case he was needed as a witness. We put Lowfield into the car and drove to the station house. There, we walked up the front steps with him and into the muster room where Lieutenant Gorman was on the job as desk officer and Sergeant Waters on telephone switchboard duty. As Patrolman Farrell took the prisoner in front of the desk to book him on charges of violation of Section 722 Penal Law, disorderly conduct, I headed around behind the desk to sign the blotter. All right, have we, Mr. Lawson. This, this isn't really necessary, is it? Captain, have you got a second? Yep. Uh, Lieutenant King is upstairs. He asked that I ring up there when you get in. Okay. As soon as I sign the blotter. Yes, sir. At 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, Captain. Right. Just step right up to the desk. Mr. Okay, Lawson. wait till you get to the end of your turn. I'm willing to go home and go to bed. Yeah. What have you got, Farrell? Disorderly conduct. I apologize to you, didn't I? I told you I was sorry. What's the name? Charles H. Lowfield. L-O-W-F-I-E-L-D. Captain, I appeal to your better nature. I'm a responsible businessman. I know that I acted not exactly as I should, but there's no reason to arrest me. I had a few drinks. That doesn't make me a criminal, does it? No, you're not a criminal, Mr. Lowfield, but you caused a lot of people a lot of trouble. We were perfectly willing to help you and see that you got home all right. Well, I told you. I told you I was sorry about what happened. You refused our help. You clawed at us. You hit this officer two or three times with your fist. I told you I had a few drinks. 
Well, if that's your explanation, Mr. Lowfield, it's lost on me. Captain, please. I'll be in my office, Red. Yes, sir. What's the age? 33. Get Lieutenant King for me, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Sir? It's 95 Park Avenue. First precinct, Captain Canale. Lieutenant King's coming to the fall, Captain. Okay. to give it to the man on this tour as they ring in? All right, Captain. Sure, that might help. Okay, Matt. We'll get it out to them. Thanks. Right. All right, Mr. Lowfield. You'll have a hearing in this magistrate's court at 10 a.m. 10 a.m.? That's right. About finished, pal? Yes, Captain. What do we do until then? The bail is $500. Well, I don't have that much cash. You saw how much money I had, about $60. Do you have anyone who can go your bail? Where do I post it? Here? Yeah, that's right. We'll take it here. Well, how do I get in touch with anybody? We'll make three telephone calls for you. Can I make them myself? No, we'll make them for you. Who would you want us to call? Well, I've got money for telephone calls. Why can't I make the call? Because the rules say you can't. Who do you want us to call? Well, you can call my lawyer. Captain, he's holding me on $500 bail. Now, I don't know whether I can get anyone up here with that much money at this time of night. If I can, I'll have to spend the night in jail. I'm sorry, Mr. Lowfield. That's the law. Excuse me. What's your lawyer's name, Mr. Lowfield? Sergeant. Yes, sir. As the men ring in, I want you to give them an alarm on a car. Yes, sir. A 1952 Chevrolet hard top, two-tone green, Pennsylvania plate. Yes, sir. We don't have the registration number yet, but if they see a car answering this description, they're to ring in immediately. These are armed robbery suspects. Okay, Captain. And uh, you refer any information to the oh, detectives. Yes, sir. Call my secretary. Your secretary? Yes. What's your name? Sandra Arridge. You know her phone number? Well, no, I don't, but it's in the book. She lives in Greenwich Village on 9th Street or 10th Street. The only Sandra Arridge. It's E-R-I-D-G-E. Okay, I'll look it up if I have to. But we'll probably be able to reach your lawyer or your brother. I'm sure you will, yes. All right, Mr. Lowfield, back this way, huh? Listen, do you have to lock me up while I'm waiting? Can't I wait here? You better go on back with the officer. Well, I don't care to be locked up with a bunch of criminals. I'm not a criminal. You won't be locked up with any criminals. You're the only one back there tonight. You've got the place all yourself. Well, I think I'm entitled to wait here. I'm not going to go back there. Mr. Lowfield, we had a lot of trouble with you earlier over what you would do and what you wouldn't do. Now, well, you better go on back there with the officer and let's not have any more trouble. I think it's a crime to lock up a decent citizen over something like this. It's a plain crime. Come on, Mr. Lowe. Well, it's just a plain crime, that's all. You haven't heard the end of this. Not yet, you haven't. It's just a plain crime. Brother. Give me a bunch of thieves any day. Who did he ask you to call, Red? His lawyer? His brother and his secretary in that order. Oh. He's not married, huh? Oh, listen, but you... Divorced, he said. I better know up for you. What's his business? Investment. Give you a hard time over there, I understand. Yeah, he was full of fright. A couple of hours in back there might cool him off. 695 Park. That's a good address. Yes, sir, it sure is. Man ought to know how to behave himself. Not necessarily, Red. That can take a lot more than a good address. As soon as the prisoner had been lodged in the cell, Patrolman Farrell returned to the muster room, and with him, I left the station house to resume patrol. With certain exceptions defined by law, desk officers of the police department of the city of New York are required to take bail from or in behalf of any person arrested for a misdemeanor or an offense. In compliance, at 1.40 a.m., Lieutenant Gorman began to make the first of the three telephone calls requested by Mr. Lowfield. Give me a line on here, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. 
What time are you taking your meal, Lieutenant? About 2.30, I guess. This lawyer is a sound sleeper. Well, I guess to put up with his clients all day, he has to be. Where does he live? I don't know. It's an El Dorado number. Not too far from here, I guess. No answer there yet. It's almost a quarter to two. Should be home. Maybe smart and shuts off his phone. Yeah. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, we're not going to raise him. I'll leave the line up. I'll try the brother. Yes. Put Farrell on reserve at 5 a.m. if he has to go to court. Yes, sir. Uh, we could take Meister off his post and put him in a car. Yeah, that'll be all right. Mr. Edward Lopio? Yes, sir. This is Lieutenant Garment at the 21st Precinct, Mr. Lopio. You got my brother there. Yes, that's right, Mr. Lopio. We're holding him in $500 bail. Well, I'll tell you what you can do. You can keep holding that drunk and bum. All right, Mr. Lopio. You think I'm getting dressed at 2 o'clock in the morning about the cold and bail him out? He's out of his mind. Okay. You don't have to yell at me, Mr. Lowfield. I'm only calling because he asked me to. Yes, yes, you're right. I just felt like screaming at someone. That's okay. I don't blame you. Guy's got a good business. He makes a lot of money. The only trouble is he thinks life is one great big party. Well, you can tell him it's no party for me. Let him spend a night in jail. All right. Don't give me a message. I wish you would. Okay, Mr. Lowfield. I'm sorry to bother you. That's all right. Goodbye. Goodbye. His brother says let him rot. Are you going to make another call? I've got to look up the number. Yes. Says a night in jail will do him good. He can get an argument from the one that's in. Yeah, I guess he could. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Okay. Oh, listen, I've got an alarm for you. 1952 Chevrolet hardtop, two-tone green. Pennsylvania registration unknown. Yeah, Pennsylvania. Yes, yes, Sandra Evans. Yeah, that's right. If you see the car parked in your post, ring in here. It's wanted in connection with an armed robbery. Okay. Oh, three, eight, nine. Who's Sandra Evans? The secretary? Yeah. Right, give me a line on here, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come up here. How should I know? Hello? Is this Miss Sandra Eridge? Yes. Who's this calling? This is Lieutenant Garman at the 21st Precinct. The police? That's right, yeah. What's the matter? Miss Eridge, we're holding a man here by the name of Charles H. Lowfield. Oh, my goodness. He asked us to call you. Oh, what's the matter with him? He's not hurt, is he? No, he's not hurt. He's being held on a charge of disorderly conduct. Mr. Lowfield? That's right. He says you're his secretary. Yes, I am. He's being held in five hundred dollars bail. What does that mean? It means someone has to put it up for him or he'll have to stay in jail until court opens. In jail? Mr. Lowfield? That's right. Well, I don't have that much money. Will you tell him I'll try to get hold of his attorney? I called his attorney. There's no answer. I already spoke to his brother. He can't make it. He can't? He says he can't. Oh, well, I don't know whether I can do anything. You tell Mr. Lopeo about Ty. I'll see if I can get an idea. It'll take me a little while for him to get dressed and try to get the money, but you tell Mr. Lopeo I'll be there. Tell him now. Don't forget. I won't. Tell him I'll, I'll try to get it someplace. All right, I will. Tell him not to worry now. I'll tell him. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. You're welcome. Mr. 
secretary coming, Lieutenant? Yeah. Well, it proves it. The guy's got a good secretary. He's better off than with a family or a lawyer. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe he's in jail. Because of the delay involved in making the arrest, taking the prisoner to the station house and booking him, I remained out on patrol somewhat later than usual. With Patrolman Farrell, I toured the precinct from one end to the other, from Fifth Avenue to the river, in order to observe conditions that had been brought to my attention and to check on the efficiency of the men on the job. It was a little before 4 a.m. when the car pulled up in front of the station house. As we stopped, I saw the front door open and Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, come down the steps to the sidewalk. Uh, I see you inside, Farrell. Yes, sir. Matt. Hello, Captain. Hey, don't you ever go home, Matt? That's where I'm headed now. Hello, Lieutenant. Farrell. Oh, uh, we're giving an alarm on the Pennsylvania car to everybody on post. No, I'm good. And uh, I'll call the attention of the men to it at the 8 o'clock turnoff. Fine. These are a couple of good boys. They made them in three jobs down in Philadelphia. Yeah? They shot up a loan company office there yesterday. Um, this is the 21st precinct, isn't it? Yes, it is. Oh, good. Oh, good night, Captain. Good night, Matt. Well, I've got the money. What money is that? $500. Thank you. The bail money from Mr. Lofi. Oh, well, uh, you see the desk, Lieutenant, over there. Him? Yes, that's right. I got a message for you, Captain. That's right. All right. As soon as I sign the blotter. I've got the five hundred dollars for bail for Mr. Lofield. All right. Well, Captain. Right. And I'm telling you, it wasn't very easy to get it. I had to go see a friend of mine. She runs a dress shop, and I know she's open late, and she brings the receipts home with her. It took me an awfully long time to convince her to give it to me. Well, as long as you got it. Now I won't lose this money. I'll get it all back. You'll get it back when Mr. Lofield shows up in court. You're sure now? Because I had an awful time getting it. Yes, you can get it back down at the court. Oh, that's good. Now, it's not that I don't trust Mr. Lowfield. It's just that I thought maybe there were some charges that would have to be paid or something like that. I'm not worried about Mr. Lowfield at all. Oh, where is he, anyway? Can I see him? I'll just run for the attendant and bring him out. Oh. You want the money now? You hold on a little while. I've got a lot of papers to make down. All right. Yes, sir? Bring Lowfield out to the desk. He's sure to get here. Yes, sir. What did he do? Mr. Lowfield, I mean. He got nasty and started swinging at a couple of police officers. Mr. Lowfield? Yes. Oh, Mr. Lowfield wouldn't do a thing like that. Wouldn't he? Well, he may be a hard man in business, but he, he's a gentleman. Lucy's he's always been a gentleman with me. Oh, well, he wasn't with me. I'm one of the policemen he was swinging at. Oh, my goodness. Your correct name is Sandra Erich. E-R-I-D-G-E? Yes, that's right. What's your address? Um, 225 West 10th Street. That's your permanent address? You're a householder within the county of New York? Yes, I live here. Ah. I have an apartment, if that's what you mean. Do you have some identification, Miss Erd? Or uh, is it Miss? It's Miss Erd. You mean like a driver's license? Yes, that'll do. I think I have it with me, although I did take a cab. Yes, it's here. Thank you. I'm terribly sorry, Captain. I'm sure Mr. Lowfield is, too. Under normal circumstances, he wouldn't think of doing a thing like that. He's the kindest and most gentle man I've ever known. Well, maybe he is under normal circumstances. All right, step right up to the desk, Mr. Lowfield. Mr. Lowfield, I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. You should be. Where were you? And how long have you been sitting back there in that cell? Well, I got here as fast as I could. I had an awful time. Well, look at me. Do you think I had a good time? You know how crummy it is back there? Mr. Lowfield, I had to get dressed and find the money I... I didn't know where to look. I had to impose upon a friend. And what about me? I've been sitting back there. All right, Mr. Lowfield. Sitting back there for four hours. I did the best I could. Miss Erich, you'll have to sign this and take an oath on it. What is it? I'll just sign it. Don't ask what it is. Well, I've got a right to know what it is if I'm signing it. It's a form, a statement that you're the owner of the currency that's offered for security. Oh. Well, I'd like to read it. Well, Sandra, now stop being an efficient secretary and don't waste time reading it. Just sign it. Just sign it so I can get out of here. Mr. Lowfield. I like you very much, but you're not going to talk to me like this. Well, you work for me, don't you? I work for you, but I don't have to listen to your abuse. Just sign the paper, Sandra. Now sign it. No, just a second. Sign it. It's only a matter of form. I won't sign it. The money doesn't belong to me. I borrowed it. They're not worried that you borrowed it. They just want to make sure it isn't stolen. Now sign the paper. No, I won't. Now look, Sandra. You look, Mr. Lowfield. I was good enough to get up out of bed at 2 o'clock in the morning and, and go chasing around, waking up my friends trying to raise this money. 
I, I don't expect you to be grateful, but I, I do expect you to be at least courteous. It's impossible for me to be courteous under these circumstances. Then it's impossible for me to be loyal. Good night, Mr. Lucas. Oh, Sandra, I'm sorry. Sign the paper, Sandra. I may Please. not have a job in the morning, but at least I'll have my self-respect. Good night, Mr. Lofield. Sandra. Good night, gentlemen. Good night, Sandra. All right, Mr. Lowfield, you're not going anywhere. Just stay here. Sandra! All right, pal. You better take him back. Please, someone go after her. Tell her I'm sorry. You've been sorry for everything all night, Mr. Lowfield. Please, I can't stand another minute back there. That's what's got me so upset. Now, please, Captain, send someone to get her. I can't do that, Mr. Lowfield. I just want to get out of here. I've got to get out. You've got to give me a chance. You had your chance, Mr. Lowfield. It just walked out the door. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. A shooting? Where? Well, at the museum or near the museum? Well, who's doing the shooting? Well, are there any police officers there? Now, where is it exactly now? On the street or on the steps? Where? Talk into the phone, will you? All right. I'll send the officers right And on. so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Elaine Ross, Bob Reddick, Mason Adams, Bill Quinn, Santa Sortega. Written and directed by Stanley Niff. Gaylord Avery speaking. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. Armed robbery in the 24th. Well, we don't know much about it here. We got the car, that's all. It was parked over there on 2nd Avenue. It was in the alarms. Last night, sometime. You are in the muster room at the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. Yeah. We'll hold them here. Yeah. We got them. Okay. Yeah. Twenty-first precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m., before midnight, things were quiet in the precinct, and I had the opportunity to remain in my office and clean up much of the paperwork that had accumulated. After I turned out the 12 to 8 platoon at midnight, I instructed Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, to have a car come by the house to take me on patrol of the precinct. In compliance, the communications bureau was requested to put out a radio call for sector car number three, which on receiving the broadcast, stopped at the nearest police call box. The car's recorder, Patrolman Vaccaro, was instructed to take over a foot patrol post, and the operator, Patrolman Farrell, drove the car to the station house to pick me up. During the course of my patrol, we first toured the northern end of the precinct, and then, on my instructions, Patrolman Farrell headed the car downtown. At 12.50 a.m., we were driving south on 2nd Avenue in the 80s. As we slowed down to stop for a signal, I saw a man concealing himself in the doorway of a closed bakery. At a glance, the man appeared to be a policeman. I told Patrolman Farrell to pull into the curb. 
Come on. All right, come on. Yes, sir. It is a policeman. Who is it? Meister? Yes, sir, Meister. What are you doing in there? See that Ford parked down there, Captain? Yeah? What do you say, Meister? Oh, hi, sir. Well, what about the car? I saw it in the alarms before the turnout, Captain. It's one in connection with the armed robbery of a liquor store up on Upper Broadway. When was this? In the evening before midnight sometime, Captain. I didn't make a particular note of the exact time, only the description of the car. Farrell. Yes, sir. Take your car and pull it around the next corner there. Okay, Captain. And wait there. Yes, sir. Did you ring in with it, Meister? Yes, I did, Captain. The lieutenant said stay here and keep my eyes on it. He's notifying the detectives. What did the alarm say? Did you give the registration numbers? No, only the last two numbers, Captain. Eight O. Oh. It said a 1950 or 51 Ford two-door black, right rear fender dented and taillight smashed. Oh, that fits all right. Yes, sir. When I spotted the car, I felt the hood. The motor was still warm. Anything inside of it? No, the doors were locked, Captain. I put my light in it, and I didn't see anything. Did Lieutenant Dorman say the detectives were on their way? He said just to wait here for them, sir. Okay. Good work, Marcia. Thank you, Captain. We, uh... You better stay back in the door. Yes. Yeah. You, uh, don't know anything more about this robbery? What time it was or where? No, sir. I read that alarm along with the others that were on the board and put the description in my book. I think it was uptown on Broadway, a liquor store, and that's, that's the only thing I recall for sure. Uh-huh. Couldn't have happened too much before midnight because it was the latest alarm on the board. Oh, it... There's a man coming to the car, I think. No, I don't think so, Captain. Looks like he's going to cross the street. Yeah. He's going to get in on the driver's side. Come on, Captain. Right with you. He's looking for his key. You take this side, I'll go around. Okay, Captain. Wait a minute, mister. Me? Yeah, you. Just stay out of the car. Now, what's the matter? Okay, Captain. Come here, Meister. Yes, sir. You're the owner of this car? Uh, sure. What's the trouble? What's with the gun? Get away from that pocket. Wait a minute. Don't get touchy. I was just going to show you my registration. Lean up against the car there. Put your hands on the top of it. Look, Cap, I don't know what this is all about. I'll tell you what it's all about. This car is suspected in an armed robbery. Now lean up against there and make it snappy. All right, I will. Don't get excited. Okay, Meister. Yes, sir. I hate to say it, but you guys got the wrong office someplace. Well, he's clean, Captain. The way they expect me to be. Look in the car, in the glove compartment. Yes, sir. All right, move over, mister. There's nothing in there. We'll see about that. I'm telling you, you got the wrong office, Captain. There's nothing, Captain. What's your name? McLeese. Joe McLeese. You have the registration for this car? Yeah. And your operator's license? Yeah, sure. All right, let's see him. I uh, got to go into my pocket to get him. Go ahead. All right, I just wanted to make sure... What have you been doing tonight, Joe? Nothing. What was I supposed to have been doing? Where were you? I was having a few drinks. Here. Here's the registration. Take it, Meister. Yes, sir. And here's my driver's license. Okay. Now, listen, what's the deal? Let me ask the questions. Where are you coming from? Right just now, you mean? Yeah. I was over at the pub there, Jeremy's. Where's that? Down there, two blocks down, second Adler. How come you parked up here? Because when I parked the car, it was early. There wasn't any place near to park. What's your birthday, Joe? June 4th. What year? 1919, like it says on there. Well, these things check out, Captain. Yeah, put them back in your pocket, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, take this one, too. What time did you park here? I don't know. 9 o'clock, 9.30, something like that. You sure about that? Sure, I'm sure. That's when you went to the bar? Yeah. And you've been there since? Sure, I've been there since. Go ask Jerry. Ask anybody in there. You didn't leave at all. Well, I went out for a few minutes to get a little air, you know. All that smoke in there could get your eyes if you don't get some air. The detectives are here, Captain. Oh, it's the looker. What do you need detectives for? You got him, Captain? Yeah. Got me for what? What do you say, Meister? Uh, this is the car, Lud. What car? And this is the guy. Say, if you're a detective, solve me a mystery, will you? What's this all about? Come on, Lud. I, uh... I'll show you the back of the car. Okay, Captain. What's this all about? That's what I like to know. We'll find out in good time. Well, this uh, looks like the car, all right. Well, that's why I took some time getting over here. I, 
rang up to the 24th to get some more information than what was on the alarm. What time was this robbery? About 10.25. This fella claims he's been in a bar since 9.30. Was this stick-up man all alone? That's what the witnesses say, Captain. Fella double parked on Broadway up there. Went into the liquor store and boosted the clerk. Clerk started out the door after him. The man took a couple of shots, hit him in the arm, and ran to the car. I got plenty of witnesses that saw both the car and the man. Now, this one here, he's, uh, says he's been in a bar from 9.30 on. That's what he says, yeah. But Meister have felt the hood when he spotted the car. It was still warm. Well, let's find out what it's all about, huh? Uh, Look, nobody's asking you to take my word for it. All right, Joe, tell it to the detectives, will you? I'm asking you, just go in the bar and ask Jerry, that's all. Ask any of the guys in there. They'll tell you I was sitting at the bar there. They'll even tell you the flavor of the beer I was drinking. Ever been arrested, Joe? What's that got to do with now? When was the last time you were arrested? The last time I wasn't arrested. They had me in because they wanted to talk to me about something. Oh, uh, who was that? Downtown, down Ninth Street. What they want to talk to you about? Who knows? Who knows what they want to talk to you about? Somebody did something. When was this? Like around Christmas. Ever do any time, Joe? Sure, I did some time. There's no secret about that. For what? It was what they call grand larceny. That's got nothing to do with this. Well, what are you going to do? Hold it against me every little thing because I did a bit once? It don't mean I was into this thing. No, it doesn't, Joe, but uh, you got to admit it sure drops the yard. The suspect and his automobile were taken to the station house, and I walked around the corner where Patrolman Farrell was waiting in sector car number three to continue on patrol of the precinct. At the station house, Patrolman Meister took the suspect upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad office to await arrival of detectives from the 24th precinct in which the armed robbery had occurred. In the meantime, Detective DeLuca drove to the bar and grill where Joe McLeese said he spent the entire evening. It was now nearly 1.30 in the morning and business had tapered off. As DeLuca walked into the place, there was only one patron at the bar. Down at the far end, the bartender had a morning tabloid spread open to the sports page. What do you say? Hi. I'm a detective. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I thought you looked familiar. Hmm? He came over here and talked to me a couple of months ago. Some guy claimed he got rolled by a babe in here. Yeah, that's right. Hey, what happened to that guy? Did he ever get his money back? Well, he was married and he didn't want to want to press it too hard. Got weak in the knees as soon as he thought he might have to appear in court. He should have thrown it up before he picked up this dish. That's right. I ain't seen her around here anymore. What's your name again? DeLuca. Oh, yeah, DeLuca. How about something? No, 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 thanks. Look, uh, you know a fella called Joe McLeese? Joe McLeese. Yeah. Jerry. Yeah, all right. Excuse me, uh, business before play. Yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Same? Yeah. Yeah, he's a fellow about my height, about 35 years old. He's got a little bit of a little mustache. Oh, yeah, Joe McLeese, sure, I know him. He was in here tonight. Oh, yeah, what time did he come in? Let's see, uh, what's the matter with him? You getting a jam? No, we're just checking up on something. Oh, well, let's see, I, I had the basketball game on. It goes on about 9.30. I think it was in, I think he was in here when it began, yeah. Mm -hmm. He was having a discussion with Quinny about the starting lineups. Quinny was saying the Knicks would be better off if they started so and so. Joe didn't think so. How long did he stay? Well, he stood through the whole game at least. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had a couple of bets going on between them, Joe and Quinny and one or two of the other guys. He didn't move. What time was the game over? Well, let's see. It was after 11 o'clock. Yeah, a couple of minutes after, because when the game was over, one of the fellows said, Switch over to the 11 o'clock news and let's see what the Russians are doing. I switched over and the news was already on a couple of minutes. Yeah. What time did he finally leave, Jerry? Oh, some babe came in here. She oh. took him over to the booth, and they sat down and talked a minute. He left with her, and he came back a little while later. Came back alone. What time did she come in? Well, I couldn't say exactly. Uh, 11.30, like. Oh. How long was he gone? Oh, a half hour, maybe. You know, know this, you know this girl? Well, yeah, she comes in here once in a while. What's her name? Uh, Ellie something. Uh, Ellie what? That's on the tip of my tongue. Ellie, Ellie. Uh, Ellie Kurt, yeah. Ellie Kurt. Yeah. 
Uh, take it easy. Look, uh, you know where she lives? Yeah, I think so. I, I cashed a paycheck for her once, and the bank sent it back. She didn't endorse it like it was made out exactly. I had to go over there and get her to endorse it again. I don't remember the number, but you walk around a corner, and it's in the building with the shoemaker there. She lives upstairs. Okay, Jerry, thanks. Listen, uh, Mr. DeLuca, I don't want to be... I want to be everybody's friend. I hope Joe was not doing any jam. I don't like to make any trouble. Well, look, just don't worry about it. If he's got trouble, he, he made it for himself. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Before leaving the bar, Detective DeLuca telephoned the 21st Squad and spoke to Lieutenant Matt King, his immediate superior. After relaying the information he had obtained, he was instructed to walk around the corner and attempt to locate the woman, Ellie Kurt, to see what light she could shed on the case. In the meantime, I was still out on patrol in sector car number three with patrolman Farrell as operator. At 1.50 a.m., we had left the precinct and driven to the 22nd precinct, which is on the 86th Street Transverse in Central Park, in order to fill the car with gasoline and have the oil checked. As patrolman Farrell was signing the MT-9 receipt for the gasoline, I sat in the car. My attention was suddenly brought to the radio speaker when I heard the CB dispatcher put out a call for car 681, which is the departmental number for sector car number 2 of the 21st. The recorder in car 681 responded and gave his location at 73rd Street and York Avenue. CB then instructed 681 to make a run. A police officer shot, ambulance responding. I tapped on the horn as a signal for patrolman Farrell. He hurried to the car and we rolled on the call, proceeding out of the park, across 84th Street and down 2nd Avenue with the siren wide open. In dispatching men to the scene of a serious crime or an emergency, specific instructions are given by the communications bureau to only one car. In addition, however, the sergeant's car and all other departmental vehicles within a radius of five blocks must respond irrespective of sector, precinct, or division boundary lines. When we neared the scene, I could see that there were already four cars on the job. Sector cars one and two from the 21st, the car from the traffic precinct C, and the sergeant's car. All right, give him a hand on the sidewalk here, pal. Yes, sir. Come on. Sergeant. Sergeant Waters. Hello, Captain. What is it? Who shot? It's not a policeman, Captain. Oh? DeLuca sent a civilian to call in. He got it a little mixed up. Well, who is shot? All right, Tony. Keep the sidewalk clean here, will you? Get them away from that door. DeLuca went up to talk to some woman here. Guy inside the apartment started shooting at him. Uh, second floor, Captain. Well, is the man shot? Yeah, Captain. He looks dead. All right. Hold him. Get those people back inside their flats, will you? Okay, Captain. Did anyone notify the desk officer and CB that it wasn't a police officer shot? Yes, sir. That's where I've been. I just rang in. What about the ambulance? It's on the way, Captain. The detectives? Well, the Lucas here. Uh, in the front there, Captain. And Lieutenant King. Uh, get those people away from the door, huh? All right, right. Okay, Captain. Come on, move on. Hold on, Captain. Yeah. It looks like he's had it. Yes, sir, but he almost gave it to me first. Yeah? Where's Lieutenant King? He's in the bedroom there talking to the woman, Ellie Kurt. What happened, Lud? Well, it was on a chain deal with the car Meister spotted. I was checking out this Joe's story, so I went to the bar and grill. Barton to bore him out almost 100%. Only thing is, he told me a woman came into the place about 11.30 and Joe left with her. And he came back alone about a half hour later. woman was Miss Ellie Kurt. She lives here. Yeah? Well, I walked on over here and came upstairs to talk to her. I knocked on the door, and I could hear some whispering going on inside, so so I was set. She opened up the door and let me in, and I started to talk to her about Joe. And this here fella came out of the kitchen. He had an old 32 nickel plated Spanish make in his hand and started after me. Oh, you see in the wall there, there are two of the shots. Yeah. yeah but I was ready for him, though. Well, you didn't hit any wall, Lud. No, sir. How about that ambulance, Sergeant? Away, Captain. I don't think the ambulance is going to do him any good, sir. He, uh, looks about right for that stick-up, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's the guy, all right, Captain. And what does this 
Ellie have to say? I didn't get much of a chance to talk to her. She was pretty hysterical until Lieutenant King started to talk to her. I had a tough time keeping her quiet. Mm -hmm. How'd the call get mixed up? It came over police officer shot. Oh, yeah, yeah. A neighbor down the hall came out, and I told him I was a police officer and had been a shooting, and for him to call the police. Well, he was a bit excited, and his English wasn't too good, so he got the whole thing upside down. Yeah. Well, I go on in here. Mm -hmm. Come in, Captain. I didn't know anything about him. I'm sure I know anything about him. You certainly knew about him tonight. I found out about him tonight, but what could I do? I couldn't do anything. Captain, this is Ellie Kirk. Hello? I, I didn't know Doc was going to shoot at the cop. He didn't tell me anything about that. He just told me to say he wasn't here. That's all. Just say he wasn't here. Listen, is he dead? Yes, we think so. Well, don't you know we're waiting for the ambulance surgeon. It's up to him to say so. Oh. He, he really was not a bad fellow. I didn't think he was very bad till tonight. All right. Now, what happened? Well, he was here, and there was somebody knocking at the door. I don't mean start there. I mean start earlier tonight. Oh. From the time Dunk got here. Well, you see, we had this date. He was supposed to be here at 9 o'clock. We were going to go downtown and have some pizza and beer. You know, that's what he told me we were going to do. What time did he show up? Well, it wasn't until about 11 o'clock, and boy, I was mad. I almost didn't let him in. He told me it wasn't his fault. He couldn't help it and everything like that. He stood out there knocking on the door, and I said, if you're two hours late, you might as well not come at all if that's as reliable as you can be. I was really sore. But you let him in. Well, he begged me to open up. He said he couldn't help being late because he was in a jam, a real jam. The way he was talking, I could see he wasn't lying about that, so I let him in. Mm. What did he tell you? Well, he said he borrowed this car from a friend of his, a fellow named Joe something, McQueese. Did you know him, Joe? Oh, yeah, I met him. I met him a couple of times. Anyway, Dunk said he borrowed Joe's car tonight, and he got in some trouble, and I asked him if he had a rack. He said, no, it wasn't anything like that. And he told me to go down to the bar there to Jeremy's, you know the place that's around there on 2nd Avenue? Yeah, we know. And he asked me to go down there and find Joe and tell him to come up here to the house. Well, I said, okay, but what's it all about? And Dunk told me what I don't know wouldn't hurt me. Just go find Joe. What time was that? Oh, I don't know. It was about 11.30 or something like that. You went down to the bar? Yeah. Did you find Joe? Yeah, he was sitting there. I told him Dunk was at my house and wanted to see him. And right away, Joe thought Dunk wrecked the car. I said, no, it wasn't anything like that. But he was in a jam. So we come back here together, Joe and me. Well, what did Dunk tell Joe? Well, first, Dunk told me to get in the bedroom so they could talk. And I said, listen, whose house is this anyway? But Dunk said he had something private to talk over to Joe. And so I came on in here. But you heard what they were talking about? Yeah, after it started to get loud. What were they talking about? Well, you see, Dunk had told Joe he wanted to borrow the car to go pick up a vacuum cleaner or something like that he bought for his mother. And Joe lent him the car if he'd fill it up with gas. Anyway, Dunk told Joe instead of picking up the vacuum cleaner, he used the car in a stick-up, and there was some shooting and all that. Did you hear where the stick-up was? No, I didn't, but I'm telling you, my heart sank right down to the floor. I didn't know Dunk was mixed up in anything like that. You know, I didn't think he was no perfect angel, but I had no idea there was anything like stick-ups with him. Well, what did Joe have to say? Well, I'm telling you, he was plenty burned up. He was really mad at Dunk for taking the car under false pretenses like that and putting a lot of heat on it. He was, he was steaming. Then why did Dunk tell him anything? Why didn't he just return the car? Well, to tell you the truth, he was a little bit worried that someone saw the car and got the license numbers and all that. So so he, he told Joe if anyone came asking any questions for Joe not to say anything about Dunk borrowing the car. Mm. What did Joe say to that? Well, he told Dunk he was out of his mind. Well, I can see his reasoning. And then Dunk said he didn't think anyone saw the license number, but he just wanted to make sure. And Joe said he was crazy. If the cops came in, what was he going to tell them? Well, how'd they settle it? Oh, they settled it all right. How? Well, they were arguing back and forth, and finally Joe says to Dunk, how much did you get? And Dunk says, how much did I get and what? And from the boosting, Joe says. So Dunk told him $180. So Joe says, all right, give me half. I won't say anything. Well, Dunk didn't want to go for that, but in the end he did. He gave him half. You overheard all of this? Well, they were screaming so loud I couldn't help it. I couldn't sit in here and twirl my thumbs, could I? Then Joe left. Yeah. Where'd he go? I don't know. He just left. 
Dunk gave him back the key to the car and he just left. Did you say anything to Dunk about what you heard? Are you kidding? You think I wanted to get involved in something like a stick up and on me? Dunk stayed here. Yeah. I wanted to go out and get the pizza like he promised, but he just wanted to sit around. The whole thing was bothering him. A stick up? Oh, no. Give him the half to Joe, I think. Well, what happened when the detective knocked on the door? Well, Dunk said, ask who it is. And I asked, and the detective said it was a detective. So Dunk says, don't say anything about him being here. And he went out in the kitchen. So I let the detective in, and he started asking a lot of questions. And I wasn't going to lie to him, and Dunk must have heard this. So he comes out with that gun, and believe me, I was scared. I was scared to death. I knew somebody was going to get killed. Oh, that's the way these things can wind up. Somebody getting killed. You know it, and I was afraid it was going to be me. Within a few minutes, an ambulance from Metropolitan Hospital arrived at the scene, and the ambulance surgeon pronounced Dunk Sipton DOA. Pursuant to the manual of procedure, the medical examiner was notified. So were the homicide squad and the district attorney's office. It is not the province of the police department to pass judgment, only to investigate and present the facts. The death of a human being at the hands of another is always homicide. And it's up to other authorities to say whether a homicide is justifiable, excusable, or felonious. It was not until after 3 o'clock that I was able to return to the station house. I walked around the desk to sign the blotter. Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, told me that detectives of the 24th squad had arrived at the station house to talk to Joe McLeese. When they came into the muster room, he informed them of the shooting and they drove directly to the scene. Patrolman Meister was still upstairs in the 21st squad office with his prisoner, and I went up to talk to him. All the detectives on duty were out on the job. Patrolman Meister and Joe were alone in the room. Hello, Captain. Meister? Listen, how long are you going to keep me sitting here? All right, Joe. All right. Well, look, I got some rights. We all got rights. Come here, Meister. Yes, sir. I'm entitled to an answer, don't you think? Stay on that bench. You'll get your answer later. You've been telling me that for hours. Does he know about his friend and DeLuca? Joe's friend? Yeah. Well, no, sir, I don't guess so. I've been sitting with him. Nobody said anything to me or to him. You saw the detectives go out of here, didn't you? Well, yes, sir. They went out on a shooting over... Does that have some connection with this, Captain? It sure does. Hello, Captain. Matt? Well, we're all cleaned up over there, Captain. You bring the girl in? The look is. Good work, Meister. Well, yes, thank you, sir. Let's talk to him, Captain. Yeah. Hello, Joe. You still here? Not because I want to be. Look, Captain, I was in that bar all night. I don't know anything about any stick-up. You know how many cars there are like mine? There must be 10,000 city in New York. Yeah, maybe there are. I'd hate to have to count them, I'll tell you that. What do you say? Let's call it a night, huh? Up to now, I didn't mind it because I want to help you out if I can. But fair is fair. I don't know anything about what you want to know. Now, Joe, that's a great big lie, isn't it? Why should I lie to you? I got nothing to lie about. You know where I was, Captain Pelham. Yes, I know where you were, Joe. So that settles it. And I know where you're going to be, too. Where? Well, when you're down there and the judge says ten years, ask him for half. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah. A shooting? Where? At the museum or near the museum? Who's doing the shooting? Well, are the police officers there? Now, where is it exactly? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, city of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Eileen Palmer, John Larkin, Frank Moss, John Sylvester, and Frank Campanella. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. 
Art Hanna speaking. But shooting where? At the museum or near the museum? Well, who's doing the shooting? Well, are there any police officers there? You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Yeah. Right away. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. After I turned out the platoon and the men marched out the front door to take over their posts, Lieutenant Matt King, commanding officer of the 21st Detective Squad, came downstairs to confer with me in connection with several pistol license renewal applications that were still pending. According to the Manual of Procedure, each application for renewal must be investigated annually by both the commanding officer and the detective squad commander of the precinct in which the applicant resides or is employed. And they must recommend either approval or disapproval. The gun law of the state of New York is perhaps the strictest in the country, and licenses are granted only upon absolute proof of necessity and good character of the applicant. While Lieutenant King and I were busy in my office, Lieutenant Gorman was on duty as desk officer outside in the muster room, and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, listen. Take a walk around the corner and talk to the butcher there, will you? He's got a complaint about some kids annoying his delivery boy. Yeah, see what it's all about, will you? Okay. That was Pagano, Lieutenant. I gave him the complaint about the butcher. Okay. Yes, sir, can I help you? Yes, you can, Sergeant. Uh, where will I find Lieutenant King? Well, his office is upstairs on the second floor, but I know he's busy right now. He's down here in the captain's office. Oh, well, I've got an appointment with him for 5 o'clock. I'm an attorney, Ellis Hopton. Well, I don't know when he'll be through, Mr. Hopton. Uh, if you want to go upstairs and talk to one of the detectives, maybe they can help you. Do you have any idea how long he'll be tied up? I've got to get downtown to my office. Hey, excuse me a minute. Oh, yeah, sure. Sorry. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right. All right, Captain. Yes, sir. Uh, oh, Captain, would you tell Lieutenant King there's a lawyer named Hopton out here to see him? He has an appointment. Thanks, Sergeant. All right, Captain. I'll tell him. He'll be out in a few seconds, Mr. Hopton. He says, wait here. Okay. Uh, Lieutenant, the captain wants to go out on patrol. Shall I have number five come by the house? All right, number five. Yes, sir. Hello, CB. Sergeant Waters at the 21st. Have 681 call the 21st. Okay, thanks. Well, they keep you pretty busy. Well, yeah, sometimes. Like anything else, it's got its busy times and its quiet times. Oh, uh, there they come now. That's... Lieutenant King in the civilian clothes? Yeah, that's right. Oh, all right, Matt. I'll put him through. Yes, sir. All right, is the car coming by for me, Sergeant? The Hopton? Yes. I've got a call out for it. I'm okay. Lieutenant King. What can I do for him? I want to talk to you about a client of mine. Who is that? Joe Creedy. Oh, yeah. Want to come upstairs to my office? Yes, I would. You hold up on that one until we talk again, Captain? Yes, I will, Matt. When's Joe's case set down for trial? The 20th, Lieutenant. What are you going to do, cop out? Up and sit. I don't know. We haven't decided. You're not going to bat. That's one of the best cases of burglary we ever made around here. In there. Go ahead, Mr. Thank you. Want to go into my office and have a seat? I'll be in there in a second. All right. Is that it there? That's right. Ted. Yes, sir? Where's Goldman? He ran down the 17th. I've got a guy there he wants to talk to on that Blackwell squib. Oh, yeah. I'll tell you what. Yes, sir. Go ahead and take the call. Hmm? 21st Squad, Detective Fitzpatrick. 
No, he's not here now. Who is this? Can I take a message? Yeah, he's working today. He's out on investigation. All right. All right, I'll tell him. Yes, sir? He was writing up a DD-5 for me. Ask him where it is when he rings in or when you see him. Yes, I'll be in my office. Is this chair all right, Lieutenant? Yeah, that's fine. Well, uh, the reason I wanted to see now, you... Now, just a second. I've got one thing to write down before I forget. Oh, sure. Good on names and faces, but figures escape me. All right. Well, as I told you, I'm representing Joe Creedy. Where is he? Down at the tombs? No, he's out on bail. He made 5000 bail? The court reduced it to 2000 His mother scraped up $100 for the bondsman. Mm-hmm. Where's he now? He's been staying at home. Haven't seen him around? Well, I advised him to stay pretty close to the house and not get mixed up with that crowd again. He only makes things worse for himself. Good advice. Think he's taking it? I think he is. He's got a job? Well, it's pretty hard for a boy awaiting trial on a burglary indictment to get steady work, but... He's picking up a few odd jobs here and there. Like what? Well, he told me he was doing some messenger work downtown. And, mm-hmm. and he's got a cousin who does some hauling out in Long Island City. He's been helping him out when he needs help. Want to stick gum? No, no, thanks. Comes up on the 20th, huh? Yeah. What do you want from me? Joe would like to talk to you, Lieutenant. About what? Well, the fact of the matter is I'm trying to get the district attorney to recommend a suspended sentence. I've convinced Joe that the only way he can get it is to be of some help to you. We collared him in the act of committing a burglary. He had plenty of opportunity to tell me everything he knew then. Didn't say a word. Well, I uh, suppose the closer the day comes, the more cooperative he feels. Hmm. When I talked to him, he sure must have thought the penitentiary was a million years away because he didn't feel cooperative at all. Wouldn't tell me the right time of day. You see, I knew those boys had been stealing his blind in his precinct. Cop caught him inside the place. He had two other boys with him. Wouldn't say a word about them or about anything he'd been involved in before. That kid has been into more flats than a paper hanger. Lieutenant, he's got something more on his mind than those burglaries. Hmm? What? I don't know exactly. Hmm. Don't think he does either, Mr. Hodgson. He's looking for a cheap way to save himself a couple of years. They're all alike, these kids. They look you straight in the face and lie like demons. He's not a kid anymore. He's 20 years old. Oh, well, another year he can vote. I have an idea that what he wants to talk about is a homicide case. That he was involved in? Not going to talk about a homicide case to get a suspended sentence on a burglary indictment. But not that he was involved in, that he knows about. If he wants to talk about it, tell him to come and see me. Well, that's just the point, Lieutenant. I tried to get him to come with me. He won't. That's what convinces me he's really got something on his mind. I think he's a little bit frightened. I'll tell you, Mr. Hudson, it's all part of the act. The bigger he can make it sound, the better chance he thinks he's got. Will you go to see him? If I'm around the neighborhood there, I might drop in. I'll see him. I wish I could generate a little more enthusiasm. So do I. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't interest you more. I've seen this happen a million times. I'm sorry to take up your time. That's what I'm here for. Don't blame you. It's your job. Do the best you can for your client. If you get a chance, you will see him. Yeah, sure. If I get the chance, I might drop in on him. See what he has to say. That's all I can ask for, but uh, you better make it before the 20th. He might not be around after that. All right, if I can. But believe me, you've got to discount these things 95%. Yes, yeah, I suppose so. Well, I'll see you again sometime, Lieutenant. Yeah, I'll so very soon. Listen, Sid. Yes, sir. Do you remember that boy, Joe Creedy, the one we jumped up in the act of burglarizing a flat down there on uh, 73rd Street, I think? Yes, sir, I remember. Get his address out of the car. Yes, sir. What is this stuff you're working on? A bunch of disposition of defendant forms. What are you, detective or bookkeeper? It's what I'd like to know, Lieutenant. All right, get it cleaned up. I think we're going to have a heavy night. On what, Lieutenant? I don't know exactly. But that creedy boy thinks it's enough to get him off the hook. If it is enough, it's good and heavy. As a result of what he had heard from the attorney who visited him... 
At 6.15 p.m., Lieutenant King, along with Detective Fitzpatrick, left the station house and drove the squad car to 2nd Avenue, found the address they were looking for, and stopped. Detective Fitzpatrick was instructed to wait in the car while Lieutenant King went into the entrance to a tenement, looked at the mailbox, and walked up the stairs to the third floor. I didn't know who they were. I 
didn't know him from Adam. Who started the conversation between you? Did you or they? Oh, I don't know who started the conversation, actually. I think it started with some discussion about a fight we were watching from the garden. And one of them said, uh, what kind of a jam are you in? I told him what it was and so forth. They took it all in. Were they drunk? No, I wouldn't say they were drunk. They had a few drinks apiece. They were feeling good. What do they want you to go into? Well, it wasn't mentioned right off. I told them I didn't know if I'd be interested because I was in a big jam already. And besides, I told them I never did any of that heavy stuff. I, I didn't want to hurt anybody. Well, how'd you know it was heavy stuff? You said they didn't mention it right off. No, they didn't mention it, no, but they sort of intimated around, you know. Then they dropped the subject after you said you weren't interested? Yeah. When did they pick it up again? Later. Same night, Tuesday? Yeah. How did that come about? Well, we decided to go downtown to have a drink together, uh, to the village. They had a car, and I went with them. On the way down, they stopped in front of a hotel, and one of them said, uh, uh, Woody, I think it was. He said they had a friend staying there, and they'd go in and see if he'd come have a drink, too. So they both got out of the car, and I waited in there. A few minutes later, they come out and get in the car, and we take off. They're laughing so loud they can hardly drive, so I ask them, what's the matter? They say they just stuck up the hotel, the night clerk. But what time was it? Well, about 1 o'clock or one thirty, I guess. Wednesday morning? Yeah. Where was this hotel? Well, I don't know exactly. It was over on the west side in the 60s, I think. Uh, just off Broadway there. Then you went on downtown had some more to drink with him? Yeah. How long did you stay with him? Oh, about an hour or more, I guess. I was a little sore about him laying me open on a deal like that, just sitting in the car. They thought it was a great big joke on me. Hmm. Would have been if you got collared. You're telling me. You stayed with them an hour. What did they do then, drive you home? No, they wanted to stay there, and I told them I had to get home. They said they'd like to see me again, so we made a date for the next night. That was last night? Yeah. When? That joint there, down in the village. And you went? Yeah, I didn't have anything better to do. You, uh, you weren't thinking about going into the deal with them, were you, Joe? Well, to tell you the truth, Lieutenant, I, I did think a little bit about it. At least it must have been in the back of my mind. Otherwise, I don't guess I would have had anything to do with him. What happened last night? Nothing. We just stayed there and drank. Well, what's this about their being right for a homicide? Well, I don't know for sure. You see, this Woody started to say something about the guy they shot up in a hotel job, and Fred shut him up quick. Mm. Were they healed? Guns, you mean? Yeah. Well, I guess they were. They must have had him to stick up that hotel, don't you think? What time is your date to meet them tonight? How'd you know I had a date to meet them tonight? Figures, doesn't it? Yeah, I guess so. 10.30. Where, at the same bar downtown? No, they said they'd pick me up in the car. At your house? No. On Fifth Avenue, right by that museum there. Uh, the Metropolitan. Why is that? I don't know. That's where they said. Meet them there. I guess they want to come through the park there and go right downtown. You said one of them is named Woody. What's the rest of his name? Oh, that's all I know. He never said his other name. And Fred? Fred Hans. Where did they live? Exactly, you mean? I, I don't know. They never said. Over on the west side there. I know they eat in those restaurants up on Broadway in the 70s and 80s. That's what they said anyway. I, I don't know exactly. Well, I guess it doesn't make any difference. They won't be there long anyway. Lieutenant King took Joe Creedy and returned to the station house with him. There he made plans to arrest the two men when they arrived at the corner of 5th Avenue and the 86th Street Transverse through Central Park at 10.30 that night. In order to keep them off their guard, Joe Creedy consented to wait on the corner as had been arranged. Detectives on foot would be placed in strategic positions. Lieutenant King picked for himself and Detective Fitzpatrick a doorway across Fifth Avenue, almost directly opposite the meeting place, and with a clear view of the entire area down to the massive steps and columns of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. At 10.20, Joe Creedy, on instructions from Lieutenant King, crossed Fifth Avenue and took his place on the corner. The detectives watched. Fifteen minutes later, they were still watching and waiting. 
That kid dreamed all this up. They can throw away the key for all I care, Lieutenant. It's cold out here. Yeah. Well, who serves coffee to the poor detectives on a night like this, huh? No gray ladies in sight. No volunteers. Nobody. All right, hold it. The car coming through. Stop it. Stay back. Yeah. It's them. Good. Following instructions. He's stalling them. Yeah. All right, let's go. Yep. Come on, come on. They're getting out of the car to talk to him. Here comes Goldman. Beach. Come on, let's see it. They're going to light out. Cut him off that way. They're heading for the museum. Hold up. Hold up there. Hold up. There they go. They're going up the steps. Hold up. Watch it. He's turning. That's they shooting at. Come on. You see them? Okay, hold it up. Where are they? You see them? Stay back there. Stay where you are. Watch it from that end. Well, at least they can't get down without our seeing them. Yeah. We can't get up without them seeing us. See that stone pedestal over there? Yeah. Try to make it to there, okay? It's okay with me. Come on. Okay, drop. I don't see them. What do you say, you two? Want to call it a night? Lieutenant. What do you say, all right? 
Come on, we've got them. Get somebody to ring in for an ambulance. Listen, can I reach my pocket for a cigarette? You just better sit there. Did you get the other guy, too? Joe? What happened to him? He didn't run with us. He played it smart. Yeah, he played it smart. For a change. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. We want an ambulance up here. At the station house. What? Yeah, an injured, an injured prisoner. Well, who gave it to you? CB? We got no name on him yet. Well, how soon will it be here? And when? so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day... Every year, a police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed. The factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, city of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Lawson Zerby, Bill Zuckert, Bryna Rayburn, William Redfield, and George Petrie. Written and directed by Stanley Niss, Gaylord Avery speaking. 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 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. What do you mean, suspicious men? Where are they? They're both sitting in the car? What kind of a car? Yeah. Yeah. You are, by transcription, in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Okay, I'll send the officers over there to have a look. Now, you don't have to worry about that. All right. Yeah. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was 7.25 when I arrived at the station house. I signed the blotter and went into my office where I changed into uniform. Then, since it had been 24 hours since I was last on duty, I sat down at my desk to glance over reports and communications covering that time in order to bring myself up to date on conditions in the precinct before I turned out the 8th to 4th platoon. <clears throat> 21st precinct, Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Rose, I'm P.S., Captain. Yes, Sergeant. Is he working the 8 to 4? Yes, sir. All right, tell him to come in. Okay, Captain. Okay, Dylan. Oh, uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Is Lieutenant King in the house yet? I haven't seen him come in, Captain. All right, let me know when he does. Yes, sir. Come in. Oh, come in, Dylan. Yes, sir. Good morning, Captain. Dylan, what is it? There was an envelope left for me at the station house yesterday, Captain. Yes, it had a hundred dollars in it. In cash? Yes, sir. Who left it? I don't know, sir. There was no name. Where was it left? At the desk, I suppose, Captain. It was in the mail rack. Were you on the job yesterday? Yes, sir. When did you find it in the rack? When I came off the tour. Exactly what was in the envelope? Five twenty-dollar bills and a short note. What did the note say? Well, it just said. With much gratitude to a fine young public servant. 
No signature? No, sir. No return address on the envelope? No, sir. How was the envelope addressed? I just had my name and my shield number on it. Was it handwritten or typed? Handwritten, sir. A note, too? Yes, sir. Where are they? I have them here. All right, let's see them. Yes, sir. Oh, pretty good paper. Yes, sir. Nice, nice and heavy. This is uh, just how it came. It was sealed, Captain. Yes, I understand that. You have any idea who brought it in? No, sir. Why didn't you turn it into the desk officer as soon as you received it? Well, Captain, I didn't open up the envelope until I got home. You mean there was a letter in the rack for you and you didn't open it until you got home last night? No, sir, I didn't. You saw what it was, and you decided to bring it right in to me this morning. Yes, sir. Well, I'm glad you understand. It's contrary to the rules to accept gratuities. Yes, sir, I, I understand. Between you and me, Dylan, it's also contrary to the rules to uh, think about it overnight. I didn't open up the envelope until I got home, Captain. I couldn't come back with it last night. Yes, I understand. You haven't any idea where this hundred dollars came from. No, sir. Lieutenant Gorman was on the job as desk officer yesterday during the 8th of fall, wasn't he? Yes, sir. And who had T.S. duties? Sergeant Waters the first four hours and Sergeant Tierney the second four. Well, which one of the three of them received this envelope? I don't know, Captain. Sit down, Dylan. Yes, sir. Morning, 1st Precinct. Sergeant Rosen. Sergeant, is Lieutenant Gorman out at the desk yet? No, sir. He just came in. He's changing. Did you see Sergeant Waters around there? I see Sergeant Waters in the back room. Yes, sir. All right. Go get him and ask him to step into my office. Yes, sir. What about Lieutenant Gorman? You want to see him? I'll let you know after I talk to Sergeant Waters. Yes, sir. You, uh, you have no idea where this money came from, huh, Dylan? No, sir. You mean you've... Uh, been a fine young public servant on so many occasions that it would be just impossible to recall one particular incident? No, sir. It's just that... Well, it's not that. I, I just have no recollection of anything I did that might lead to this. Well, it appears to be a woman's handwriting. Does that help any? No, sir. I went through every page of my memorandum book back for the last four or five weeks. There wasn't a thing in there nor anything else that I could recall. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's pretty good paper, all right. Well, you have his stuff. Yes, sir. And brand new 20s. Come in. Sergeant Rosen said you wanted to see me, Captain. Yes, Sergeant, come in. Yes, sir. Hello, Dylan. Sergeant Water. What time did you have telephone switchboard duty yesterday, Sergeant? No, to the end of the tour, Captain. Mm -hmm. You recognize this envelope? Oh, yeah. Lieutenant Gorman was busy booking a prisoner. One of the detectives brought down. A woman came in the front door, and I asked her if I could help her. She said she wanted to leave a note for Patrolman Dillon. This was it. I took it back and put it in the rack. Did the woman leave her name? No, sir. You didn't recognize her as anyone you know? No, sir. How old a woman was she? Well, late 60s or early 70s, I'd say, Captain. She wasn't young. Does that make it easier for you, Dillon? No, sir. What'd she look like, Sergeant? Well, she was pretty well dressed. She had on a fur coat. I imagine she was 5'3 or 5'4. Rather on the thin side. Gray hair and she wore glasses. There was a little bit of class about it. What'd she say to you, Sergeant? She asked if she could leave an envelope for Patrolman Dillon. I said, yeah, sure. She wanted to know if he'd be sure to get it. I told her he was working on that too, and I'd leave it in the mail rack. But everybody checks the mail rack when they come in off the job. Do you have anything else to say? Well, nothing important. The lieutenant was booking a narcotics uh, prisoner, and I could see she was a little bit fascinated about that. She was trying to make small talk to stick around a few minutes longer. What kind of small talk? Well, she was telling me about a trip. She just got back from Nashville. She spent about six weeks down there. Said she went before Christmas. Is that so? Yes, sir. Told me she traveled all over the world by herself at one time or another. The only continent she hadn't been to was Australia. A pretty interesting whole day. Did uh, she tell you exactly when she got back? Monday, I think she said. Uh, yes, sir, Monday. There's nothing you can recall Monday or Tuesday, is there, Dylan? No, sir. I was off Monday and Tuesday. Well, what about yesterday? Not a thing yesterday, Captain. Well, it must have been before she went away. Yes, sir. 
The woman left a gratuity of $100 for Dylan, Sergeant. Did she? You have any idea who it was, Dylan? No, sir. Must have been before Christmas. You uh, still have the pages in your memorandum book that go back that far? Yes, sir. They're down in my locker. Well, uh, without referring to your memorandum book, do you have any recollection of any occurrence involving a woman such as Sergeant Waters described? Any recollection of anything that occurred before Christmas sometime? No, sir. Not, not offhand. Were you assigned to your present post then? No, sir. I was on number seven. I was on number seven for about two months before the first of the year. I... Wait a minute. Yes? There was something that happened right around the middle of December that might have a connection. What's that? Well, I don't know whether this is it or not. What? Well, I was on post there, and I saw a woman flag a taxi. A woman such as Sergeant Waters described? Yes, sir. The cab pulled into this bus stop. The driver opened the door, and she started to get in. And just as she was getting in, a car's Tom bus came up and bumped the cab in the back. Not hard. It was stopping, and there was an ice patch in the street. I guess the driver misjudged his distance a little. Anyway, it knocked the cab forward a little bit and threw her into the gutter. Uh-huh. Well, I went across, and I picked her up. She wasn't hurt bad. Skinned the palm of her hands, I think, and one knee. We a pair of stockings and a pair of gloves. Yeah, I know. Well, there wasn't any damage to the bus and none to the cab either. I got the name of the bus driver and let him go. I sat the lady in the back of the cab and asked her if she wanted to go to the hospital. She said she wasn't hurt, but I tried to talk her into going to the hospital. You think this might have been the woman? Well, Captain, it's the only instance I remember, but... To tell you the truth, I don't see why she'd be grateful a hundred dollars for it. She was the victim of an accident, and I was there. I just did what I could. Didn't you make out an aided card? Yes, sir, but she refused medical aid. About uh, December 15th, you say? Yes, sir, about the middle of December, Captain, before Christmas. Sergeant, will you see if you can find that US-6 in the file? Okay, Captain. Uh, was it our 66 or 65th, Dylan? 66, Sergeant. Bus was eastbound, if I remember. 66 to Madison, I think. Okay. I got the pages from my memorandum book down in my locker cabin. You know, well, her name and address should be on the on the six. Yes, sir, they are. I don't see why she should be the one, though, Captain. I didn't do anything for her. Well, sometimes a kind word can go a long way. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Twenty first, please, Captain Canale. Sergeant Rose, I'm P.S. Captain. Lieutenant King is ringing down for you. Okay. Hello, Matt. Yes, Captain. Listen, Matt, I came in this morning and the desk officer told me we had a call about two suspicious men in an automobile parked on 89th Street in Lexington this morning about 2.30. Yes, sir? He sent a car over there to take a look and it turned out to be two detectives from the safe and loft squad on a plant. Now, we're supposed to get notification when there's a plant in this precinct. This is the first I've heard of it, Captain. When we get a call about two suspicious men in an automobile at 2.30 in the morning, we've got to send over there and look into it. Supposing whoever they were watching there saw these uniformed officers stop. Well, that might spoil a collar for the detectives. I didn't even know they were in the precinct, Captain. I'll check into it and see why the desk officer wasn't notified. Well, right, you go ahead and check into it, Matt. I'm going to send a 49 downtown anyway. Okay, Captain. I'll let you know what they say. I'd be interested. See you, Matt. Yes, sir. Uh, did you uh, tell your wife about the envelope, Dylan? Yes, sir. What'd she have to say? Well, come in. Oh, uh, come in, Sergeant. Yes. I found it, Captain. December the 16th. That's about right. What's the woman's name? Edna Coleskill, 67 years old. 783, 73. Oh, yeah, yeah. When are you on TS today, Sergeant? The early part of the tour. All right. As soon as you go out on patrol, take a ride over and see Mrs. Coleskill. You'll know if it's the same woman who left the envelope. Yes, sir. All right. You're excused, Dylan. Better change in the uniform. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. You're welcome. Tell her I'm much obliged, Sergeant. I will. If it's the same woman. Here you are, Sergeant. If it's her, get a receipt. Yes, sir. Oh, I know that house. That's a private residence. One of those old mansions. I, I think this lady's going to turn out to be a rich dowager. Yeah. Well... You make her a hundred dollars richer. You're listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Sergeant Waters finished his telephone switchboard duty at noon and was relieved by Sergeant Kenny. After his meal, he went on patrol of the precinct, supervising the men on the job. Pursuant to my instructions, he had his operator, Patrolman Jacoby, drive to 783 East 70th Street, 
a four-story white limestone mansion built in the early part of the century. When the car pulled in front of the house, he told Jacoby to wait. Sergeant Waters got out, crossed the sidewalk, mounted the marble steps, and walked to the huge iron grill door. He rang the bell, waited a moment, then rang a second time. Through the glass, he saw a butler approach. Good afternoon. Is this the residence of Edna Colfield? Uh, yes, it is. Is he home? I'd like to talk to him. Is there some trouble? No, I'd just like to see him. Would you come in, please? Yeah. Does she expect you, Sergeant? No. Uh, you are Sergeant... Waters, uh, sir. Sergeant Waters. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Mrs. Coleskill is in the upstairs sitting room. Oh. This way, please. Quite a place. Yes, it is. Reminds me of City Hall. Um, uh, upstairs, please. One becomes accustomed to it. I am at. Mrs. Coastal came here as a bride in 1907. Uh, you, uh, you don't have any alarming news, do you? No, nothing like that. This way, please. Thanks. Would you wait right here a moment, please? Uh, I shall announce you. Oh, yeah. Uh, it'll just be a moment. <clears throat> Sergeant Waters of the police department, madam. Uh, yes, madam. All right, sir. <clears throat> uh, Mrs. Coleskill will see you, Sergeant. Uh, this way, please. There'd be some place to throw a party. <laughs> there had been some uh, thrown here. Sergeant Waters. Come in, come in, please. And uh, would you please tell Myra that the menu for dinner is fine? Yes, madam. Yes, pardon? Hello, Mrs. Coleskill. Oh, you and I had that nice talk yesterday. That's right. At the police station. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm so glad you came, won't you sit down? Thank you. Well, I didn't tell you my name. How did you find out who I was? Uh, Mrs. Colskill, I came to give you back your hundred dollars. Doesn't that boy want it? Well, it's not a question of whether he wants it or not. He's not allowed to take it. Oh, now that's ridiculous. It's my money. If I want to give him a hundred dollars, I just give it to him. It's contrary to the regulation. But it's still my hundred dollars. I know, if but... If I want to give someone a hundred dollars, that's between me and the person I give it to, don't you think? That's what I think, Mrs. Colson. Well, you come here and tell me the boy isn't allowed to accept a hundred dollars. It must be what you think. I was sent here to give it back to you. By whom? By the captain. Well, then why didn't the captain come here himself? Why did he have someone else to do his dirty work? It's not the captain's fault. Oh, now, in a minute, you're going to be up to President Eisenhower. And I know he had nothing to do with it. No, ma'am. Now, I want you to go back and tell that captain something. I want you to tell him that I was perfectly delighted with the young policeman. He couldn't have been more solicitous. He was concerned about me. He wanted to help me. He wanted to get an ambulance. He was just determined to see that I was taken care of. It's all part of his job. If I want to show my gratitude, that's up to me. Uh, Mrs. Colby. I'm an old woman. I have no family anymore. I live in this big house all alone. I'm just fortunate to have a considerable amount of money. Now, he didn't know that. He had no way of knowing it. I just wanted to show him how I felt. We do the same thing for everyone. Well, that's good. I congratulate you. Now, tell the captain to let the boy keep the $100 and let's forget the whole thing. I'm sorry, Mrs. Colson. Well, you certainly don't seem sorry. That's not what I mean exactly. I I mean I'll have to return the money. Supposing I don't want to take it. I was long enough getting it to him, heaven knows. The very next day after that accident, I went to my house in Nassau. I've been thinking about that young man ever since. Now, I just got back Monday, and one of the first things I did was to go over and leave that envelope. I wanted to do it. I just had to show my gratitude. Now, you're not going to deny an old lady a small pleasure. I'm not denying you anything, ma'am. Well, you certainly are. Don't give me any more of those excuses about that captain and President Eisenhower, because I won't believe a word of it. What's his name, anyway? Kennelly. Captain Frank Kennelly. Well, who does she think he is? Look, Mrs. Coleskill, I want you to take this money and sign a receipt for it. Well, I can see I won't get anywhere with you. 
There's a pen on that desk, Jerry, if you'll be good enough to get it. I got a pen. Oh, thank you. Is that captain there now? Yes, ma'am. He'll be there until 6 o'clock. Mm. There you are. Uh, uh, captain Kelly, huh? Kennelly. Well, there's 20, 40, 60, 80, and 100. Kennelly. Well, you tell him to expect me. I'm going over there this afternoon and find out what this is all about. Captain, indeed. He can't tell me what to do. No, but he sure can tell me, and he did. Sergeant Waters left the mansion on East 70th Street and resumed patrol of the precinct. At 3.15, the men who were devoting the night tour began to stream into the station house. They walked in the front door, through the back room, and down to the lockers to change the uniform. After they dressed, they came upstairs to the back room where they copied posted alarms for wanted persons and automobiles into their memorandum books and were inspected by the patrol sergeant of the oncoming tour. Promptly at 4 p.m., the desk officer hit the bell and the men marched out into the muster room for the turnout. After the roll call, I gave them special instructions and on command of the sergeant, they marched out the front door to take over their post, relieving the men who had been working the 8 to 4. Following the turnout, I remained behind the desk for a few minutes, talking to Lieutenant Snyder, the oncoming desk officer. Then, as I crossed the muster room toward my office, I saw Sergeant Waters come in the front door. Sergeant? Yes, sir. Did you get to see that Mrs. Cole's kill, Sergeant? Yes, sir, I did. Had an awful time getting her to take the money back. She took it, didn't she? Finally? Yes. All right. Face the receipt in the property book. Okay, Captain. Oh, uh, she didn't come in to see you, did she? Now, did she say she was going to? That's what she told me. She hasn't been here yet. Well, you've got something to look forward to, Captain. Uh-huh. Captain Ellie. Yes? Lieutenant Kelly is bringing down for you from upstairs. All right, I'll take it in my office. Yes, All right, Sergeant, I'll see you. Okay, Captain. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Lieutenant King, Captain. Yes, Matt. I checked downtown on those two detectives who were on a plant here last night. Yeah? didn't know they were going to plant that building. They had a suspect under surveillance, and he went in there. Oh. Just waiting for him to come out. It wasn't time to let the desk officer know they were on a plant. Oh. Okay, man. I mean, thought it might have been something like that, Captain. The safe and lost squad's pretty good about letting us know what they're doing. They don't want to take a chance on spoiling a collar any more than you don't want to spoil it for them. Yeah. All right, man. Yeah, sir. Twenty-first precinct, Captain Connelly. Sergeant Roseman, P.S. Captain. Yes. There's a Mrs. Cole skill out here to see you, Captain. All right, ask her to come in. Yes, sir. Oh, and uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I want to see Patrolman Dillon when he gets in our post. Okay, Captain. Are you Captain Kennelly? That's right, Miss Cole skill. Would you uh, come in, please? Yes. I must say you don't look like such a monster. Don't I? Would you like to sit down? Thank you. Yes, Miss Colesgill. I understand that you're the one who deprived that young man of what I gave him. I didn't deprive him of anything, Mrs. Colesgill. What do you call it, then? It's contrary to the rules for a member of the force to accept a gratuity for the performance of his duty. It was more than a performance of his duty. He went out of his way to be extraordinarily considerate of me. He wanted to help me and get an ambulance and a doctor and make sure I was all right. That's exactly what he was supposed to do. And you won't let him take the money? I can't let him take the money. If he did, I'd be required to prefer charges against him. I see. No, I don't think you do, Mrs. Colesgill. Well, I'll tell you, Captain. I decided that I would do something for that young man, and I'm going to. He can't accept anything from you. You may not know it, but I have a reputation for being slightly eccentric. If I weren't so wealthy and so old, people might say I'm unbalanced. But with age and money, they're kind enough to call it eccentricity. Now, because of your silly rule, you've made me all the more determined. I can assure you, Mrs. Goldskill, you are no more determined than I am. Well, you don't know how determined I can get. You see, after that sergeant came this afternoon and practically forced me into taking the hundred dollars back, I just came and got my eccentricity out. Did you? I decided there must be a way, and I was determined to find out what it was. There's no way to give him money. Oh, isn't there? No. 
I can certainly lead it to him. I checked with my attorney. I had him on the telephone for an hour this afternoon. I can name the boy in my will, and there's not a thing you can do about it. You know the whole police department or anyone. Is there? Well, I suppose we can't tell you how to dispose of your estate. And I want to tell you that the amount will be many times the puny hundred dollars you wouldn't let him take. Many times the amount. My attorney is already preparing a codicil. I'm going to sign it tomorrow, so you needn't try to talk me out of doing it. I can't try to talk you out of it, Mrs. Schofield. Well, that's all I've had on my mind. I hope you're satisfied. I'm sure that young man patrolman Dylan will be. As I said, Mrs. Goldfield, we can't tell you how to draw your will. I know very well you can. I know that very well. You wanted to see me, Captain? Yes, Dylan. Oh, hello there, young man. Mrs. Goldfield, I... I certainly appreciate what you tried to do, but I had to turn the money back. Against the rules. So I understand. I've just been talking to him. But don't you worry. You're a very nice young man. And I'm sure you'll do very well for yourself in life. Don't you think so, Captain? Yes, I think so. Goodbye, Captain. Mr. Coltsville. And goodbye, young man. Goodbye, Mr. Coltsville. It was a pleasure knowing you. Yes, Captain. Come inside. Yes, sir. Hello, Dylan. You spent eight hours on post today, isn't that right? Yes, sir. And for eight hours, you've been thinking maybe you were a fool for turning in that hundred dollars because no one would ever have known about it except you and her. No, Captain, I wasn't thinking that, not exactly. All right. Take my word for it. You did exactly what you should have done. Yes, sir. It might take a little while for you to get absolute proof of the fact, but you'll get it. I guarantee you will. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. I'm robbing the 24th. Well, we don't know much more about it here. We've got the car. And on. so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, transcribed. The factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, city of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Ethel Everett, Bill Quinn, and Ivor Francis. Written and directed by Stanley Nitz. Stuart Nett speaking. 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 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Now, wait a minute, just a second. Where is it? Where? Yeah. Yeah. Now, what apartment number? Now, what's the trouble there? You what? You are in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. You just stay right there. I'll send the officers right over. Yeah. Right away. All right. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. It was Saturday, and I had been off the job since 8 a.m. I arrived home a little after 9 and found Ellen in the kitchen having breakfast. I sat down at the table, had a cup of coffee with her, and at ten minutes to ten, Ellen left to go shopping, and I went into the bedroom and got undressed. I read the morning papers for a few minutes, finally put them aside, and fell asleep. 
It must have been several hours later that I heard a bell ringing in the distance. It was the telephone. Now. Lieutenant, what do we got? Uh, that homicide, Captain. Yeah? You know the fellow who runs out of pine store down on Lex, the one who gives the radio every year for the kids' Christmas party, Boob Rider? Yeah? Well, was he killed? Uh, no, sir. He went home after lunch, found a guy there with his wife, shot him both. Oh. The ambulance hasn't gotten there yet, but Sergeant Waters just rang in from the scene. He said he thinks the man's dead, but the wife appears to be alive. Well, uh, what about Brider? Well, we got him. He was sitting down on the couch waiting. All right. You send a car for me, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. What's the address there? Uh, 608 East 67, Captain. Okay. I'll send the car right out for you. Yeah. By the time I shaved, dressed, and had another cup of coffee, the car sent by the desk officer, Lieutenant Snyder, was in front of the house. I went outside, got in, and we drove to Manhattan across the Triborough Bridge, down the Franklin D. Roosevelt Drive along the East River, and finally to the scene of the homicide at 608 East 67th Street, a modern and fairly well-kept apartment house. On the street in front of the building were parked two sector cars of the 21st, the sergeant's car, the detective squad car, the morgue wagon, and what I presume to be two or three other departmental vehicles. I got out of my car and instructed the operator, patrolman Farrell, to ring into the desk officer for further instructions. Then I crossed the sidewalk, walked past a small crowd of curious citizens who had gathered, and through the door to the building where Patrolman Vaccaro, who had been posted there, saluted me. Inside, I headed directly for the self-service elevator. All right. Watch it coming off there. Yep. Oh, hello, Captain. Sergeant. Sergeant. All right, come on with that litter. Swing it around south there. Now, watch the corner, will you? Yeah, okay. Watch it All finished up there, Sergeant? Well, he is, Captain. All right, go on. You're okay now. The medical examiner's been here and gone. What about the wife? Tell you, Captain. She's still alive. Uh, hang it out there. I'm going upstairs with the captain. Okay, Captain. Right. Uh, go ahead, Captain. All right. How bad is she? I can't figure how she's still alive, Captain. One on the head and one on the chest. Uh-huh. And it was, and I popped them. He used a 38 automatic he keeps in the store. Who's up there now? Lieutenant King and his detectives and some men from the homicide squad. Just about getting finished up. Where's Brider? He's still upstairs. Lieutenant King is talking to him. Did he say why he did it? Yes, sir. Said he was tired of her running around with other men. He wanted to put a stop to it. And permanently, hmm? Yes, sir. I guess that's what he had in mind. Over. To the right, there, Captain. All right, you men. What are you here for? Get those people out of the hall. Go ahead, Captain. This is where the man's body was, right here. Between the coffee table and the couch. One shot got him, right between the eyes. Yeah. The wife was over here. Ryder apparently went after the man first. Wife tried to get away. He caught up with her right here. Looks like she was dodging him around the dining room table. He fired at her from this side of it. She fell down over there against the sideboard. Any children, Sergeant? Yes, sir. There's a girl about 17. Where is she? We don't know. We think she's out with some friends this afternoon. What's the dead man's name? Got an identification on him yet? Yes, sir. According to the cards in his pocket, he was Harold Shipstead, 864 Crowell Avenue in the Bronx, 43 years old. I see. Where's Lieutenant King? Uh, Where's Lieutenant King? He's in the kitchen. All right, come on. Well, I got a permit, Lieutenant. I got a permit to keep it in the store. Doesn't give you a license to kill people with it. Hello, Captain. Ma'am? Captain? Wood? I know it doesn't. I just wanted you to know I've got a permit to have the gun in the store. We got stuck up once a couple of years ago when I applied. Hello, Captain. Mr. Brider? I'm sorry I caused you so much trouble. I went out of my head, I guess. You know how you can get. Something bothers you on your mind. I just wasn't going to let her get away with it anymore, that's all. She's been doing this to me for 15 years. I had enough of it. I couldn't take it anymore. Did you know Harold Shipstead? Sure, I know. 
She's been running around with him two or three years. I told her. I told her if I ever caught them together, she'd know what to expect. How'd you know I was here? Don't worry about that. I got friends in this room. One of my friends called me. Who was that? Never mind. Was it a neighbor, somebody on this floor? Never mind who it was. You got your gun and came home. Yeah. I told her what would happen. I warned her plenty of times. What did you see when you opened the door? I saw them. What were they doing? Sitting there, having a drink. You saw the glasses. Him coming over here in the middle of the day and drinking with her while I'm slaving away in the store trying to make a buck. That's what burned me up more than anything. I hate to be made a sucker, huh? That's what they were doing to me. They were playing me for a chump. For years she'd been playing me for a chump. Well, I'll tell you something. I just wasn't going to take it anymore. Uh, uh, listen, uh, uh, do you mind if I get a drink of water? I won't try nothing, I promise you. Go ahead. Sergeant, you better get some of these men back on patrol. Okay, Captain. Right away. All right. Oh, hi, Mike. Nice, uh, the uh, glasses are in the cabin. Go ahead. Anybody else? No. Uh, how is she, do you know? My wife? We haven't heard yet. You'll keep me informed, won't you? I want to be kept informed. We'll keep you informed, yeah. Sure, nobody else? You're perfectly welcome, you know. I've got nothing against you, fellas. We're just not thirsty. Are you a detective? Are you sure? Positive. Captain will tell you. I'm a great friend of the cops. Every year I give a little radio from the store as a prize for the kids' Christmas party. Isn't that right, Captain? Every year, without fail. Yes, that's right. Sit down, Mr. Brighter. Uh, listen, I, I, I think there's some cold beer in the icebox. Would anybody like a can of cold beer? Sit down. All right, I was just wondering. Somebody did. You know, the whole thing is just catching up with me. I'm beginning to get a little bit shaky. Look at that. I'm nervous all over. I'm never like that. I'm steady as an arrow, usually. I'd like to get out of here. That's what's doing it. Hanging around here. We'll be going to the station house as soon as the detectives get finished up in here. We're waiting for somebody from the district attorney's office to come. What do you need somebody from the district attorney's office for? The way we handle things. Oh. oh. Excuse me, man. Yeah, sure, Captain. You, uh, you have a daughter, don't you, Mr. Brighter? Yeah, we do. What's her name? Janie, Jane. Mm -hmm. How old is she? She'll be 17. You know, I forgot all about her. What you gonna say? You think she'll blame me? I mean, she ought to understand my position. Where is she? You know? I don't know. In school, I guess. Today is Saturday. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's right. Well... Sometimes she goes down to Times Square on Saturday afternoon with some friends. They go to a movie together, you know, a bunch of girls. Well, what time would you expect her home? I don't know. And she'd come home before supper, usually. Listen, let's go to the station house now. I, I, I don't want to be here when she comes. Do you have any relatives we can notify to come take care of her? Me? No. I got nobody. Mm. Does your wife? Well, she's got a sister in Syracuse, but... I don't see what you have to tell her for. Well, somebody's got to take care of the girl. Well, what's the matter with me? I can take care of her. You'll be kind of busy, Mr. Brighter. Even when the perpetrator is arrested immediately, a homicide investigation is conducted in a detailed and exacting manner as described in the manual of procedure. After the victim has been pronounced dead by an ambulance surgeon, the medical examiner of the city of New York is notified. In the meantime, detectives of the precinct squad and the homicide squad of the borough are on the job. A photographer takes pictures of the body and of the scene from every possible angle. The ranking superior officer of the detective division present dictates a complete description of the scene to a homicide squad stenographer. In cases such as the one at hand, where a victim is critically wounded, detectives have an additional arduous task to perform. At 3.20 p.m., Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, and Detective Ellis P. Wood drove downtown to Bellevue Hospital, went to the emergency section in Building I, and walked down the corridor with the resident surgeon in attendance. Strangely enough, Lieutenant, it's not a head wound we're so concerned about at the moment. Oh, no? No, sir. A penetrating wound of the chest has caused a hemothorax. It's a collection of blood in the pleural cavity. Yeah, I know. Oh, that's it, gentlemen, down there. That's where we've got it. Just a second, Doctor. Before we go in... Yes. Do you think it's pretty hopeless? Yes, I'd say so. 
If she lives to the day, I'd be surprised. Now, you can appreciate that these dying declarations are rather difficult to handle. Oh, yeah. But as I said, she told me herself she knew she was going to die. You sure of it? Hmm. All right. This detective is going to take everything down in writing. I hope you'll be able to understand what she says. She has a drain up to her nose, you know. Yeah, we'll manage. All right, Woody. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Trouble all the time. Jealous, jealous over nothing. Man couldn't look at me and he'd start a fight. 
Has he ever threatened to do anything like this before? Threatened? You go wild. I asked the super to come up and fix the pipe under the sink. He beat me up. Right in front of Jane, he beat me up. That's your daughter, Jane. Where is she? Why hasn't Janie been here? Aren't you going to let me see her? Yes, Mrs. Ryder. As soon as we locate her. All right, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. I think that ought to be all for now. All right. Don't leave me, please. I, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. I'll send the nurse in, Mrs. Brady. Please, please send someone in. I don't want to be alone. She'll be right in. Okay, Woody. Yes, sir. Don't forget. I won't. Okay. Got a rough job, Lieutenant. Mm. Part of it isn't pleasant. Shall I get that written up and bring it back down here, Lieutenant? Maybe we can get a signature. You can try. Isn't a signature necessary? Not on a dying declaration, as long as there are witnesses. Well, it's really important. You've got your man. Well, the district attorney thinks it's important. If he wants to make a case of first-degree murder, Lieutenant. I think this must be the daughter coming with Sergeant Waters. No, I am. Hello, Lieutenant. Hi. What are you, Sergeant? This is uh, Jane Ryder. Where's my mother? I want to see my mother. This is the doctor who's taking care of her, Janie. Oh, is she? Is she all right? I'm not going to lie to you, miss. She's pretty bad. Oh, my God. Dear God. I'd like to go in and see her? Yes, can I? I mean, is it all right? It'll be all right. Just a second. Yes. You know how this happened, Janie. Yes, I know. It was my father. What are you going to do to him? I'm not going to do anything to him. That's up to the courts. I wish it was up to me. I just wish it was up to me. Lieutenant King returned to the station house to continue the investigation. In the meantime, I had also gone there in the company of the police commissioner and the chief inspector of the department who had come to the scene of the homicide for a first-hand report on the crime. At the station house, I went upstairs with them to the 21st Detective Squad where they sat in on the questioning of the confessed killer, Louis Brider, by an assistant district attorney. During the course of the questioning, we received word from Bellevue that Mrs. Brider had died. Died while her daughter was in the room. When the high brass were ready to leave the station house, I came downstairs to the muster room with them. They signed the blotter and left the precinct. After they had gone, I went into my office to glance at some of the reports on my desk before I, too, went home. Yes, come in. Can I see you a minute, Captain? Yes, come in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. I've got that reinvestigation report on that LD-80 you asked me to check out. Yeah. Said you wanted it as soon as possible. I can have the clerical man type it up right away if you want to send it down to the license division this afternoon. No, that's all right, Sergeant. I won't be able to put an endorsement on it until tomorrow anyway. Yes, sir. Well, it was a pretty sad case over there this afternoon. An homicide. Yeah. She died, you know. Yeah, so I hear. Well. Oh, uh, just a second, Sergeant. I guess it. Excuse me. 21st Precinct, Captain Canale. Yes, Matt. Captain Woody just came in with that brighter girl. He rang upstairs from the muster room. Yeah? We were just about starting downstairs with her father to book him. Can she wait in your office for a few minutes? I don't think they ought to run into each other just yet. All right, Matt, sure. Are there uh, any provisions being made to take care of her? Yes, there's some friends of the family are coming here for her. But the assistant DA wants to take her statement first. All right, Matt, she can sit in here. I'm leaving anyway. Yes, sir. Uh, how many more of those LD-80s have you got to investigate, Sergeant? Just one more, Captain, besides the one I completed today. All right. Let's get them in. Yes, sir. I'll finish up on the other one tomorrow. Yes, come in. Lieutenant King said it would be all right to wait in here, Captain. Yes, that's all right, Woody. Come on in. Come on, Jenny. All right, I'm coming. This is Captain Kennelly. Come on, Jenny. Why don't you... Sit right down there. Yes. Yeah. 
I'll see you tomorrow, Captain. Oh, uh, shut the door, will you, Sergeant? Yes, sir. Well, you can sit down, Jane. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. Will you tell me something? Well, I'll try. Why can't I cry? I want to cry. I can't cry. You will. Give yourself a chance. I should. I know it. But I can't. I tried it at the hospital, and I tried it in the car. And I couldn't, could I? No, you couldn't. Where is he? Where's my father? I don't know. I don't know where he is. Is he here, Captain? Well, there's no use lying to you, Janie. He's here. He's upstairs. I want to see him. I've got to see him. You'll see him later. I want to tell him what a mistake he made. I want to tell him how good she was to me and to him and to everybody. It's the only thing that was wrong with her. She was too good. I want to tell him what a mistake he made. Well, I think he knows that. I want to see him. Now, Janie, things are bad enough. Don't make them worse. It couldn't be any worse. I don't know what I'm going to do. I just don't know. Look, there's no use in my telling you that everything will work out all right. We both know that everything is pretty bad, but a lot of people are going to try and help you. Take my advice, Janie. Let them. I want to talk to him. I want to tell him what he's done. No, Janie. What he's done to me and to her and to everybody. I want to tell him I feel like killing him. That's how I feel like killing him. You don't feel that way. You know how I feel? You can't tell me how I feel. Nobody knows at all. Well, right now, I think you feel a little bit better. I'll see you, Woody. Yes, sir. You take care of her. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. That's B-R-I-B-E-R. No middle name. Isn't that right, Mr. Pryor? They'd be out alive for you, Lieutenant Snyder. No middle name. Huh? Just a second, Matt. Yeah. Hello, Captain. Matt? Go ahead, Lieutenant. 21st Precinct, Lieutenant Snyder. Captain, as many times as you've been in my store and as many times yeah. as I've been here. Hold on, CBR. I never thought anything like this would happen to me. Never. Well, I don't think any of us did. I shouldn't have done it, I admit. I know I shouldn't have done it. But things... Pile up inside of you. They pile up so you, you've got to do something. Give me a minute, man. Okay. You don't move around, Mr. Brighter. I have to stand right there. Sorry. Jamie! Jamie, come back here! I want to see him! Jamie. You were supposed to keep her in there, Wood. You ran up, Captain. I'm sorry. Jamie. I, I know what I did to you. I'm sorry. Please don't hate me. I want to. No, I should. I don't think I can. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. I don't know why you're so kind to me. I don't deserve it. Well, Mr. Brighter, a lot of people get what they don't deserve. First Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. A verification of ownership is what we want. Connecticut registration 3T152. And what do you have to do? Tell a type to Hartford or someplace? Or what's the delay? We've got the and delay. so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters, 
Featured in tonight's cast were Elspeth Eric, Lola Parzer, Bill Lipton, Santos Ortega, and P.J. Sidney. Written and directed by Stanley Niss. Art Hanna speaking. Hanna speaking. Hanna speaking. Hanna speaking. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. A verification of the ownership is what we want. Connecticut Registration 3, T for Thomas, 152. Well, what do you have? Tell you are by not. transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. We're holding the car and the occupants. Well, let me know as soon as you're here. All right. Okay. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a bright, sunny morning. I arrived at the station house at 7.35, signed the blotter, and went into my office to change the uniform. Then I read over reports and communications that had accumulated since I was last on duty 24 hours earlier. Just before 8, I walked out into the muster room and around behind the desk. Sharply on the hour, Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer for the oncoming tour, sounded the bell, and the 66 men who would patrol the precinct on foot and in sector cars marched out of the back room on command of the patrol sergeant. The platoon halted, faced the desk, and the sergeant reported the men inspected. Then I called the roll, gave them special instructions and orders, and on the command, post your platoon, they marched out the front door. Among the men who turned out was patrolman Joseph A. Hearn, 27 years old, in the job four years, and assigned until 9 a.m. to school crossing duty at 81st Street and 2nd Avenue. There, he directed traffic and assisted school children in crossing the street for nearly an hour. He was just about to leave for his regular post when he saw a car approaching the intersection driving east on 81st Street from 3rd Avenue, the wrong way in a one-way street. He stepped out into the street, waited for the car to approach, and signaled it to a stop. A man was driving. A woman sat alongside of him. I'm sorry, officer. Don't you look at the sign? I live in Brooklyn. I got a little bit mixed up. I didn't notice it was one way to lots of turned in. Yeah, I saw the traffic going the other way, and I said, uh-oh. Then I figured rather than back out into 3rd Avenue, it would be safer to come all the way through to 2nd. You know what I mean, officer? Much safer. Yeah, yeah, sure, I know. I'm sorry. I'm not familiar with the neighborhood. I'll be careful. Pull around the corner and stop. You're blocking traffic here. Look, officer, what do you say? How about a break, well, huh? just, just pull around the corner. I'll walk over there. That bum. That's his fault. If you look where you're going, these things wouldn't happen. Wait a minute. Wait for the light. Want to make it worse? I could shoot down the avenue and lose them in a minute. Are you out of your mind? Send your ticket. You run, they got you good. Take the ticket and shut up. Myra, I'm carrying. You're kidding. It's in my top coat pocket. Take the gun and put it in your purse. What do I want with that? Take it. It won't bother you. All right. Go ahead, it's green. Got it? I got it. I don't know why. Good, good, baby. All right, let me see your operator's license and registration. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, Myra, look in the glove compartment there for the registration. Yeah. You could be a good guy, couldn't you, officer? It's not like I did something. Yeah, yeah, here's the license. Yeah. Myra, where's the registration? Come on, huh? I can't find it in here. Well, you said it was in there. Does this car belong to you? Uh, as a matter of fact, it don't belong to my brother. Oh. What's your brother's name? Arthur Hope. Where does he live? In uh, Ellison, Connecticut. Huh? Where's that? It's uh, up near Bridgeport. Oh. You used to live at this address? 736 Partridge Street, Brooklyn? Yep, that's right. When did your brother lend you the car? Uh, Sunday. 
Sunday, when we were up there to his house. Isn't that right, Mara? Sunday? Yeah, my husband needed a car this week for business, and his brother let him have it. Mm-hmm. He told me the registration was in the glove compartment. Weren't you there when he said that, Mara? Yeah, sure, that's where he said it was. Did you look good? It's not in there. All right, give me the ignition keys a minute. What for? I want to check the license plate in the back. No, he's the keys for that, do you? Oh, just give him here. Okay. I'll just sit there. We should have run for it, I told you. Now, look. Give me back the gun. What do you want with it? Give it here. He's coming, he's coming. Well, I'm sorry, folks, but we're going to have to get down to the station house. Oh, now, look, officer, why? Well, we have to get straightened out on the ownership of this car. Well, it's my brother's. I told you that. Oh, yeah? Well, we'll just have to make sure. Oh, uh, pull the seat up. I'll get him back. What'd you say? Pull the seat back. Oh, okay. I wish we could get this straightened out. But we will. Through the keys. Yeah. Now close the door. Head the way you're going. I'll tell you when it's time. Can't you just give me a ticket and let it go at that? I'd like to save the time. You've already lost it, mister, so just get this thing going before you lose any more. Okay. For most traffic offenses, the law specifies that a police officer in the city of New York shall issue a summons answerable in traffic court on a specific day. For the offense of operating a motor vehicle without possession of proof of ownership, however, the driver is requested to accompany the officer to the station house where a check is made to verify ownership of the automobile. Officers confronted with such a situation are under instructions to be extremely cautious because the car may turn out to be stolen or the occupants armed and dangerous. The ride to the station house was without incident until they turned into the block on patrolman A. Hearn's instructions. All right, you, uh, you see the station house up there? Yeah. Pull up in front of it. Okay. Here, park in that space. It says reserved for police. You won't get a ticket for parking there, too, will you? Pull in. Okay. Am I close enough? You're right on the curb. All right, let me get out first. Scoot up a little bit, my aunt. How much do you want me to scoot? It's all right, I can make it. Guess I better lock it up, huh? Yeah, yeah, you better. Okay, this way. How long have we been here? I couldn't tell you, lady. Well, come on, Ed. Yeah, I'm coming. Lock it up, yeah. All right, it's locked. All right. Next time you'll know to get the registration. So I'll know. Get the door. Go ahead. Okay. Walk up to the desk, then. This is going to kill the whole morning. I know it. Why are you placing Sally Walker? All right, this is good right here. No, what have you got, eh, hon? Lieutenant, I told him going down. Uh, hold it. All right, Sergeant. Okay, go ahead. Hello, this is Lieutenant Gorman, desk officer at the 21st. Listen, the patrolman on post reports a leaking fire hydrant at 93rd Street and Madison Avenue. Yeah, that's what he said. All right, okay. Yeah, he says he thinks there's something wrong with the shutoff now. Okay. Yeah. Well, Sergeant, when Meister rings in, tell him the WSG is on the way up to repair that. Yes, sir. Okay, Aaron. I stopped him for driving the wrong way in East 81st Street, Lieutenant. He had no registration for the car. It's my brother's car. He let me borrow it. Did he have an operator's license? Yes, sir. His name is uh, Edward Holt, 736 Partridge Street, Brooklyn. His brother lent him the car. I'll box for that, all right. Are you Mrs. Holt? That's right. What is your brother's name? Arthur. Arthur Holt. And what is his address? Rural Route 2, Ellison, Connecticut. Connecticut registration, I think? Yes, sir. 1952 Chevrolet two-door painted tan. Day it is. Registration number is 3T152. T for Thomas? Yes, sir. All right. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Communications Bureau on here. Yes. Hello, CB. Lieutenant Gorman at the 21st. Yeah. Now, look, we've got a man operating a motor vehicle with no registration certificate. His name is Edward Holtz, 736 Partridge Street, Brooklyn. That's H-O-U-L-T-S. 
Yeah. He claims his brother is the owner of the automobile, and he is using it with the brother's permission. The brother's name is Arthur Holt. Rural Road 2. Elliston, Connecticut. Elliston. Yeah, that's right. The car is a 1952 Chevy two-door, painted tan. Connecticut registration 3, T for Thomas, 152. All right. Yeah. All right, Mr. Holtz, they're checking it out. Well, how long will it take? Well, they have to telepath to the Connecticut State Police and wait for an answer. We might be here a couple of hours. I don't think it'll take that long. This is a fine thing, holding us up like this. I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, All right. right. Walk right straight up there. Oh, I heard the detectives are going to book a prisoner. Now, would you take these people over there, please? Yeah. Right, Joe, let's go. You haven't got all day. I got plenty of time. Let's go right over there, Mr. Holtz. Right up to the railway, Joe. He gets there, but we got to wait. He's going to jail. Listen, officer, how long do you think this will take? Really, now, I mean, don't kid me. As soon as they're here back from Connecticut. I don't see what they got to do up there. They to verify ownership of the car. That's my brother's, I'm telling you. We'll get the word soon. Then what do I have to do? Well, you'll have to appear in court later. I've got to write a summons for driving without a registration for you and going the wrong way in a one-way street. I forgot about that one already. All right. Yes, Sergeant? Can I see you over here a minute? Yes, sir. Well, you two stay right here. We've got no place to go. Be back in a second. Oh, this is some mess. Listen, never mind the mess. I'm getting worried. Why should you be worried? I'm the one who has it in my pocketbook. I'm getting worried because of all these cops around here looking at us. They're liable to start asking questions about other things in that car. I think you ought to get rid of the gun. Get rid of it? Mm. When are we going to get rid of it? Go to the ladies' room. Put it in the wastebasket in the bottom. You out of your mind. You gotta get rid of it. Listen, you gave it to me. I All right. All right. All right. Oh. Uh, are you people being taken care of, all right? Oh, yeah. Thanks. We're uh, waiting until they check on something. You know. Oh, I see. I brought them in, Captain. Mr. and Mrs. Holt. Captain Kennelly. Hi. How do you do? We got no complaint against this policeman, Captain. He was only doing what he was supposed to do, but. I told him it was my brother's car, and we got to wait around. we got to wait around for who knows how long. He was driving the wrong way in 81st Street, and he had no ownership certificate. His brother said he left it in the glove compartment when he let him the car. Well, uh, what's taking so long, huh? It's a Connecticut car, Captain. Oh. Listen, where's the ladies' room here? Well, there isn't any ladies' room in the station house. There isn't? No, not in this station house. Oh, come on, you're kidding. Well, all our female prisoners go to the 19th precinct where the police women are. We have no facilities here. Uh, hey. Yes, sir? Bring those people back over here now. Yes, sir. Okay, folks. Hey, here we go again. Oh, what's doing, Red? Oh, it's pretty quiet, Captain. Let's hope it stays that way. Oh. I'd sure like to know what kind of a runaround I'm getting here. Oh, what do you mean? I asked him if I could go outside to get a cup of coffee, and he said, no, I couldn't. I was the one that was driving the car. She didn't have anything to do with it. Why can't she go out? Because if that car turns out to be stolen, the law says that not only the driver is involved, every occupant is. The car is not stolen. It belongs to my brother. Mr. Holtz, right now we don't know that your brother owns the car. In fact, we don't even know that you have a brother. Inspector car number three came by the house for me, and I went out on patrol of the precinct at 9.25 a.m. Twenty minutes later, however, the communications bureau instructed the desk officer of the 21st to assign temporarily to the 15th precinct one radio motor patrol car and its crew to assist in an unusual occurrence, the breaking of a water main and the flooding of the street and the subway station. In order that we not be left undermanned on patrol... I returned to the station house and instructed Patrolman Farrell, the operator of sector car number three, to pick up his recorder, Patrolman Meister, who had been assigned to a fixed post, and resume patrol of his regular sector. I got out of the car in front of the station house, crossed the sidewalk, walked up the stone steps, and into the muster room. Uh, Captain. Yes? This is for you, Lieutenant King. Oh, all right. Tell him to hold on. As soon as I sign the blotter. Yes, sir. He just came in the station house, Lieutenant. He'll be with you as soon as he signs the blotter. No, he's got nobody with him. 
Okay, Sergeant. I'll take it in my office. Yes, sir. He's going to take it in his office, Lieutenant. I want to talk to the captain. That's what's the trouble. The captain can't help you, Mr. Holtz. Well, I can ask him. All right, I'll be with you in a minute. I've got a phone call waiting. I'm waiting, too. On the first precinct, Captain Canelli. Lieutenant King, Captain. Yes, Matt. Captain, do you remember that boy who tried to cut his wrist on the bar in the cell last December? Yes, Matt. What about him? Well, he's going to bat on that murder charge next week. The district attorney thinks his lawyer might call you as a defense witness. Oh, what do they want me for? Well, you made the investigation at the time. They think they can establish insanity by reason of the fact that he attempted suicide. Oh? I'm going downtown for a conference with a trial assistant this afternoon. All right, Matt. What time? Well, I'm due down there at 1. I'll leave here about 12.30. Okay, you meet me in my office. Yes, ma'am. Thanks. That's okay. There he comes. All right, now what's the trouble? We're just waiting for word, Captain. That's right. We're getting awful tired of standing around here. Well, all right, I'll see what I can do. We'd certainly appreciate it. You know, it's one thing if I did something really out of the ordinary, but it's my brother's car and my wife is willing to vouch for that. Yes, we know all about that, Mr. Holtz, but it takes time to check these things out. Well, we've been here for time. We've been here for plenty of time. All right, I'll see what I can do. Well, we'd certainly appreciate it, Captain. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Hey, Red, uh, how come you haven't heard on that Connecticut car yet? Well, we're waiting, Captain. Well, we're short-handed on patrol this tour. I'd like to get Ahern back on the job. So would I, Captain. I just rang down to CB. They haven't had any word from the Connecticut State Police yet. Well, why don't you send them upstairs and let the detectives worry about it? Okay. Uh, Ahern. Yes, sir? Would you come over here with Mr. and Mrs. Holtz? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, how are they doing on that break in the water main downtown? You think we'll get our car back soon? Well, they've got the trouble located. It's a problem of traffic now, Captain. Oh, good. Are we going to be able to go now? Well, we haven't had any word yet, Mrs. Holt. Listen, do you know how long it's been? Do you know how long we've been waiting around here? We're trying to get you out as fast as we well, can. Well, it certainly doesn't look like it. That's all I can say. Well, we're going to send you up to the detectives and let them get it straightened out. The detectives? Mm-hmm. Well, what have they got to do with it? Listen, Captain, I'm a guy with a lot of patience, but after all, we've been hanging around here almost an hour. And now with the detectives, all I ask you to do is be reasonable. Yeah, well, all we ask you to do is comply with the law and have a registration certificate with you when you operate an automobile. Who's casting upstairs, Sergeant? The local lieutenant. Uh, There's a fine way to do things. I'll be in my office, right? Yes, sir. Can't go out to get a cup of coffee. Can't powder my nose. Sergeant, give me the look on here. Yes, sir. I think we did something. All right, my all right. Hello, lad. This is Lieutenant Gorman. Yeah. Look, I'm sending a hern up with a couple. Well, we're waiting for verification of ownership of the car he was driving. Hmm? Oh, all right. Yeah, I'll hold on. A hern. Yes, sir. Go on upstairs with him and uh, see the look at him. Okay, Lieutenant. Come on. Come the post. You know what I mean? I don't know. Yeah, what what I mean. Okay. All right, through there. The name is Holt. Yeah, well, look at this. Why couldn't we stay in here if they're standing out there? This is the back room. It's the police officers. Are they better than people? Up the stairs. Hey! Hmm? Wait a minute. What's the matter? I don't have enough. Now i got to get a run in my stock. Well, that's my fault, too. Here. Hold my pocketbook. What do I want it? Hold it. All right. I felt it real. Ah, you're always feeling things. You got a wife like that? No, I'm not married. Smart. What kind of crack is that? Let's, uh, let's go upstairs. Here, yeah, take back your purse. Will it kill you to hold it a minute? It might. You never can tell. Here. Yeah. All right. In there. I think this will take very long. It all depends when we hear about the car. told me about them. Now, look, folks, I'm going to make another call down to the communications bureau and see if they have from Connecticut yet. Wouldn't the best thing be to call Connecticut? Well, everything has to be cleared through CB. Now, I want to finish this thing up, and I'll get right on it. Now, why don't you go over and sit down on that bench for a minute? Over there? Yeah, make yourself comfortable. Oh, you want me to get some coffee? 
He'll call lunch in this for you. He'll send it over. No, that's all right. I don't feel like it now. The fact of the matter is, she does feel like it. Only she doesn't like coffee out of a paper cup. Look, why don't you be a good guy and let her go out to the luncheonette? Like I told you about that, we can't let either of you go out until we get an answer on the car. Sit down, Eddie. There's no sense standing up anymore. Yeah. What a way to run a railroad. All right, I'm going to see you a minute. Yeah. We'll be right back. We're not going any place. We'll be here. Now, now, give me what you got on these people. I'll get right on it. Yeah. He was coming down a one-way street. So why didn't you take it when you had my purse? Think what? What do you think? Oh, do you think I'm crazy? You don't understand anything in here. I couldn't take two steps. Oh, I'm stuck with it. You're not stuck with it. What do you mean I'm not stuck with it? I got it. I'm the one that got the beef again. There won't be no beef because they ain't going to find it. They won't look. We can read their minds. Now, what's all the conversation over there? Look, we're married to each other. Aren't we allowed to talk even? Well, as long as I can hear what you're saying, can you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everything is personal. Concentration, Chance. There's nothing personal in a police station, lady. Can I see your operator's license, Mr. Holt? They looked at it downstairs. Well, I'd like to look at it up here. Here. Here you are. Would you take it out of the wallet? Honest. Oh, uh, there. Mm-hmm. Is this where you reside at the present time? 736 Patrick Street, Brooklyn? Yes. You ever been arrested, Mr. Holt? Yeah, I went through a red light about a year ago out in Forest Hills. It says that in the license there, don't it? Not I mean for a crime. No, what do you think I am? Do you have any other identification besides this? How about this, my social security card? Want me to take that out, too? No, I can see it, all right. Do you have any identification on you, Mrs. Holt? Look, she's my wife. I identify her. I'd like to identify I'd like her to identify herself. Do you have anything in your purse? Like what? Like a driver's license. I don't drive. Social security card, anything? No, I got nothing. Well, couldn't you look and see? I know I got nothing. I know what I carry in my purse. I carry a little bit of money and a lipstick and a handkerchief. Also a comb and a compact, and that's all. Well, why don't you take a look? Maybe you've got a letter or something in there. I know what I've got. I've got nothing. But she told you she's got no identification. Why don't you leave her alone? She's got nothing to do with it anyway. I was driving the car. Well, that doesn't make any difference. Want me to get that lunch? No, I'll take it. Okay. 21st Squad, Detective DeLuca. No, no, he's not here. Yeah, he's working, but he's out on an investigation. Yeah, yeah, sure. Who? Yeah, yeah, all right, I'll tell him. Yeah, I'll tell him. Are you sure you've got no identification? I told you I didn't. Well, DeLuca... Oh, yeah, Lieutenant. Where's Goldman? Down at the grand jury, Lieutenant. Oh, yeah. Did this ring in yet? No, it's not yet. First one that rings in or comes in, let me know. We've got a little job to be done. Well, Scanlon and Vitaly are out on patrol. Shall I put a call out for them? No, it's not that important. How do you do? Oh, this is Mr. and Mrs. Holt, Lieutenant King, commanding officer of 21st Detective Squad. I heard not stopped them for driving the wrong way in a one-way street, Lieutenant. They had no registration for the car. Is it your car? No, it's my brother's. He lent it to me. We're getting some run around here, Lieutenant. They're taking forever to find out about it, and we've just been sitting around. Well, it'll get straightened out. I know it will, but when? That's the point. Now, look, Mr. Holtz, why don't you stop complaining, eh? You were the one who was at fault. We're doing the best we can. I'll bet you are. Ed. I'm sitting here like an idiot. Nobody does anything. Ed, now cut it out. I won't cut it out. i got a right to talk. Look, mister, you better take your wife's advice and just calm down. The law gets straightened out. Listen, look. Lo- uh, what's the use? Okay, lad. Let me know when you hear from somebody. Yes, sir. You ought to take it easy, mister. That's not going to get you any place. That's what I said. I'm not. Everybody tells me to take it easy. I'll get it on. Okay. I'll be right back. Yeah. What's the matter with you? Nothing. 21st squad. You're just making room. big trouble for yourself. That's all you're yeah. doing. Mm-hmm. It's all your own fault anyway. Don't lecture me, will you, my Don't lecture you. That's what I said. You get yourself in the jam and give me a hard time. Okay, folks. Hmm? We got the word. Everything's all right. You got the word. Yeah. The Communications Bureau got a teletype. The Connecticut State Police spoke to your brother at his job. He confirms he lent you the car. Yeah, you see? What did I tell you? Well, we can go on downstairs now. What, well, you mean we got something else to... Oh, come on, Ed, for crying out loud. Oh, for crying out loud, me, will you? You for crying out loud me enough today. I didn't, but you had to come. Okay, oh, okay. You have plenty coming. You got a 
Sergeant Waters. Now, where is this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, who is it that's hurt? Oh, you don't, huh? Well, where's the man with the knife? Where? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed, the factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Frank Moss, Elspeth Eric, John Larkin, Mandel Kramer, and John Sylvester. Written and directed by Stanley Ness. George Bryan speaking. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. No, CB, no word on it yet. Well, we got men out searching the whole area. Yeah, we located the cab driver. 
The detectives are talking to him now. That's right. You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, CB. I'll let you know as soon as anything happens. Yeah, right away. Okay. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their prisons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a bright, sunny Saturday, and for the first time of the year, people from all over the city flocked to the zoo, the mall, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and other attractions in Central Park. By 2 p.m., the traffic on Fifth Avenue was jammed. I went over to Fifth Avenue in sector car number four for a first-hand look at the condition. A half hour later, I instructed the operator, Patrolman Jacoby, to return to the station house. As we were driving there, in East 78th Street, I saw the sergeant's car double parked at the entrance to a large modern apartment house. The operator was sitting at the wheel. I instructed Patrolman Jacoby to pull up behind it. All right, wait here. Captain? Well, what's the trouble, Coley? I don't know exactly, Captain. We rang in from there on Madison Avenue and 76th Street. Lieutenant Gorman told Sergeant Waters to come on over here and talk to a Dr. Wheel. That's his office there on the ground floor. You see the sign, Captain? Yeah. What's it all about? This kid got lost. Well, how old a kid? I don't know exactly, Captain. All right, I'll go in and see what it's all about. Yes, sir. I'm Captain Kennelly. Is uh, Sergeant Waters in there with Dr. Wheel? Uh, yes, he is. I'd like to go in and see them. Well, Dr. Wheel said that... All right, Captain Conlon. Kennelly. Oh, yes. I'll ring him. <laughs> you don't think anything's happened to her, do you? It's been nearly two hours now. In two hours. Doctor, there's another policeman here. Yeah. Captain Kennelly. All right. Yes, Doctor. Yes, sir. Would you go right into the consultation room, Captain? It's right through that door. Yeah, thank you. Mrs. Douglas, would you like a glass of water? Come in, Captain. Hello, Captain. Sergeant? This is Dr. Will, Captain Kennelly. Doctor? Glad to know you, Captain. His child's missing, Captain. Six-year-old girl. Doctor put her in a cab to go home. Uh, Miss Wallace, my nurse, did. I told you that. And she never got home? No, sir. We didn't know anything was wrong, but she didn't get there until my wife telephoned. What time was she put into the cab? About a quarter after one. And where was the cab supposed to take her, Doctor? 290 East 68th Street. That's not a five-minute ride from here. It's been nearly an hour and a half since she left. What was your daughter's name, Doctor? Sarah. And uh, exactly how old is she? Six. She'll be seven in August. In a cab or not, Doctor, that's a little young to let a child travel alone. Well, I know it is, but I couldn't help it, Captain. The nurse took the hack's registration on it, Captain. Well, that's something. You see, my wife and I have been separated a couple of months. Oh? Yes, I've been taking Sarah on Saturday afternoons and Sundays. But today I had a patient in the hospital, an emergency. You see, Captain, I usually finish with my office hours at noon, and my wife drops Sarah by here. But today I didn't get back to the office until nearly noon, and there were a couple of patients waiting for me. And it so happened that one of her friends had a birthday party this afternoon, and I promised to have her home by 1.30 so she could get dressed and go. I couldn't take her myself, and 
Well, I didn't see any harm in putting her in a cab. It's done every day. Well, Doctor, looks like you picked the wrong day. Well, my nurse took the license number. You can find the cab, can't you? Yes, we can find it. But the important thing is to find the child, not the cab. How did your nurse get the cab? Just flag it down on the street? Well, I imagine so. You'll have to ask, Miss Wallace. I was in here busy with a patient. What can we do to find her, Captain? I'm really worried now. Your daughter is six years old. She knows her full name, her address, and telephone number, doesn't she? Yes, of course she does. She's quite a bright child. All right. We'll get the detectives over here right away, Doctor. Good. I sure appreciate you going out of your way like this. We're not going out of our way. When a child of that age is missing, it's standard procedure to get everybody on the job and keep them there. Well, that's fine. Now, Doctor, when you spoke to your wife, did she make any effort around the building there to see if the girl had arrived? Yes, she went down and talked to the doorman. He hadn't seen her. Neither had the elevator operator. And does your daughter have any playmates in the building? Maybe she went into another apartment. Well, it's just one little girl she sees. My wife called there. They're away for the weekend, the whole family. How did you get this information? Did your wife call you back? Yes. That's why it took me a little while before I phoned the police. I was waiting for her to call back. Uh, Oh, excuse me. Yeah, sure. Yes? Did you uh, notify the desk officer yet, Sergeant? No, sir. I just got here a couple of minutes Uh, before you did. uh, Would you tell her I'll only be a few minutes more, Miss Wallace? Thank you. Oh, if there's any word, you let me know immediately. All right. I have one patient still waiting, Captain. I'd send her home, but she has rather an acute throat condition. I think I ought to see her. All right, you go ahead. We'll talk to your nurse in the meantime. Oh, that'll be fine. This won't take me more than a few minutes. And then maybe I ought to go to my wife's apartment. I can look around the neighborhood. We'll look around the neighborhood, Doctor, but you'll have to stay here and talk to the detectives. Well, why here? She's not around here. Well, that's the way we work in these cases. The search has started from the place the child was last seen. Oh, I see. All right, Miss Wallace. Uh, ask Mrs. Douglas to come in, please. It won't take me long. Mrs. Douglas. Well, that's all right. We have to make a few phone calls anyway, Doctor. You go right in, Mrs. Douglas. I'm sorry, Mrs. Douglas, that you have to wait. Do you think you'll be able to find her soon? As soon as we can. I took down the license number of the cab, you know. Yeah, I know. The doctor gave it to me. What kind of a cab was it? Do you remember, Miss Wallace? Well, it was a blue and yellow one. Was it one of the large ones or one of the new smaller ones? It was a large one. You better ring in, Sergeant. Get the detectives over here. Yes, sir. Uh, Can I use it? Yes, of course. Thank you. I told the driver the address. And I also had it written down on a slip of paper for him. I, I gave him the slip of paper. Hello, this is Sergeant Waters. Let me talk to Lieutenant Gorman. He looked all right. Okay. He said he'd take good care of her. Hello, Lieutenant. Sergeant Waters. I'm this girl missing over here. It's a child under the age of seven. The name is Sarah Weald. W-E-A-L-D. Uh, let's uh, step over here, Miss Wallace. All right. Yeah, the father's a doctor. Yes. You don't suspect the cab driver of anything. I, I mean, he looked all right to me. Well, we'll find him and see. How long have the uh, doctor and Mrs. Wheel been separated? I don't know. A couple of months. Nearly three, I suppose. Uh-huh. Do you know the reason for their difficulty? No. Well, now, you must have some idea. Well, I knew they hadn't been getting along very well. What was it? Another woman or money or what? I'll tell you the truth, I think they just got plain tired of each other. I hate to use the word, but bored. He spent all his time working. When he wasn't here, he was at the hospital. She's a bridge player. She doesn't care for medicine, and he doesn't care for bridge. I guess that's the answer. How long have they been married, do you know? About ten years, I guess, just after he got out of the army. And uh, how long have you been working for him, Miss Wallace? Not quite a year. I see. The separation had nothing to do with me, if that's what you're thinking. I married myself and very happily. I just continued to use my maiden name professionally. Where is the doctor living now? Oh, he has a small apartment in this building, upstairs. I don't know why you're asking me all these questions for, Captain. It would seem to me that you'd do a lot better if you go out and look for Sarah. Well, sometimes the answers to questions give us a good idea where to look. Okay, Captain. Lieutenant Gorman has notified the detectives and CB. All right. They're putting out a teletype right away, and the detective will be on the job here in a few minutes. Good. Uh, would you go outside, Sergeant, and see Jacoby? Yes, sir. 
Tell him to pick up his partner and resume patrol. Okay, Captain. Right away. I'm sorry, Captain. I'm just a little upset. Yes, well, that's all right. I understand. I don't know what you can do, where you can start. We've started already, Miss Wallace. A teletype alarm has gone out to all the 81 precincts in the city. One of them might be holding Sarah and not know who she is. By now, probably a radio broadcast has gone out, too, to all cars on patrol. Well, that ought to do something. And all the men on foot patrol between here and the residence will be given her description when they ring in. What about the cab driver? Well, we'll find out who he is through the registration number. We'll get him up here. I don't know why I took the number of the cab. I didn't have any premonition or anything like that. I just felt it would be a good idea because he's so young. Yes, well, it turned out to be. What time did uh, Sarah get here? It was about noon. Mrs. Wheeler had been leaving her here every Saturday at noon. And Sarah and the doctor would spend the rest of the day together. Oh, there's Mrs. Wheeler. All right, you let me do the talking. Have you found her yet? No, not yet, Mrs. Wheeler. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Captain Kennelly. We're just getting a start, Mrs. Wheeler. Well, I didn't know what to do around the apartment. I, I had to come here and, and find out something. Well, there's nothing to find out yet. Is there uh, someone at home in case Sarah's brought home? Yes, the maid's there. I, I don't understand it. I don't know where he could have taken her. Well, first of all, we've got to presume the cab driver let her out where he was told to, at your apartment. Well, I talked to the doorman and the elevator operator, and they didn't see any either of them. Is there any place in the building she might have gone besides this uh, one playmate's box? No, no, no place that I know of. Well, could she have gone into any of the stores in the block or around the corner? Well, when I came down, I did ask in a couple of them. I, I went into the drugstore. I take her there for ice cream, and they hadn't seen her. And she, well, she's a very sensible little girl. She wouldn't wander off. She, well, she shows a lot of responsibility for six years old. She wouldn't do anything like that on her own. I'm sure it's the cab driver. You shouldn't have put her in a cab alone. That's the one thing you shouldn't have done. We've done it before, Mrs. Well, you shouldn't have done it this time. Where's the doctor? He's in with a patient. A patient? How can you take care of a patient now? Why isn't he out looking for Sarah? He should be out combing the street. Now, Mrs. Wheel, that'll all be taken care of. The patients come first. Everybody's troubles except his own. This woman has a very bad cough, Mrs. Wheel. He's trying to help her. My child is missing. Why doesn't he try to help me? Why doesn't he even try to help himself? That's what I don't understand. Miss Wallace. George. Yes, Doctor. Uh, would you go inside, please? Have you done anything to find this? Just a minute, Gloria. Just a minute? I want you to take the hemoglobin and the differential on Mrs. Douglas. Yes, Doctor, I will right away. Now, listen, George. Have you heard anything, Captain? No, not yet, Doctor. Now, this is a fine way to carry out your responsibilities. Who ever heard of sending a six-year-old child home alone in a cab? All right, Gloria. But you ought to be ashamed of yourself, absolutely ashamed of yourself. Now, please. Heaven only knows where your child is. And you do nothing but take care of some, some patient, a stranger. All right, Gloria. The police are here. They're going to do everything they can. They'll find her. She never should have been lost. That may be so, Mrs. Wheels, but she is. Let's find her. You are listening to 21st Precinct, the factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Precinct will take a brief vacation and on its return will be heard on a different day and at a different time. Please listen for details at the conclusion of tonight's show. Now, back to 21st Precinct and Captain Frank Kennelly. There are few occurrences which are handled with more urgency than the report of a missing child. The action to be taken is described in great detail in the Manual of Procedure and Rule 316. With or without suspicion of a crime being involved, the desk officer is obliged to refer the report to the precinct detective squad commander for immediate investigation. Then, as required in no other case, the desk officer must personally and forthwith notify the detective commander at borough headquarters, the immediate superior of the precinct squad commander. Assistance in the form of men, radio motor patrol cars, police launches, emergency service trucks and cars, and the facilities of any other department of the city are required to be made available forthwith on request of the detective commander in charge. All superior officers of the patrol force concerned must cooperate with the detective commander and render any assistance requested. In the case at hand, Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, arrived at the doctor's office within five minutes after he was notified. Under his direction, a complete search of the area was organized with both uniformed officers and detectives participating. At 20 minutes to four, he was in the waiting room talking to the mother as I listened. 
The doctor was out in a cruiser with detectives scouring the district. Mrs. Weald, I want you to think a minute and see if there's any other place. Any other place in the neighborhood Sarah might have gone. No, there's no place else. No place I haven't thought of. Did she ever roam around on the streets alone? No, I, I told you I didn't permit that. Well, uh, was there any place else besides that one spot in the park that you took her to play? No, just there and school, that's all. And the only relative you have in town is this one brother. Yes, that's Hello? right. Does the doctor have any family? Yes, yes, he does. But as I told you, they all live over in Jersey. Well, she wouldn't know how to get there. She wouldn't even know their addresses. Uh, how about some of her schoolmates? Does she ever visit them? Yes, she does on occasion. Yes. Well, now, this was a school friend whose birthday party she was supposed to attend this afternoon. But actually, she wouldn't know how to get there by herself. She's only six. Did, did you check that place again? She just may have gone there. I don't know how she would have gotten there. I had a detective stop by there. They promised to call us if Sarah did show up. Well, Mrs. Miller would call. She, she's very dependable. Lieutenant King. Yes, Sergeant. That was the desk officer. Yeah. They located the hacky in the 18th. Oh, d- does he know where Sarah is? No, apparently not, Mrs. Wheel. Oh. An RMP car in the 18th set the alarm over the air and saw the cab making a turn into Broadway. This cab was empty. They rang in and were instructed to bring him to this address. And that's all they said? Nothing else? Well, we'll talk to the driver himself in a few minutes, Mrs. Will. Well, he certainly could have found out more from him. We'll find out all he knows. Well, I certainly hope you do. I suppose there's my husband. George! George, did you find her, George? No, we didn't. What did you look? Gloria, these detectives drove me through every street within here in ten blocks of the apartment. We didn't see any sign of her. What did you look? What do you mean? Did I look? Of course I looked. George, if this is some trick to get it's her away not from a me. Trick. If it is, I'm gonna kill you. I swear I'm gonna kill no, you. No, no, I'm You're not gonna weird. do it, George. You're not gonna do it to me. Now, please. She's lost, Gloria. I wanna find her. I wanna find her as much as you I'll do. I'll believe that when you prove it to me. Now look, we're not going to get any place if you two are fighting with each other. Now, he's right, Gloria. Now please. I'll believe it when I see it. Yes, sir. When I see it. Go outside and wait for that hack driver. Bring him right in here when he comes. Yeah, Lieutenant. Right away. Everybody's standing around here. Nobody seems to be doing anything. Why doesn't somebody do something and look for us? You want to know what's being done, Mrs. Wheel? I'd just like to see some results. Your husband was riding around that neighborhood with a couple of detectives. We brought in men from other precincts and from the emergency service division. We have detectives from other squads and from the borough headquarters. We're going into every building over there. We're searching the halls and the basements and the roofs. We're looking every place. Well, we'll know more as soon as we talk to that cab driver. He's going to lie to you, don't you know that? Now, Mrs. Wheel. He's going to lie to you. Well, Gloria, why don't you come inside and lie down on the couch? I want to be right here. I want to know what's going on. Well, as soon as we know anything, you will. Now, come on inside. I'll give you something to relax. Oh, no, you won't. Gloria, please. Yes, I uh, I think it's a good idea, Mrs. Wheel. Why don't you go in and lie down? I promise I'll let you know as soon as we do hear something. You really promise? Yes, I do. Well, I, I ought to try and relax a little bit. Yes, you should. But you're not going to give me anything. All right, I won't try to give you anything. Well, don't blame her too much, man. It isn't easy. Nothing. Captain. Yes, Miss Wallace. I understand you've located the cab driver. Yes, we have. That's good. You're positive you can recognize him? Well, I'm not positive, but I think I can. Hasn't it been an awfully long time? I mean, somebody would have found her by now, a policeman or just an ordinary person. They'd have seen her and known something was the matter, that she was lost. All right. Go right in. Oh, that's him. That's the cab driver. Okay. Step right over here. Yeah, sure. This is the cab driver, Albert Sprizio. Captain Kennelly? Hi. How do you do? Lieutenant King? Hello, Lieutenant. No. And this is Miss Wallace. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you were the lady that gave me the address where to go with the kid. Yes. Where did you take the child from here? Oh, where she said to take it. 290 East 68th Street, right? That's right. Well, that's where I took it. Yeah. I got my call card. I brought it in. See? See on there? From here to 290 East 68th. It's written down. 1.50 p.m., 65 cents in the clock. Let's go over there and sit down, Mr. Spriggo. Al, everybody calls me Al. Boy, I'm telling you, when that squad car came around after me and cut me into the curb... Uh, sit down. Yeah. I didn't know what was the matter. I mean, knew I didn't run no lights or anything like that. Right on Broadway there. And you know something? Those guys play it cagey. They won't tell me what it's all about for a minute. I got to squeeze it out of them. You say you took a little girl right to the address? Right to the address. Right to the door. 
somebody gives me a responsibility with a six-year-old, I take it serious. How did you know she was sick? Oh, she told me. Sarah, she said her name was, too. Uh, we got into a regular conversation. When you left here, how did you go? Uh, what do you mean, how did I go? My route? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, listen, do you mind if I smoke a cigar? No, go ahead. How about you? No, thanks. Uh, Captain? No. Okay. Here you go. Oh, much obliged. Now, which way did you go? Well, I, uh, I went straight over here to park... And I went down a park to 68 and over to 68 to the building there. Was there a doorman on the job when you got there? Nobody. You didn't see a doorman? Nobody. So what did you do? Oh, I I threw up the flag and I got out of the car and let the little girl out. Where did you go? Straight inside the building. Lady here said, watch her. So I watched her until she opened the door and went inside the building. You remember what that building was like? Yeah, sure. It's a new kind. It's that red brick and there's a blue canopy out front. Then what did you do? I got back in the car, and right away I got another job. Then another. I was busy all afternoon, midtown mostly. A lot of shoppers on Fifth Avenue. You married, Al? Oh, yeah. You got any children? Three. Two boys and a girl. My girl's about the same age as this kid. I was telling her I got a girl, too. Uh, Josie's my kid. You ever been arrested? Me? No, not even a traffic summons. I've been pushing a hack since I got home from the wars. Ten years, nearly, and I haven't gotten tagged once. But a record, huh? Boy, when my heart was down to here, when those cops curbed me, I could see my mark falling. Listen, uh, no kidding. Now, how serious is this? Uh, have you got any ideas what happened to the kid? No, we thought you could help us. You know me. If I could, I would. Al, uh, you were talking to her about your daughter? That's right. Uh -huh. What was the conversation? Well, I, uh, I asked this kid what grade she was in. She said first. And I said I got a girl in first grade, too. We got to talking about what my kid liked and what she liked. And out of a clear blue sky, she asked me, was I separated? Separated from what, I said. From the army, yeah, but from my wife, no. That all she said? No kid talk, you know. She wants to know if her mother and father are separated. Why can't she be separated, too? I said it ain't in the card. Kids don't get separated from their mother and father. I said, listen, you don't think she was serious that she wanted to get separated? They're crying out loud, those kids today. What else did she say? Nothing. Come to think of it, nothing. I got a red light and I pulled up. I turned around to look at her and she was sitting way back there on the seat. Thinking like, you know. She didn't say another word, that kid. So I pulled up in front of the building there. How do you like that? Captain, let's go in and talk to the parents. Yeah. Uh, you want me? No, you sit right here a minute. Uh, listen, if you don't think I'll be around here long, do you? i got to make a buck five months to see. I'll get you out as quick as we can, Al. I'd appreciate that. He's all right, Captain. Yeah. Sergeant Waters. Yes, sir? Stay on the job here. I'll be right out. Yes. Yes? Mrs. Wheel doesn't sleep, is she, Doctor? like to talk to the two of you. No, she's not asleep. Would you come in? Yeah, sure. Did you hear anything? Everyone knew? There's no news, Mrs. Weald, but the cab driver's here. Where? Oh, Gloria, you'd better rest. No, I don't want to rest. Where is he? I want to talk to him. Well, we've talked to him already, Mrs. Weald. Well, what did he say? He said he picked up Sarah in the cab there. He deposited her at the door over the apartment house. He walked in the front door. He's he sure it was our building? Yes, he's sure, and so am I. Is he telling the truth, Lieutenant? I take a bet on it. The doorman didn't see him. No, no. He, he told me himself that he didn't. The cab driver said the doorman wasn't on the job when he got there. Well, that's right. Oh, yes. He, he did say that he went down to the basement for a few minutes to get something for a tenant, but he was only gone a few minutes. Well, it must have been the right few minutes. And, and that's all you know? Nothing else? Oh, Gloria. Don't Gloria me. We, uh, we don't know where she went, but we might know why she went. Why? She wanted to get uh, separated, too. Sarah? That's what she told the cab driver. Well, now, where would a six-year-old get such ideas? That's ridiculous. Yes, it does sound kind of ridiculous, but uh, I guess we all know where she got the idea. Oh. Yes, I guess we do. Honest. Come in. Oh. Captain. Yes, what is it, Sergeant? The desk officer called. They got her down at the 17th Precinct Station house. <gasps> Oh, thank God. Is she all right? Yeah, she's fine. They found her roaming around on 57th Street. 
a patrolman on post. 57th Street? That's 13 blocks. What was she doing way down there? How did she get there? I guess she walked. Yeah, can we go? Can we go there right now? Yes, we can go. Oh, come on. George, will you come and see that she's all right? Yes, I'll come. She, she wanted to get separated, too. I, silly. Yes, it is, isn't it? But how are you going to convince her of that? Oh, uh, to lay right down on the squad car, man. Is it still here? Yeah, I think so. George. Yes. Well, is it silly to ask you to come home to dinner tonight? No. Just for Sarah's sake. All right. Uh, Sergeant, would you tell the tally to drive Dr. and Mrs. Wheel down to the 17th? Yes, sir. Are you ready, folks? Yes, yes, we're ready. Oh, goodbye. And thanks. Thanks a lot, Captain. It's oh, going all right. Well, where is it, 17th? Big afternoon for us, Captain. Yeah, but it may turn out to be bigger for them. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Now so where is this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, who is it? His wife. Hitting with what? Oh. All right. I'll send the officers right over there. So who are you? Oh, a tenant there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I see. On what floor? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry go round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. This is the last broadcast in the current series of 21st Precinct. The cast and production staff are going to take a brief vacation. Please watch your local newspapers and listen to your CBS radio station for word of our return to the air. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly. Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Lola Pizer, Jan Miner, Les Damon, and Frank Campanella. Written and directed by Stanley Ness. George Bryan speaking. 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 But not. The security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It was my first day back on the job following my annual vacation. After I returned from my meal, Patrolman Fallon, the 124 man, brought in to me all the reports and communications pertaining to matters which were still open. I began to read them over, and at 10.30 p.m., while I was still so engaged, 63 men were patrolling the streets of the precinct on foot and in sector cars. Among them was Patrolman Paul Cochran, whose post consisted of three blocks of tenements between 1st and 2nd Avenue in the 90s. He had just made his hourly ring into the station house from a call box on First Avenue and was headed through the block on another round of his post. Police! Hey, policeman! Yeah? Upstairs, upstairs in my house. Come on. What's the fellow, Pop? He threw me out. He threw me out of my own house. Uh, who? Him, the big one, George. Where is it, Pop? This building? Yeah. yeah he, he threw me out. Right out of my own flat. Locked the door. Now why? For my daughter. I got it. For my daughter, Angie. Go ahead. Comes around and scares us to death. He's so big. He's drunk all the time. Well, he scares us to death. How old is your daughter? A baby, a little baby. She's 15. All right, hold it here. Yeah. 
Where do you live? What floor? Second floor, second floor front. On this side? Yeah, yeah, he comes around drunk. He wants her to go out. And she don't want to go. He, he scares us to death. He's so big. Anybody else up there? No, just them. My, my wife is at work. I don't work. I can't. I'm sick. Yeah, all right, let's go. Yeah. He's so big. He's drunk. He scares us to death every time. She don't want anything to do with him, Nancy. But she's scared. We don't know what to do. I'll take care of him, Pop. He throws me right out of my house. Which is it, that one? Yeah. What is that, the kitchen there? Oh, uh, the kitchen, yeah. All right, Pop. You stay here, right behind me. She's a baby, and Yeah, I know. You stay here. This is the police. Open up. Open the door. Come on, get it open. All right. Thank you. Thank you, my baby. All right. Go on over with your father. Uh, take her in the other room, Pop. All right, baby. All right. All right. You two stay in there. What's the matter? What's the idea? What are you coming around bothering these people for? I'm not bothering anybody. You come up here drunk? Who's drunk? What's that? That's a bottle of wine I bought. You mean it was a bottle of wine? How old are you? Twenty-four. What's it to you? And why don't you stay away from 15-year-old girls? What I do is my business. Well, you made it mine. All right, come on, get up and walk around this side of the table. Suppose I don't want to. I don't want to have to come back there for you, George. Get up. You come back here for me, and you'll go away bleeding. See? Close that knife and put it on the table. A fat chance you got. Put that knife on the table. You use the stick, I'll use the knife. <laughs> we'll have a go. Put that knife on the table. Will you stop talking about the table? I'll give you the table. There you are, the table. Give me that. Get it away from me. Come here. Let me go. Get up again. Stop the whole thing. Get it out. Stop it. Come on. Stop it. We'll kill you. Stop it. Let go, will you? Get the knife across there. Go on. Go on. Oh. it. All right. Slide down to the floor and sit now. Cut it out. Slide down. All right. All right. Now stay there. Sit right there. I'll shoot a hole in your head big enough to walk through. Pop. All right. I'm sorry. Just sit there. Pop. I'm sorry I cut you. I'm sorry. You want me? Come in here, Pop. What did he do? He stabbed you? I'm sorry. I thought I was sorry. You sit still, George. You got plenty of trouble. Don't buy yourself anymore. Oh, you're bleeding, you know that. I know it, yeah. Pick up that knife and bring it here, Pop. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. You'll be a lot sorrier. Yeah. Here's the knife. Oh, you're bleeding bad. Here's the knife, Pop. Yeah, all right. Here, give it to me. Hey, well, listen. I had a few drinks. I'm a nice guy. All right, Pop. I'll tell you what I want you to do. Yeah? Hey, what do you say? I didn't mean it. Sit still, George. You're lucky I didn't shoot you before. Don't give me any trouble now. You know where that police call box in the corner is, Pop? Yeah. I'll go down there and open it up. Well, is it all right to do that? That's yes, all right. Tell him a policeman has been injured and he needs help with a prisoner. Yeah, all right. Now, Pop, wait a minute. Yeah? Uh, wait there for the officers to come, then you show them where it is. Okay? Okay. Okay, I'll wait there. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to cut you. I didn't. I had a few drinks. That's bleeding. That's bleeding pretty bad. Hey, let me see if I can fix it. Just sit there, George. I don't like the way you fix things. Patrolman Cochran, who received a deep cut on the right side during the course of the struggle, was bleeding profusely as he guarded his prisoner at the point of his gun. When the radio call went out, the nearest RNT car was number 681, manned by Sergeant Waters as recorder and Patrolman Farrell as operator. They made the run and were the first to arrive. They met the complainant and were directed to the flat. They took the steps two at a time. Captain, Three those people out of the hall. Okay, Sergeant. All right, folks, coming through there. There's nothing to see here. Get inside your off flat. Let us go. Take care of it, fellow. Yes, sir. I'm 
Don't worry, you've got to talk, huh? Ain't giving me a hard time. He started cutting at me. I'm sorry. I told you I was sorry. You'll keep quiet over there. Wow. Looks like he does a real haul in here. Yeah, blood's coming fast. There's more policemen in here. They're coming. Okay, Pop, thanks. Stand over there out of the way, Pop. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Um, what's up? Are you calling me? Get away from him, Pop. That plane burned. I warned you. You keep quiet. Let me take a look at that, Cochran. Yeah. Farrell. Yes, sir? Come here. Yes, Sergeant. I'll tell you what. Right, here's the more policemen. Hey, Farrell. Stay out in the hall. Uh, Jacoby, yeah. take care of that boy. Put the nippers on him and get him in the other room. All right, you. Come on. I go over here. Put your gun up, Cochran. Okay, Sergeant. Lean back there now. Uh, Farrell, give me a hand here. Yes, sir. No blood of blood, isn't it? He'll be all right. Now stop worrying about it. Just a nick in the leg. Now let's see if we can rip the pants off. Now wait a minute, Sergeant. They're brand new. They got a hole in them now, haven't they? What good are they? That material's pretty tough. Now here's knife on the table. Get it, pal. Yes. Isn't an ambulance coming, Sergeant? Yeah, an ambulance is coming. I, I just want to take a look at this. Here you are, Sergeant. Okay. Okay. Lean back there, Captain. And be careful. I couldn't stand to be nicked again. Just hold still. I'll grab it, Farrell. I want it ripped all the way off. Yeah. That's right. Oh, what a mess, huh? Hey, Pop. Come here. Yeah, can I do something? Listen, Pop. Have you got any, uh... Oh, that's what I want. Farrell, get me one of those stockings hanging over the sink there. Okay, Sergeant. Hey, there's in my hands, these stockings. Yeah, I know, Pop. Don't worry about it. Uh, Pop. Oh, Pop. I have a neighbor. Here you go, Sergeant. Sit around there in the groin, pal. See if you can find a pressure point. I want to get some knots in the stocking. Yeah. Lean back there, Paul. And what are you going to do? I'm going to try to stop him. Look, Angie, just got this stocking. Big by knots in her, please. Pop, stand over there like I told you, huh? But there's stockings. I'll get her a new pair. Just slow the time a little bit, pal. Yeah. All right, now. Let me get this around the side, there. Huh? Okay. Here's the pressure point, Sergeant. Put the big knot here. Okay. Raise up. I want to get the stocking on the other side of your hand. Yeah. Loop it. It's okay. Now, what do you think? Did he get an artery? Well, it's, the blood's pretty red, isn't it? Stop worrying about it. Give me his knife stick there. Yeah. I'll put it through. Yes, sir. You're going to tighten up now, Cocker. Let me know if it digs in too much. I don't think I have any fear in there. You'll know. I'll keep that stocking close to the groin as I kiss, though. Yes, sir. That's not getting too tight, is it? No, I'm not too. Not a couple of times. Hey, it's stopping. It's stopping bleeding. Pop, get over there out of the way. Yeah. Can you stand right there? It's okay. There's the skipper, Sergeant. Yeah. Hello, Cochran. Captain. Hi, Captain. Sergeant. What happened? Now, this man stopped me on the street. He said a fellow was up here bothering his 15-year-old daughter. I came up to get it straightened out. He came after me with a knife. Did you call him? Yes, sir. Mr. Hey, Colby's got him in there. Uh, Captain. Yeah. Uh, Farrell. Yes, sir. Hold it tight and count it 100. Then loosen it up and count it 50 before you tighten it again. Okay. I want to talk to you, Captain. Just lean back and relax, boy. I think you got that big artery in there, Captain. It's pouring out of there like out of a fountain. Did the call come over ambulance responding? Yes, sir. Well, you better send somebody down to check on it. Yes, sir. Out of the car. Yes, sir. The downstairs will ring in. See where the ambulance is. Yes, sir. Looks like he lost a lot of blood. Yes, sir. Too much. Well, let's hope not too much, Sergeant. A lot is enough. Within another few minutes, an ambulance had arrived and Patrolman Cochran was taken to Mount Sinai Hospital at 5th Avenue and 103rd Street. In the meantime, the 21st squad had been notified by the desk officer, and before the ambulance departed for the hospital, Detectives DeLuca and Goldman arrived to take charge of the investigation. They questioned the prisoner, George Cotella, on the scene, and then took him to the station house. When I went downstairs and got into my car, I instructed the operator, Patrolman Coley, to drive to the ambulance entrance at Mount Sinai. I got out of the car and walked through to the admitting office where the attendant told me Patrolman Cochran was being treated in emergency room number three. When I made the turn down the corridor, I saw Sergeant Waters waiting outside the open door to the treatment room. Hello, Captain. How is he? He wasn't so good when he came in, Captain. He was sort of going off, you know. Lost a lot of blood. Yeah. 
Well, as soon as they got him in here, they went to work with the plasma. You see? Mm -hmm. Oh, I guess that part is taken care of, all right. Who's the doctor? Uh, see that little fellow in there with the glasses? That's the one on this side. Yeah. He's a resident in Thursday. Who's the other one? Well, uh, one of the nurses told me that one of the biggest surgeons on the staff was just finishing up an emergency appendectomy over in a private pavilion. She said, get him if I could. Mm -hmm. So I walked over there and asked him, and he said, sure, I'd be glad to. So, there he is. Dr. Lowfield. Okay, good. Did he tell you anything? Took one look at Cochran and went to work. Oh, listen, Captain. Uh, Cochran's worried about how his wife's going to be notified. Well, where does he live? Out in Bayside. The 111th Precinct. Through the communications bureau in the precinct out there, why? Well, he's worried because she's five months pregnant and she's home alone with the, uh, their other kid. Oh. He says she's sure to think it's something a lot worse than just a cut in the leg. He'd like to call her on the phone himself. Well, we'll see what the doctor says. Yes, sir. And boy, George, sure that is nice sharp and on the sun edge. He's like a razor. Cochran's lucky he only got a nick in the leg instead of one in the head or the neck. Yeah. <laughs> We've done some real damage. He did enough damage as it is. Yes, sir. We got him here in time. Oh. Looks like they're through with him. For now, anyway. Mm -hmm. I want to meet the doctor. Yes, sir. Hello, Sergeant. Oh, uh, Doctor, this is Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the 21st Precinct. Dr. Lowfield. Doctor? How do you do, Captain? Well, I certainly appreciate you taking care of one of my men. I was in the hospital. I'm glad to do it. Uh, doctor, uh, is there any chance he could be wheeled to a telephone and call his wife? If we have to notify her in the ordinary manner, she's liable to think he's a lot worse off than he is. Well, I'm afraid he can't do any telephoning just yet, Sergeant. We had to give him a shot. Oh. Perhaps in a couple of hours. Well, she'd have to be notified by then. How is he, Doctor? I'd like to talk to you about him if I can, Captain. Yes, of course. Well, let's go over and sit down on the bench. I've had a rough night. Sure. Oh, uh, Sergeant, uh, I'd like you to do something for me. Yes, sir. Go to the admitting office and ring into the house, see what's doing. Yes, sir. Uh, right away, Captain. Sit down, Captain. You don't happen to have a cigarette on you. I left mine upstairs. Oh, sure. Thank you. There you are. Thanks. How about him, Doctor? He's going to be all right, isn't he? I hope so. Well, is there any doubt? It's only a cut in the thigh. Oh, there's no danger of him dying. I didn't mean to imply any such thing. It's not that. Well, what is it? Well, you remember where the wound was? Yes. About uh, three inches below the groin on the inside of his right thigh. About. And he was bleeding profusely, although the wound wasn't too deep. Bright red blood. Yes. And Sergeant Waters applied a tourniquet. Sergeant Waters probably saved his life. The point of the knife completely severed a superficial branch of the femoral artery. The main artery of the leg? Well, the femoral divides into two branches just below the groin. It was one of those branches. I see. Well, naturally, our main concern at the moment was to stop the flow of blood. And we were able to do this by clamping off the severed end of the vessel. His condition is weak from the loss of blood, but we've started on whole blood in addition to plasma, so that's no concern. You need any donors? I can call for volunteers. All of our men are tied. Not at the moment, Captain, but I'm sure the hospital would be glad to have its blood bank replenished. He's a big man. Wendy was running dry. We'll take care of it, Doctor. Now, uh, I could take him upstairs to surgery and go probing for the other end of the vessel. And if I found it, I could try to make a repair. Huh. I don't know where I'd find it, if at all. He's suffering from loss of a great amount of blood. He's in a state of shock. If it were necessary to perform such an operation at the moment to save his life, I'd do it. But his life isn't in danger. The operation, however, in his condition would be at the risk of his life. Well, um, is there any risk if you don't operate? Yes. There's a 50-50 chance he'll lose his leg. Oh. 
A mere human body is a wonderful thing, Captain. It knows what to do when it gets in trouble. And a good part of the time, by natural processes, it makes us surgeons look very good. In a case such as this, the blood supply to parts of his leg is gone. The tissues aren't being fed. But there are compensating factors. Collateral circulation is set up by other blood vessels in the region. Now, if it develops that there is sufficient collateral circulation, then you'll be all right. Do you think there will be? Well, as I said, it's a 50-50 chance. Right now, there are indications both ways. The thing I'm worried about is that the lower part of his leg is cold and has lost its color. That's not a good sign. No, Captain, it certainly isn't. I returned to the station house at 11.25, and I telephoned directly to the 111th Precinct in Bayside, Queens. The commanding officer was not on the job. I spoke to the lieutenant on desk duty. I informed him that he would receive via teletype in a few minutes instructions to notify the wife of Patrolman Cochran of his injuries. I explained to him that Mrs. Cochran was pregnant and that fact should be taken into consideration when the notification was made. The lieutenant told me that he would send his patrol sergeant on the job as soon as the teletype instructions were received. After I finished the conversation, I walked out of my office, through the muster room, and up to the second floor where the prisoner, George Cotella, was being questioned by detectives of the 21st Squad. Is uh, Lieutenant King in his office? Yes, sir. He's in there, Captain. Yes. Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. Hello, Matt. Hello, Captain. How is he, Captain? Not so good, man. What do you mean, not so good? All it was was a little cut in the leg. A little cut in the leg. George, you just sit there and keep your mouth shut. You're in enough trouble now. Don't make any more for yourself. I told you I was sorry. You'll be a lot sorrier. There's, a, there's an artery severed, Matt. It's even money to lose the leg. Mm, that's tough. You're going to lose the leg? Yes. That's what it looks like, George. Are you kidding why would I be kidding? Well, it was just a little cut, a little cut like that. It was in the wrong place, though. I feel terrible about that, you know. I, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I had a few drinks. I had no idea what I was doing. But you did it anyway. Well, I was drunk. I'm sorry. That's no excuse. I didn't mean it. You must have meant something. You went up there and bothered those people. You tried to make time with a 15-year-old girl. I like her. Is there a law against that? She's 15 years old. She doesn't want a thing to do with you. You threw her father out of the house. You were reeling drunk on wine. You pulled a knife on a police officer and stuck him. He may lose his leg. All right, you're sorry. What's it supposed to get you? I don't know, I guess. Well, I know, George, and I'm not sorry. Be married, Captain? Cochran? Yep. Married and has one child. Another on the way. So you've been notified? And the notification just went out. They live in the 111th. Yeah. They should be coming in. Yeah, I told the desk officer out there that if there's any difficulty about transportation, I'd send a car for her. Well, I'll send the squad car if you can't spare one from patrol. All right, Matt, thanks. Maybe I'll take you up on that. Listen, what do you think is going to happen to me? I've never been in trouble before. Not, not in bad trouble, I mean. What are they going to do to me? I hope they throw the key away, George. They won't, will they? I mean, I've never been in a big jam before. Yeah, but you hit the jackpot the first time you pulled the handle... After I had turned out the 12 to 8 platoon at midnight and the men marched out the front door, the switchboard buzzer sounded. It was the desk officer at the 111. He informed me that Mrs. Cochran had been notified of the injury to her husband. She had telephoned her sister, who resided in Brooklyn, to come and stay with her three-year-old son while she went to the hospital. The sister was on the way by taxi cab, and Mrs. Cochran could not be expected at Mount Sinai Hospital before another hour. At 12.40 p.m., a car came by the house and drove me to Mount Sinai, where I was directed to the floor on which they had put Patrolman Cochran. Only the dim nightlights were on in the corridor. I approached the floor nurse. She told me the doctor was in examining Cochran again. I walked down the hall and waited outside the room. 
Several minutes later, a young woman hurried down the corridor in my direction. Excuse me. Is this where Patrolman Cochran is? You're Mrs. Cochran? Yes. Well, I'm Captain Kennelly. Oh, yes. How is he? Hi, Paul. Well, uh, the doctor's in with him now. When that sergeant came and knocked on my door and told me he was hurt, I, I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how bad it was. I still don't. They said he was only caught on the leg. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Oh, that's a relief. You don't know what's been going through my head. I, I was imagining all sorts of things while I was waiting for my sister to come. While I was riding over here. I thought everybody was lying to me. He, he just got caught in the leg, the side. That's all, isn't it? Yes, that's all. Well, you know what a relief that is, Captain. What a genuine relief. I, I thought they just told me it was something like that so I wouldn't get scared or excited. Is this where he is? Is this the room? Yes. Can I go in now? Well, uh, the doctor's in there with him. Oh, yes, he told me. But uh, I'll ask him. Doctor. Yes? Mrs. Cochran is here. Well, all right. I'm all finished. Hello, Captain. This is uh, Dr. Lowfield, Mrs. Cochran. How do you do? Doctor. Your husband's awake, but he's been on sedation and he's lost a lot of blood. However, I think it would do him good if he saw you for a few minutes. Oh, it'd do me a lot of good, too. This way, Captain. Coming here. Yeah. Have you been here long, Captain? Oh, about ten minutes. Hello, Paul. Honey? Hi. Well, look where they got you. And for a little cat on the leg. You three year old son gets a top leg once a week. <laughs> Don't tell him his father can't take it. Uh, oh, Captain. Paul? What did they do with my friend? They booked him for felonious assault in 1897. Oh, I'll have to go to court in the morning. No, not in the morning, Paul. Not for a few mornings. How long am I going to have to stay here? Well, we'll talk about that in the daytime. I'd like to know. I don't know myself yet. It's only a small cut. Are you disappointed? I'm not. I didn't know what happened to you. I thought everybody was lying to me. Oh, you're just naturally suspicious. Uh, Duncan. I am not naturally suspicious. Can I talk to you? Yes, sure. (laughs) I've got a right to worry. Oh, yes, of course. Well, that's exactly what you're doing. Figure out, Doctor? No, uh, no thanks. I have my own now. Well, I want to thank you for staying with him. The first hours are critical in these cases. You know, the two of them seem quite relieved that it's only a cut in the thigh. Yes. It's going to be rough breaking the bad news to them. Captain, I don't believe there's going to be any bad news. Oh? You don't? I just made another examination of his leg. It's warmer and the color seems to be returning. It seems that those natural processes I told you about are going to work. Apparently, there's going to be sufficient collateral circulation. <laughs> That's good to hear. Did you tell Cochran? No, I didn't. There's no point in telling him the best if he never knew the worst. You're right. There's no point at all. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Where's this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, who is it that's hurt? Oh, you don't? Well, where's the man? Where? Well, which way on your cabin? Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you see him? And so it goes. Someone else said it uh, around the clock. Through the week. Okay. Every day, every year. The police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry go round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolmen's Benevolent Association an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters, 
Featured in tonight's cast were Gene Gillespie, John Sylvester, Louis Van Ruten, Eric Dressler, and John Haskin. Written and directed by... Place briefing, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, Coley. How many prisoners you got there? Yeah. Yeah. Well, where is it? Inside the bar there? Yeah. Yeah. You are by transcription in the muster room at Most the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. I'll send a car around to assist you. Yeah, right away. Okay. And then come on in. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them if they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my night tour, 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. It was raining hard when I came on the job, and the 62 men of the 4 to 12 platoon wore their black rubber raincoats and cap covers at the turnout. By 6 p.m., however, the rain had stopped, and when I went out for my meal, the skies were clear. At 8, I instructed Sergeant Waters on telephone switchboard duty to have a car come by the station house to take me on patrol. Then, for the next two and a half hours, with patrolman William P. Coley as operator, I rode the streets of the precinct. The 490 radio motor patrol cars of the police department of the city of New York are, for obvious reasons, conspicuous appearing vehicles. They are Ford, Chevrolet, and Plymouth Club Coupes. The lower part of the bodies are painted dark green and black, the upper part white. The word police is lettered in several places large enough to be read a block away. At night, a red and white lighted sign, also reading police, shines from the roof of each car. Consequently, a citizen in need of assistance can see a radio motor patrol car coming from some distance away. And as we drove downtown on Lexington Avenue en route back to the station house, that was the case exactly. If that fellow wants us, Captain. All right, pull in. Sir. I'm glad I saw you. What's the trouble? You see that bar there? Yep. Well, I was in there having a beer. See, I was just minding my own business having a beer. And for no reason at all, I looked around. You know, I just turned around. I'm sitting at the bar, you know. And there in the booth, this fellow, this girl. Why, I thought he looked familiar to me, so I took another look. Yeah. You know who he is? He's the guy who held me up three weeks ago. How do you like that? How's your boy? I'm the job. I'm the state manager for the independent subway. He came in, he stuck me up. You sure it was him? He ain't my identical fellow, I swear it. Is he still in the bar? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's in there. I wanted to get out as fast as I could before he recognized me. I thought I'd uh, see a cop on the street or something. I, I didn't know what to do. I thought I went to a phone someplace. He'd, he'd get out and get away, you know. So I just thought it best to wait outside until somebody came along. And if he came out meantime, I was, I was going to follow him, you know. Mm-hmm. I'm like, glad to see you. I, I, I didn't want to go following him. When he robbed me, he had a gun this long. Suppose I followed him. He still had it on him, eh? What's your name? Perfect. <laughs> Real perfect. Where is this subway station where you were robbed? Well, I'm at 16th Street, 116th Street Station, the 8th Avenue Line. And when was it? Three weeks ago. Three weeks ago. <laughs> you live around here, Roy? Yeah, over there, 2nd Avenue. All right, let's go have a look. Coley? Yes, sir. Right with you, Captain. Well, I'm telling you, they're in a station agent who's not going to breathe easier tonight. Know how many of us got stuck up the last couple of weeks already? Yes, I know. Eleven of us. Hold it, Ann. When I, I seen him, I started to shake, you know. Then I kind of got my wits back about me. He's a uh, redhead, isn't he? Yeah, he's a redhead. Oh, you know about this guy. 
Yeah, we know about him. What a guy. Eleven of us. Bang, bang, bang. You say he's in a booth across from the bar? Across from the bar and, and the back of it, sort of, you know. He's got this girl with him, you see. I recognize him right away. Right, right there. Right. All right, Roy, you wait right here. We'll talk to him. Be careful, will you? If he's still got the gun on him. Why? Yeah, just wait right here. Come on, Coley. Yes, sir. You watch him now. All right, Coley. You keep your eyes open. I'll talk to him. Okay, Captain. Joe. Very funny. Very funny. Joe, please. Stand up a minute, William. And what's the idea? Said stand up. Stand up. All right. Take it easy. What's the matter? Lean up against there. Why? Go on, lean up against there. Yeah, all right. Shake him, Coley. Sit. I'd like to know what the idea is. So would I. Oh. All right, sit down. But what's the matter anyway? What's your name? Creedy. Paul Creedy. Keep your hands on the table. I'm just going to get my wallet to show you. All right, just keep your hands on the table there. Uh, what's the idea? Well, what's the idea? We didn't do anything. We were just sitting here. Where do you live, Paul? Why? Because I asked you, where do you live? 762 East 89th Street. I'd like to know what this is all about. What would I, after all? No, no, we'll handle it, Joe. What's the matter? Look, you better just get back behind the bar. Okay, if you say so. I'd like to know what this is all about. We've got some rights in the country, too, you know. Okay, honey, it's all right. Coley, go outside and get him. Get her right away. Get who? You working, Paul? Working? Sure, I'm working. Where do you work? At a leather goods factory downtown. What's the name of the company? Ravenscroft. Ravenscroft Leather Goods. Now, listen, how fun is fun. What's this all about? You ever been arrested, Paul? Of course he hasn't. Have you? No, I haven't. What's your name? <laughs> Her name is Louise Bonella. She's a friend of mine. We go out together. She lives across the street from me. Is there anything else you want to know? All right, Paul, take it easy. Why should I take it easy? You come around here throwing a lot of questions at me. Why should I take it easy? Because you're liable to have a lot more questions thrown at you. Here he is, Captain. That's him. That's the guy. I'm the guy what? You're the guy that stuck me up. You're out of your mind. It's been with me all night. It wasn't tonight. I didn't stick you up. All right, all right. You're lying about okay, it. Okay, you know. cut it out. Well, he's crazy. I'm all right. Quiet now. He, he didn't stick anybody up. Listen, when was this supposed to have happened? About three weeks ago. In the 116th Street station of the 8th Avenue line. He's out of his mind. Yeah, well, we'll see if I have. Listen, let's go get this straightened out. I want it straightened out. That's what we're going to do, Paul. Right now. Patrolman Coley rang in, and an additional car was sent to assist, and we took all three to the station house. At the house, Coley and I took them upstairs to the office of the 21st Detective Squad, where the situation was explained to Detective John Bender, who was catching, and Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the squad. As required, Patrolman Coley, who would be the arresting officer of record, remained with his prisoner. I went downstairs to my office. After talking for a few minutes to the complainant, Roy Perford, Lieutenant King brought the suspect into his office where he questioned him in the presence of Patrolman Coley and Detective Bender. Well, you've got to grant this, Paul. The man walked into the bar. He saw you sitting there. He said you're the boy that stuck him up. Must be something to it. Well, he said it. There's something to that. Maybe he believes it. I don't know. But it wasn't me. Paul, in the last month, there have been 11 station agents held up in Manhattan alone. That doesn't make me the guy. I know it doesn't. But I want you to listen to this. What? One of the robberies was in this precinct, the 77th Street station of the Lexington Avenue line on Friday, June 24th. This is from the squeal made out by the detective investigated the case. At 11.18, a lone man walked up to the change booth and asked directions on how to get to Times Square. Station agent told him... The man then pulled a nickel-plated revolver from his pocket and robbed the station agent of $53.40. What's that got to do with me? The station agent described the man like this. 24 years old, 5 feet 9 inches, 150 to 60 pounds, light complexion, blue eyes, medium build, and red hair. Sure sounds like he was talking about you, doesn't it, Paul? Well, I'm not the only guy in New York with red hair. He was one. This fellow Roy Pierford, who saw you in the bar tonight. He gave the detectives up there in the 28th squad almost an identical description. 
He identified you in person. Well, that doesn't mean a thing. It means a lot to me, Paul. From the description, it appears the same man who was involved in the other nine cases. Well, why don't you find him? Paul, the opinion appears to be pretty widespread that we've got him. It's not true. I didn't do it. All right. Maybe we'll find out if you didn't. But I'm telling you, if you did, you might as well let me know about it right now. Because you'd just be wasting a lot of your time and a lot of mine. I didn't. Now, you told Captain Kennelly that you were employed by the Ravenscroft Leather Goods Company. That's right. What do you do there? I work on a stamping machine. Work steady? Yeah, sure. How long you been there? Since around February. What do you make a week? Well, that depends on the overtime. On the average, thing. Eh? All around $80, $75. What time did you get in in the morning? Like uh, 8 o'clock. What time are you through? Four. Unless it's overtime. You live at 762 East 89th Street? Yeah. Who do you live there with? My mother, my brother, and my sister. Where's your father? Oh, that's what we'd like to know. Bender, move that ashtray over so I can use it. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all right. Are your brother and sister younger or older? No, she's older. He's younger. Do they work? My sister does. She uh, works for the city. My brother's in high school still. He works a little bit, you know. Odd jobs. How old is he? 18. What color hair does he have? Red, too? No, no. He's darker. Brown like yours. Mm-hmm. Who's this girl you were with tonight? Louise Vanilla. Yeah, I know that. I mean, you see her much? Yeah, I see her a lot. We're uh, thinking about getting married. Oh, are you? Yeah. When? We don't know yet. We've got a few problems we've got to work on. Yeah, don't we all? How long have you been going with her? Oh, I don't know. Uh, three or four months. Ever been in trouble, Paul? What do you mean, trouble? Ever been arrested? No. Never? No. Never had any trouble with the cops? Not even when you were a kid? Kid stuff? No, never. Now, well, see now. There were 11 of these robberies. Let's just talk about two of them for a minute. The two we know most about so far. I don't know anything about any of them. I mean, us. We here. Now, we know about the one in the 116th Street Station of the 8th Avenue line because Mr. Pierford saw you in the bar and identified you. He's crazy about yeah, that. Yeah, but he identified you. That was on June 16th, Thursday night. Now, we know about the one that was here in this precinct. That was on June 24th, Friday night. You got any idea where you were either of those two nights? Not at the moment. I have to think about it. I just can't remember back when I wasn't doing anything in particular that I, I know of. Yeah. Could have been with your girl, couldn't you? Louise? Oh, yeah, sure. I could have. I, I might have, but I don't know. How should I know? I can't remember specifically. All right. Could have been home. I could have, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't remember that far back. How do you expect me to remember where I was a month ago almost? I had no reason to remember. No, you could have been putting a gun on those station agents. Well, that I wasn't. You'd have remembered that. If I did them, I would have remembered. I didn't do them. I'll tell you what, Paul. I'll agree with you that there's lots of redheads in New York. Sure are. And I'll agree with you that Mr. Pierford, the fellow at the 116th Street Station, might have been mistaken. I know he was. I'll tell you what I've got in mind. We've got the victim from the 77th Street subway station, the one in this precinct over here. See what he has to say. Well, that's not fair. You're not going to sit him down here and say one fellow said I was the guy. No, no, nothing like that. If he picks you, he's got to pick you out of a line. Oh, sure, and I'm the only redhead. How can he miss? He'll be loaded with redhead. Well, all right. That's fair enough. Good. Excuse me. Yeah. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Lieutenant King, Sergeant. Captain Tonelli around? Yes, sir. He's in his office. I'll ring in there. Okay. 21st Precinct, Captain Canale. Lieutenant King, Captain. Yes, Matt. If you have a minute, I'd like to talk to you. Okay, Matt, I'll be right up. I'll meet you at the head of the stairs, Captain, outside the squad room. All right. You sit in there, Paul. Call you stay with him. Yes, sir. Come on, Bender. Yes, sir. I'm not going to be here all night, am I? I hope not, Paul. Look, Bender. Yes, sir. There's two things I want you to do. I want you to check his name through BCI for any previous record. Okay. And I want you to see if you can locate the victim of the robbery in this precinct and get him over here. Yes. Oh, uh, yes, sir? Tell Goldman I said to ride over to the boy's house. I want him to take a look through his thing, see if he's got that gun around there or any other evidence. Okay, Lieutenant. Get on it. Yes, sir, right away. Listen, uh, excuse me. Yes, Mr. Perfect. Oh, how long will I have to wait around here, do you know? 
I, I was just supposed to be going down for a paper, and I stopped in for that beer, and my wife will have a fit. Oh, I just telephone let her know you're here. Well, we don't, we don't have any phones. I could have the desk office and the policeman around to notify her. Oh, no, don't do that. She, she wouldn't know what to think. She's got some vivid imagination. Could I could just go home and come back? Would that be all right? The detectives from the 28th Squad are on the way down here to see you. Better stay here. All right. Aren't you finished with Paul yet? No, not yet. What's taking so long? He didn't do anything. You know he didn't do anything. That's the trouble. I don't know it. Well, when will he be finished? I don't know that either. You can go home if you want. No, that's all right. I'll stay. All right. Up to you. May have a long wait. I, I don't care. Thanks for coming up, Captain. It's all right, ma'am. Well, how does it look? Well, he continues to deny he's the one. Yeah. I'm getting the victim from the robbery in this precinct over here, and we'll have a lineup. Good. I need some help on the lineup, Captain. We'll get to it about midnight. I need four or five redheads about the same physical description as his. Oh, we ought to be able to dig up that many between both platoons. Yes, I think so. I saw Kane is working at four to twelve. It's going to be good. Yeah, he would be. And, uh... I think uh, Benjamin is on the job, too. Oh, good. Yeah, we ought to have enough. I'll, uh, I'll talk it over with the desk officer. What do you think of this boy, man? What do I think? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, Captain, I've got a personal opinion. After that second victim gets a look at him, I think he's going to walk right out of here. I don't believe that boy was anywhere near those subway stations. You are listening to 21st Precinct a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. After I spoke to Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, I rang upstairs and told Lieutenant King we had five patrolmen, all red-haired, who approximated the same general physical description as the suspect. I suggested that the proposed lineup be held as close to midnight as possible in order that those men who were on the job would lose as little time from patrol as practical and those men off duty would be required to spend a minimum of their own time. He agreed, provided, of course, that the victim could be located and brought to the station house by then. In a criminal case, identification by the victim of the suspect is generally the most important piece of evidence. Consequently, procedure calls for exactitude in conducting a lineup. The process of identification is usually the prime target of attack by the defense attorney and any irregularity that can be shown makes a deep impression on the jury in favor of the defendant. At 11.25 p.m., Lieutenant King informed me that Detective Bender had located the victim at his home in Washington Heights and was driving him to the station house. The men from the patrol force who were to participate in the lineup were instructed to report to Lieutenant King in their civilian clothes. At midnight, I turned out the platoon, and after the men marched out the front door to take over their posts, I started across the muster room toward my office. Captain? Oh, hello, Mender. Captain, this is Mr. Lewis Wolfsmith, Captain Canelli. Captain. How do you do, Mr. Wolfsmith? He's a victim in that robbery we had in this precinct. I never thought you'd cap catch him. I never thought you would. Well, we don't know that it's him yet, Mr. Wolfsmith. You're the one who's going to have to tell us that. Oh, don't you worry about that. I know him. I don't forget. I wonder if we could wait in your office until they're ready for Mr. Wolfsmith upstairs, Captain. Sure, Bender. Help yourself. I'll go up and see how they're making out. Yes, sir. In here, Mr. Wolf. How long will it take? You know? Well, Yes, Sergeant. I was just upstairs or about all set. All right, I'm going up there now. I left those cabaret inspection reports on your desk, Captain. Did you get a chance to look at them? No, not yet. I'll, uh, I'll read them during the night. Yes, sir. Anything unusual in them? Just in that one I was telling you about, Captain. I told the manager we had another complaint about the entertainers fraternizing with the patrons. He said he'd watch it. And you make a stop in there tomorrow night, too, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Make sure he is watching it. <laughs> All right, keep it down, you men. What do you think this is? Where's Lieutenant King? Keep his office, Captain. Well, haven't you gone home yet? No, I'm waiting for Paul. You could have a long wait. That's all right. I don't mind. Yes. Captain Canelli. Come in, Captain. 
Bender brought the other victim in, Matt. He's waiting in my office. Yeah, I know. He rang up here, Captain. I told him to come upstairs and wait with him outside in the hall. Oh. What are you about set, Paul? Yes, I'm set. Let's get it over. All right. You found a few redheads. Paul, <laughs> are you all right? Why don't you go home, honey? I don't want to. You either have to sit down on the bench at home. Go sit down, Louise, please. This will all be over, sir. I hope so. I, I just hope so. Do you have a light, Captain? Yeah, sure. Get them lined up over there, will you? Okay. Here you are. All right, fellas. Let's pull them alive. Thanks. Paul, listen. I was just sitting in a bar minding my own business. All right, Paul. Let's go. Yeah. Come on, come on. Form a straight line there. Okay, Paul, this is your party. Pick your spot. Anywhere? On the end, in the middle, anywhere you like. All right. Well, this will do it right here. Spread out there and let him in. Excuse me, Captain. I'll be right back. Yeah, hey, sure. Go ahead, man. Take that jacket off, Kane. Hello, Bender. Lieutenant, this is Mr. Lewis Wolfschmidt, Lieutenant King. Mr. Wolfschmidt? Hi, how are you? Well, Schmidt, do you think you can identify the man that held you up? Oh, yeah. You sure of it? Oh, I remember him. I remember what he looked like. I could do it. All right, well, let's try him. You want to come in? Yeah. It was like yesterday that night. When we get in there, I'll tell you how we work it. Go ahead, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, thank you. Now, I want you to walk up and down in front of that line of men there. Right. No, thank you. I take your time. Put them over. Put them over good. You see the one that held you up and robbed you? Tap him on the shoulder. Um, put them all over? Put them over good. Yep. I got it. 21st squad, Detective Bender. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, listen, send it. You want me to take another look? You think you need it? I'd like to hear that one talk. Which one? This one here. Take your name and address. Paul Creed. 762 East 89. That's him. He's the one. It's a lie. It's a lousy frame. No frame up. Nobody told me nothing. The rest of you men are excused. Thank you very much. The whole thing is a lousy frame. You're up. the one. I can't help it. I'm beginning to end. Go in my office, Paul. Hey, Captain. Right with you, man. Wait a minute, Mr. Wilson. Yeah, sure. Lieutenant? Go ahead, Ed. It's a lousy frame up. That's what it is. Yes, Bender. Uh, listen, Lieutenant. Can I talk to you? All right. Sit down, Paul. I didn't rob anybody. What do I have to do to prove it? I don't know, Paul. Okay, Bender, thanks. Yes, sir. Well, Paul, looks like that was it, huh? That was nothing. It was a frame-up. You got to hang it on somebody so you picked me, that's all. Did I? Did I pick you to serve two years in Elmira Reformatory for grand larceny and felonious assault? True, isn't it? Yeah. If you lied about that, you could lie about this. I didn't stick up anybody. The Bureau of Criminal Identification called back and said the case practically amounted to armed robbery. Why did you lie about doing time? Ah, uh, okay. I guess you got the right joke. Sit down, Paul. I, uh, thought I could soft talk my way out of it, but I guess there's no use. No. There's no use. Was it you on all 11 of them? I don't know, 10, 11, something like that. Where's the gun, Paul? I got it. Where? In the basement of my house. I never did keep it upstairs. I thought my mom and my brother might find it when I wasn't there. So. Exactly where in the basement? Well, I couldn't describe it exactly. I have to show you. Listen, I didn't hurt anybody. I didn't hurt a soul. I wouldn't have shot any of those guys, believe me. You said you worked at this leather goods place. Is that the truth? I did work there, but I got fired. 
there wasn't any money coming in and had to get it someplace, you know. Got to help out at home. Find a way to help out, isn't it? Had to help out some way. Why didn't you get another job? I don't know. This was easier, I guess. Hmm. Was it? What else did you rob besides those station agents? Nothing. Nothing else, I swear. Well, listen, uh, Louise doesn't know a thing about this. She thinks I'm still working down there. She don't even know I did time before. She don't know a thing. She's waiting outside. Do you want to talk to her? What's the use? What could I say? I don't know. I don't want to talk to her. Well, that's up to you. I never should have gone into that bar tonight. That was my mistake. My big mistake. No, that wasn't your big mistake. What was? If you don't know, Paul, I can't help you. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Where is this? What's the trouble there? Well, how do you know? From what? Well, where is it? Where on East 81st Street? Who's this calling? What's your name? What? All right. You just wait right there for the officers. And the right away goes. Yeah. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Eileen Palmer, Larry Haynes, Bill Zuckett, John Gibson, and Lawson Zerbe. Written and produced by Stanley Niss. Art Hanna speaking. My first briefing, Sergeant Waters. Yeah, that's right. What's the trouble over there? Going what? Who's doing that? Well, who told you to call? Was the policeman there? You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. Tell the officer I'll send someone around there right away. Yeah. You tell him right away. First precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. I came into the station house at 7.25 and walked around the desk to sign the blotter. Then I went into my office to change the uniform. A few minutes before 8, I went out into the muster room and behind the desk where Lieutenant Snyder, who had been desk officer on the 12 to 8, was talking to Lieutenant Gorman, who would be on the job for the day tour. Sergeant Waters, who would have telephone switchboard duty, was relieving his counterpart, Sergeant Collins. In the back room, the men already in uniform were being inspected by the oncoming patrol sergeant. 
Promptly at 8 a.m., Lieutenant Gorman rang a bell, which sounded in the back room. The platoon, consisting of 58 men who would patrol the precinct for the next eight hours, was brought to attention by the sergeant and marched out into the muster room. They halted in front of the desk, faced right, dressed their ranks. As the roll was being called, I looked up and down the ranks from behind the desk. Three of the five men transferred to the precinct in the last few days were in this platoon. I paid out special attention to their appearance. Wait. White. Sigler. All right, men. Not much this morning. It's going to be another hot day. I want to remind you of the order still in effect concerning the unauthorized use of fire hydrants for shower baths in the streets. Keep the kids away from them. Also, uh, there was an occurrence in the 17th precinct yesterday which involved an assault on the driver of a Department of Sanitation tow truck. He was attacked by the owner of a motor vehicle while in the process of hauling away an illegally parked automobile. When this work is being done in the precinct, I want the patrolman on post present, unless there is more urgent duty elsewhere. And uh, we've had complaints about vegetable peddlers in the 70s again. If you see any of these men, examine their licenses. They don't have a license, issue a summons. All right. Post the platoon. Platoon, attend, jump! Left, first! Forward, march! Yes, sir. I see you've got post seven and nine doubled up. Yes, sir. Egan has a case in court. What time do you think he'll be back on the job? It'll be before noon, I hope, Captain. Mm-hmm. Who's over there? Pagano, Captain. You know, things have been pretty rough at the playground over there the last couple of days. You better let Pagano handle seven and double up eight and nine. Yes, sir. I'll switch it around. As soon as they make the first train. <laughs> Well, we still got that strike at the print shop over there. That's an eight. Well, don't you have someone on a fixer at the strike? Uh, no, sir, not today. They said it was pretty quiet yesterday. Only one or two pickets. No trouble. Oh. Pick the man on post, could handle Well, double up six and nine instead of eight and nine. Yes, sir. That'll be all right, won't it? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, is there any hot coffee back there? Yes, sir, I think so. Sergeant, is there any hot coffee? Yes, sir, a whole pot. Well, I got it. Well, you got what, lady? You told me if I went and got a summons, you'd arrest him. I told you? When I was in here yesterday afternoon, I spoke to you, and you told me if I went to the court and got a summons, you'd arrest him. Lady, I wasn't here yesterday. I've been out for two days. Well, somebody told me. Somebody sitting right where you're sitting now. Whoever it was didn't tell you that they'd arrest him. Oh, yes, they did. They said if I went to court and got a summons, they'd send a policeman to you. Nah, you know you weren't told that at all. You were told that if you went and got a summons, a police officer would be sent with you when you served it. If you were afraid you were in physical danger. That's the case exactly. I'm afraid I'm in physical danger. Yes, well, that's a little bit different. You weren't told the police officer would make the arrest. As far as I can see, it's the same thing. Not as far as I can see. Can I see that summons, please? Yes. Thank you. What are the police for, anyway, if not to help somebody when they're in physical danger like this? You're Martha Ramsey. Yes, I'm Martha Ramsey. Who's Charles McKelton? He's my supposed son-in-law. Why did you have a summons issued for him? Because he hit me. That's why. Your daughter is the wife of this Charles McKelton? Well, they went through a wedding ceremony, if that's what you mean. But he doesn't treat her like any wife. He treats her like dirt under his feet. And he treats me worse. Where did this happen, where did he hit you? He took his fist and he doubled it up and he hit me right across the face. No, no, I mean where? At what place? At home, in the living room. And who else was there? Just me and him, Rosalie, that's my daughter. She went down to Fort Street shopping. She was at home. He just doubled up his fist and hit me without the slightest provocation. Then I said I wouldn't spend another night under that roof and he said, God. He went over and he opened the door and he said, go on if you're going. So I went. I went right downstairs and I looked for a policeman to arrest him. I didn't see a policeman. So I walked over here and this one, or the other one, told me to go to the court and get a summons. Then I went back and I waited outside for Rosie to come home and we went to the court together. I explained to the man down there and he said I was right. <laughs> he said I was perfectly right. 
Uh, you live there with your daughter and son-in-law? I do, and I don't anymore. Well, where did you stay last night? At my other daughter's in Long Island City. After we went down and got the summons, I told Rosalie, I'm not going to spend another night under that roof, and I won't permit you to spend another night under that roof with him. I forbid it. So we went down to Long Island City to my other daughter. Where is Rosalie now? She's right outside. I told her to wait outside, and I'd get everything set. Uh, what does she say about all this? But he's her husband. Oh, he won't be for long. All right, you go outside and get her and bring her in here. Why? Just get her and bring her in. All right. I don't see why. Captain, patrol must act the division on a wire for you. All right, put it on here. Yes, sir. I'm surprised it didn't kill her. So am I. On in first place in Captain Canelli. Yeah. Yeah. What time? All right, sure. Sure, I'll do that. Okay. There's a meeting at 2 o'clock of commanding officers of the division, right? Yes, sir. Who's desk officer on the 4 to 12? Lieutenant Bryan and I, Captain. All right, you tell him when he comes in this afternoon. I'm sure I'll be back, but in case I'm not, he's to handle the turnout. Yes, sir. Well, here she is. This is my daughter, Rosalie. How do you do? Hello. Uh, do you believe that if your mother went to serve this summons on your husband, he'd attack her physically? Well, he did, yes. And you don't know about the times I didn't tell you about, Rosalie. He'd get violent, violent whenever you were out of the house. He's capable of murder, that man. Plain, unadulterated murder. I wouldn't say that. Oh, now. how long will it take you to get over being blind as far as he is concerned? I guess he wouldn't try to hit her again. <laughs> All right, Red. Have the patrolman accompany her when she serves the summons. Yes, sir. I'll be in my office. Yes, sir. 694 East 78th Street. Yes, that's right. There's your front. Sergeant? Yes, sir. What time is the carriage ring? Uh, 38, Lieutenant. All right. Policeman on post over there will ring in at 838. I'll tell him you're on the way over and you'll meet him. How about on the corner there in front of the cleaners? All right. What's the policeman going to do? I mean, is he going to arrest Charles or something? Are you sure? Did you ask him? He's just going to be there while your mother serves the summons to see that everything is done peacefully. Oh. All right. Well, come on, Rosalie. Yes. The police will be in front of the cleaners. Yes, about a quarter to nine. All right. Thank you very much. Mother, I will set a Rosalie. Sergeant? Yeah, Lieutenant. I want to talk to the Carol when he rings in. Yes, sir. Uh, would you say she's a typical all-American mother-in-law? I hope not. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yes, sir, I think so. Uh, just a second, Captain. Lieutenant, have you got a couple of UF-16 memo pads out here? Yeah. Lieutenant's got some here, Captain. All right. Yes, sir. Right away. He wants me to bring in a couple of pads. Uh, top shelf with the Captain. Okay. Where? Right there. Oh, yeah. I'll be right back. All right. Captain. Come in. Yes, sir. Here you are, Captain. Oh, thanks. Yes, sir. Is he uh, sending somebody to stand by while she serves the summons? Yes, sir, the girl. Okay. I don't know why, Captain. Doesn't look like she needs any protection. Well, it's a good idea anyway. Maybe he does. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. Except in a few specifically defined instances, under the laws of the state of New York, a police officer may not make a summary arrest for a misdemeanor or issue a summons for an offense unless the act of violation of the law is committed in his presence. Similar statutes prevail in most states. These provisions of the law, specifically designed to protect the rights of the individual, often cause aggrieved complainants to believe that law enforcement officers are lax in their duty when they refuse to take action on a complaint and direct the individual to the magistrate's courts in the city of New York or to the prosecuting attorney or a justice of the peace in other localities. 
The fact is, if a police officer in the city of New York made a summary arrest in such a case without being a witness to the crime or offense, both he and the city might be liable to civil action for damages brought by the arrested party. Proper procedure, therefore, is to suggest to the offended party that he secure a summons. Once the summons is procured, a police officer will be sent along on request of the complainant to preserve the peace while the summons is being served. In the instance at hand, the complainant, Mrs. Martha Rumsey, and her daughter, Mrs. Rosalie McKelton, walked to the corner where it had been arranged for the patrolman on post, Paul Sakaro, to meet them. He was waiting at the designated spot. Well, here we are. Are you Mrs. Rumsey? Yes, that's right. This is my daughter, Rosalie. Rosalie McKelton. Hello? How do you do? I understand you want to serve a summons? Yes, that's right. Her husband. Her husband hit me and he cursed me. He made all sorts of threats at me. Didn't he? Hmm? Well, I, I I don't know, Mother. I wasn't there. You don't doubt my word? Of course he did. He's a potential killer. Believe me, he's a potential killer. I wouldn't stay under that roof another night, and I wouldn't let her stay under that roof. Why, well, he could murder us in our sleep. Oh, Mother, please. Oh, don't Mother please me now. Oh, uh, which house is it? Oh, uh, that one there. It's 9-4. All right. And you better be ready when I get in this. I don't want him to do anything. Oh, Mother, he won't do anything. Oh, well, he, he said that. You said it and said it, but he did. Are you sure he's home? I think he is. I wouldn't be surprised if he's out running around with some woman. You know, when the cat's away, he's he not running around. He never did. Oh, didn't he? Well, if I told you all the things I've heard... This is it, huh? Yes. Now, listen, Rosalie. I want you to stay down here. I think I ought to go up and talk to no. him. No, you better stay down here. But he's probably been worried about me, Mother. Worried? I bet he went out and did the town last night. I bet he was in and out of every bar in the neighborhood. Oh, Mother. I said, don't mother me. I think I ought to go up. Well, if you take my advice, I'd stay down here if I were you. There's no sense causing too much of a discussion up there. There. You see what the officer says, Rosalie? You wait right here. But I have to get some of my clothes. I don't have a thing except what I got on. You think I need better off? Stay here, Rosalie. I'll get out of here. All right. Uh, and the officer. Stay right there, Rosalie. All right, Mother. Uh, what floor is it? Third floor in the front. I've got it. Oh, thank you. Are you going to ring the bell? And have you ready for me? <laughs> Say not. You go right up there and let's come what may. Yeah. Would have been a good idea. Save you a trip upstairs if he isn't home. If he isn't home, I'll go right in there and get my things. Mine and my daughter's. You have a key? Yes, I have a key. You don't think I'd live there without having a key, do you? Supposing he attacks me again. He won't attack you. You don't know him. How can you make a positive statement? That's what I'm here for, to prevent something like that. Well, just make sure you prevent it. Uh, it's that one. Uh, what's his name again? Charles. I mean his last name. McKelton, Charles McKelton. All right, you better knock on the door. Aren't you supposed to do anything? Knock on the door. <sighs> there. I suggest you keep the summons where you can give it to him. I've got it. You don't have to tell me how to run my business. What's he doing in there? I bet he saw us coming out the window. No, there's somebody. Oh. You. Yes, it's me. Where's my wife? She's not coming back here, I'll say that. She's not coming back here only over my dead body. Don't tempt me. Yes, Where is she? Oh, all right, now, look, take it easy. Where's my wife? You see, you see, officer, he's threatening me again. You see that? He's not threatening you. You came up here to serve a summons. Now give it to him. Here. Here, take it. Take it. There. What's this for? You read it, you'll see what it's for. It's for hitting me. That's what it's for. Who hit you? You did. All right, folks, it'll get settled in court. You did hit me. All right, we'll get it settled in court. Where's my wife? Well, if you must know, she's downstairs waiting for Well, I want to see her. Now, look, Mr. McKelvin, I want to avoid trouble around here. She don't want to see you. You told her that, huh? I... I'm going down. I think you ought to get back inside, Mr. McKelvin. Yeah, I guess maybe you're right. She's been filling her ears for 24 hours. Wait a minute. We want our things. What things? Our clothes. And the furniture that belongs to us, everything like that. You tell Rosalie to come up here and get him. I'll give him to her. Well, you see? You see? Yeah, I see. Charles! You open this door! Come on, Mrs. Romsey. 
Wait till I get my key. I want to open the door. I'd advise you to stay out of there. Well, you would, would you? Suppose I don't want to take your advice. I think you'd better. How are we going to get our things? You'll have to see a lawyer about that. Now, come on. Are you trying to tell me I can't go into my own home? In the first place, it seems to be his home. And I'm not trying to tell you anything. I'm just trying to avoid trouble. You better come downstairs. Well... I thought the idea was for you to be here to protect me. I'm supposed to protect everyone. All I want is our clothes and things. You'll get them. Would you tell me how? Would you please tell me that? That's going to be up to you. You'll get what's wrong. Well, I should think so. You see what I mean about him? How she could have married him in the first place, I'll never. But the fact that I didn't warn her. I warned her. I warned her plenty, believe me. I'll bet you did. And even give me our things. How do you like that? Wait till I get him in that court. I'll show that one. He has to come, don't he? You serve him with the summons. He has to. You want to know something? Huh? He won't. Go ahead. I wouldn't put it past him to defy the law. And we just like him, shirking his responsibilities. Just like him. Mother. Mother. Was he up there? Of course he was up there. I served him the summons. How is he? Is he all right? I didn't ask him. All I asked for was our students. He refused. Point blank. He refused. Well, you don't need me anymore. You, you. I don't think I need you in the first place for all the hurt that you've been. Yeah, well, now, look. Charles, get back inside the window. Oh, oh, yeah. Get back inside before you fall out. Rosalie. Come on up there, Rosalie. Listen, you put on lean out that far. Rosalie. Michael, let go of me. Come on up there. I want to talk to you. Don't you dare, Rosalie. Don't you dare go up there. That's what he did to me. Don't you dare. Hey, come on up, will you? Who do you owe your lawyers to? Just think. Who raised you and who fed you? Just think. Rosalie! Get back in there. Oh, Mother, please, I've got to go on. Rosalie, I'll never talk to you again. I'll trust you out of my life, I swear it. Oh, Mother! I swear it, I swear it on my life, on my life. Look, folks, you can't go yelling on the street. Come on up here. I can't, Charles. I can't. Don't listen to her. That's the trouble. Get out of here. Get out of Folks. Tell him to have your things ready. You'll send someone for them this afternoon. Oh, Mother. Tell me, will you listen to me? Tell him. Now, look, you're going to have to break this up. Hey, get back inside there. Tell him, Rosalie. Charles, I'm sorry. I can't come up. Tell him about our things. Oh, what? I just want you to have our things ready. I'm going to send someone this afternoon. Charles. He went inside. Charles. I guess he's talking to you all he wants to, folks. Now you'll have to move on. There he is. Don't throw that. Oh, I'll get it. I told you not to throw that. Here's the lamp your mother gave us. Here. Charles! Oh, not up there. Watch out. I'm warning. You'll stop throwing those things out the window. Get back, folks. Go on. Now, see here, officer. I said get back. He's aiming at you. Oh, is he? on the corner. What call that? That police telephone. Run down there and tell them to send some help. Why don't you go? I'm asking you to go, now go. No, no. All right, if you put it that way. Vaccaro correctly decided to wait on the sidewalk until assistance arrived. If he went upstairs and attempted to gain entrance to the flat, a pedestrian might have been struck and injured by an object thrown out of the window. He kept the onlookers back off the sidewalk and tried to convince Charles McKelton to stop the destruction of his own property. In the meantime, the call for assistance reached the station house. Sergeant Waters on TS duty notified the Communications Bureau and a Signal 32, assist a police officer, was put out over the air. I had just gone out on patrol of the precinct in sector car number three with Patrolman Coley as operator. We were within two blocks of the scene when the radio call came over and I instructed Coley to make the run. When we turned into the block, I noticed that Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, was in his car making the turn right behind us. 
All right. Pull up in there, Coley. Yes. Give him a hand with the crowd, will yes, you? All right, stay back there. I told you. All right, now. Do what the house is talking What have you got, Bacow? I was up there while she served the summons and he's been throwing stuff out the window. He's ruined everything. Everything. Use a hand, Captain. Yeah, it looks that way, Matt. Hello, Lieutenant. Carol. Come on, let's go up. Yeah. He's got a key. All right, good. You get it and come up after us. Yes, sir. Coley, handle things on the sidewalk. Yes, No, not the mirror. Oh, not the mirror. All right, Captain. Yeah. All right, let's go. Right with you. Slowly, he's the icebox. Yeah. I got it. Third floor front, isn't it? Yeah. What is he, a psycho? Mother-in-law came to serve a summons on him. Oh, yeah? Claims he hit her yesterday. With what? With his fist. Are these things ever on the ground floor? I can't remember one, man. No, I right, take it easy. That's it, uh. Can we knock and see what happens, Captain? I don't think the Carol is coming with the key. Let's wait and try it. Maybe he doesn't have it bolted from the inside. Come on, the Carol. Got it? Yes, sir. I got it. All right. Give it in. Yes, sir. I think we're all right. All right. Come on. Put that down. No. Put me along. Put it down. Put it Go. If you want to grab it, but I'll help me. Go. Right here, will you? All right. All right. Take it easy. I got it, Captain. All right. Sit down, man. Okay. I'm all right. I'm fine. We were beginning to wonder... She gets me so mad. Oh, mad. Who, oh, your wife? Her mother. I could... Mm. All right, take it easy. She tried to break us up before we were married. She's tried to break us up ever since we were married. All right, she's done it. I had it with her, believe me. I guess they had it with you, too. I don't care. Good. She got what she wanted? Okay, we're finished. <sighs> Brother, it was fun while it lasted. I got a lot off my chest. And a lot out the window. That's what I mean. There's your wife. Charles. You get out of here. I don't want to talk to you. Charles, what did you do? Did you go crazy? You want to know the truth? Yeah. And I feel terrific about it. You want to send me to Bellevue? Good. I'll get a little peace. Oh, you shouldn't have ruined all our things like that. You shouldn't have walked out on me. She told me you hit her. That's a lie, and you know it. She said you did. I'd better stop listening to your mother and grow up and listen to your husband once in a while. Things would have been all right. Oh, but boy, I feel good. That's, that's some way to let off steam, you know. Just throw everything right out the window. Did you ever try that? No, I can't say I did. You know, Rosalie, if your mother was up here, I'd have thrown her out the window, too. And if she'd come up here right now, I'd do it. Cops are no, no cops. That's how good I feel. All right, all right. Just settle down. I'm all right. I'm, I'm fine. Now. You don't have to worry about me, Kent. Oh, right out the window, boy. Well, Rosalie. Yes. Where are you going? Downstairs. No, no, you're my wife. You stay right here. What about mother? Well, what about her? Except that she's moving, and right now. Well, if she's moving, I ought to get her things together, don't you think? Yeah. Get them, get them together. All right, honey. I will. I will, right now. Oh, boy, I feel like a million dollars. I should have done that a long time ago, a long time ago. Well, if you had, you'd be back home with your wife now. Well, what do you mean? She's here. Yeah, she's here. But it looks as if you're going away for a while. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, what do you mean you were robbed? Did somebody hold you up? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, broken in your flat. Well, how much is missing? Yeah. Yeah. Are there any marks on the door where they got in? Yeah. Uh-huh. What's the address there? 
135 or 139. Yeah. And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's larger city is presented by the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Susan Douglas, Abby Lewis, Santos Ortega, Mandel Kramer, and Frank Campanella. Written and produced by Stanley Niss. Our Hannah speaking. Hannah speaking. Hannah speaking. Hannah speaking. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. What do you mean you were robbed? Did somebody hold you up? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, broken in your flat. Well, how much is missing? Yeah. Yeah. You are by transcription in the muster room at the twenty-first precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right. I'll send the officers over to take a look. Yes, ma'am. All right. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly, Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was working my day tour, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. At 11.30 a.m., after patrolling the precinct for two hours in sector car number two, I instructed the operator, Patrolman Coley, to drive me downtown to the 6th Division, where I had an appointment with my immediate superior, Inspector Edward McBride, who wanted to see me on an urgent matter. On arrival, I instructed Patrolman Coley to wait in the car and walked up the stairs to the division office. Captain Kennelly. Arnold, is uh, Inspector McBride in his office? No, sir, I'm sorry. He's stuck at a meeting at the borough office. Oh? And he rang up here and told me to get in touch with you, Captain. I called your desk officer. He said you were on your way. That was a couple of minutes ago. Okay. Inspector McBride said to tell you to be in touch with you by phone later on. All right. Is uh, Lieutenant Joyce around? No, sir. He's out on patrol. Well, uh, look, I'll tell you what. All right. Excuse me, Captain. Yeah, go ahead. 6th Division, patrol Arnold. Sergeant Waters at the 21st. Did Captain Kennelly get in there yet? Yes, Sergeant, he is. Hold on. Okay. See you, Captain. Oh, thanks. Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Waters, Captain. Yeah? You know that apartment house piece is in Robin's line? Yeah, just a second, Sergeant. Arnold. Yes, sir? Did you hold that typing a second? Oh, I'm sorry, Captain. Yes, Sergeant, what is it? The apartment house people's been robbing the ground out from under it. Yeah, did we get him? What do you mean? They chased him up a tree. A real tree, Captain. He's up there about 20 feet. They couldn't talk him down. I sent for the emergency truck and a ladder. Well, are they sure it's the boy who's been giving us all the trouble? Well, he had the window washer's tail and the jimmy, Captain. Couldn't be anyone else. Well, where is this? In the rear courtyard of a converted brownstone at 784 East 67th Street, Captain. I thought you might want to roll on it. I do. Thanks, Sergeant. All right, I'll, uh, I'll talk to Inspector McBride later on. Yes, sir. Will you be at the station house? Yes. As soon as we get a burglar down out of a tree. Yes, sir. I'll tell him. Huh? 
I wonder what kind of tree. I hurried downstairs out onto the street and instructed Patrolman Coley to make the run to 784 East 67th Street. If the man in the tree was, in fact, the thief we sought, he was responsible for no less than 32 daytime burglaries in the 21st Precinct alone. On each, the thief had operated in exactly the same manner. He would carry a wash pail, rags, and a chamois into an apartment building, walk upstairs ostensibly to solicit a window cleaning job. As a result, no one could carry a water pail on the street without being stopped for questioning at least once in a block. But the burglaries went on, all committed by the same man using the same double-pronged jimmy claw to force open the door. When we arrived at the East 67th Street address, two sector cars, the sergeant's car, the detective squad car, and the emergency truck were parked in the block. I walked through the ground-level hallway of the converted brownstone toward the rear courtyard. High up in the branches of the large tree in the center of the courtyard, I saw the suspect. Hello, Matt. Captain. The only tree in the precinct, Captain. He's got to find it. Well, as long as he's up in the tree, he's not going to rob any flats. Yes, sir. You got something there. He'll come down. We've got lots of time. Spread that net around here. Who jumped in, man? Jacoby and Cahill on Sector Car 4, Captain. Well, looks like you get some sleep now. Yes, sir. If we get him down out of there by night. What do you say? Are you getting hungry? You want to come down and get something to eat? No. I'm not hungry. Keep those guys away from What are you going to do? Well, he'll come down, man. I, uh, I want to talk to Jacoby. Yes, sir. Hello, Jacoby. Good work. Uh, hello, Captain. Thanks. Yeah, except I wish I got my hands on him before he hit the tree. Oh, that guy can climb like a monkey. He was way up there before he could shinny up to the first branch. Now, why don't you get some sense? What is uh, that what he was carrying? Yes, sir. Yeah, he dropped the pail in the hall there when we were shaking him through. He must have just come out of some flat, Captain. Under the chamois and the rags, there was a lady's purse in a pail. $490 in it. Oh, that's a lot of money. Yes, sir. Listen, tell me something, will you? What are you trying Any, to do? Uh, Any identification in the purse? No, sir, just the money in a plain envelope, a shoe repair ticket, and a sales slip from a hardware store on 3rd Avenue. No name on anything. Well, that won't be any trouble, Jacoby. Anybody missing $490 is going to let us know about it. All right, all right. Take it easy. Take it easy. How'd you happen to jump in? Well, sir, I was writing his recorder with Cahill. We turned into 67th Street, and I saw this guy walking down the street carrying a pail and with this, this jimmy stuck in his belt. Mm -hmm. well, I said to Kale, I said, there's another window washer, so he said, let's go over what and talk. What do you say? Are you tired of sitting up there? You want to come down? Captain, we stopped the car. Uh, just a second. Come on down. We're not going to play games with you all day. I'm not coming down. You keep those guys away from me. Keep them away. That's all. Yes, Scooby. Well, as soon as the boys spotted the car stopping and me in the uniform, he took off. He ran down the block, the pail trailing behind him, and me after him, and Cahill after me. Mm -hmm. So he ran into this building. There was a woman taking a baby carriage out the front door. I lost a little ground because the lady in the buggy were blocking my way by this time. Anyway, he ran straight through the hall and out the back. Uh -huh. The only place he could go was up the tree. That's where he went. I almost got hold of his foot, but he, he threw the jimmy at me and hit me across the arm. I pulled back, and by the time I reached for him again, he got the toehold on the first branch. Yeah, Good idea. Okay, Lieutenant. Well, then Cahill came on through with the pail, and we tried to talk him down out of the tree, but he wouldn't come, so Cahill went back out to the car and called in for help. That's about it, Captain. Uh -huh. Good work, Jacoby. It'll be a nice collar. Thank you, Captain. Oh, uh, hang on to that bucket. Yes. All right, run it up. You got plenty of time. Keep that out away from me. Keep that out away from me. Now, come on down. We've wasted enough time with you. Don't keep away from me. He's on a fire. Those branches are getting awfully thin up there, man. Don't climb up anymore. They're not going to hold you. Keep away from me. Down off and then you'll fall. Let them go. Don't go after them. Stay off, Ellen. Stay off. Watch it. Get back. Grab hold. Grab hold. Okay. Here he comes. Brother. Jacoby. 
Bring in for an ambulance. Yes, sir. All right. Step back here. Well, Captain, this is one way to catch a burglar. Within a few minutes, the ambulance arrived, and the burglar, who was identified as Alvin Board through cards in his pockets, was taken to Metropolitan Hospital. Patrolman Jacoby was assigned to go along as a guard. Before leaving the scene, Lieutenant King instructed Detectives DeLuca and Howard to trace the owner of the purse containing $490 in cash found in the water pail. I resumed patrol, and it was not until 10 minutes after 1 that I returned to the station house. Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer, and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. Sergeant? Hello, Captain. Inspector McBride rang up for you. Oh, well, see if you can get him back while I sign the blotter. Yes, sir. Sergeant Waters. Yes, sir. Captain Kennelly to talk to Inspector McBride. The inspector is ahead now, Sergeant. He's out taking his meal. Oh. I'll leave a message for the Captain Kennelly calls. Yeah, okay. Do that. Yes, sir. You get Inspector McBride, Sergeant? No, sir. He's out for a meal. I left a message you called. Oh, okay. Captain Kennelly. Oh, hello, man. Lieutenant King. Sergeant. Well, how is he, Matt? The boy that fell out of the tree. Fractured arm and a sprained ankle, that's all. I'm going over to the hospital to talk to him now. He got off lucky, didn't he? Yeah, he sure did. Come on to my office, man. Yes, sir. Ah, sure a relief to get that boy out of our hair. You're telling me. Sit down, man. Yes, how are you doing with it, man? Not so good, Captain. Kinney and Novak are up going through his flat on East 110th Street. They just rang in. They found over $900 in cash there, but no evidence of any burglaries. Well, you got the purse he had with him. I uh, know. That's just the one case. I'd like to clear the whole string of them. That $900 he has in his room won't help me any. No, it won't. There's no fur coat or suit or watch in the place. Nothing that can be identified in any of those jobs. Get rid of that stuff fast. Well, you got one good case. Maybe when he realizes that, he'll open up about the rest of them. I well, hope so, Captain. I'm going to talk to him now. Do you want to ride over to the hospital with me? Yes, Matt. I'll go over with you. Yes, sir. Oh, in just a second. Sure. 21st Precinct, Captain Kennelly. Sergeant Waters on TS, Captain. Detective DeLuca ringing in for Lieutenant King. Okay. DeLuca for you, man. Oh, thanks. Lieutenant King. DeLuca, Lieutenant. We placed the owner of the purse through the shoe repair ticket. Mrs. Rose Brider, 792 East 67th Street. Good. Well, I don't know how good it is, Lieutenant. What do you mean? Did you see Mrs. Brighter? Yes, sir. We've seen her. She's right here. I'm calling in from her living room. Well? She denies it's her purse or her money or her anything. Is it? Well, I think so, Lieutenant, but she says no. All right. I'm going to Metropolitan Hospital. I'll stop there on the way. Wait for me. Yes, sir. Oh, what's the matter? Captain, this boy is right for 33 burglaries in this precinct alone. The way it looks, I'm going to have trouble making even one case against him. Well, that's the way it goes, Matt. Some days, it's hard to earn a dollar. With Lieutenant King, I drove to 792 East 67th Street, a tenement building that had been converted to small apartments in the middle rent bracket. We parked the car and walked to the third floor. At apartment 3D, Jimmy marks were plainly visible on both the jam and on the door itself right at the lock. This door was forced open, Captain. Yeah. And today. You know, if that $490 was mine, I'd identify it in a hurry. Oh, I know people who'd identify it, even if it wasn't there. Hello, Lieutenant. Is that Captain Kennelly? Hello, DeLuca. You see the Jimmy Marks, Lieutenant? Yeah. She's in there. Just a second. Yes, sir. What does the shoemaker say? He didn't have to say much, Lieutenant. Her name was on the other half of the ticket. The one attached to the shoes she left yesterday. Her name and address. She goes to the hardware store? We didn't have to. We got the address from the shoemaker. Well, does she still deny that the person, the money, are hers? Yes, sir. 
Well, how does she account for the Jimmy marks on the door? Well, she says she never noticed them. What do you think the story is, Lip? Beats me, Lieutenant. She just sits there and lies. All right, let's talk to her. Yes, sir. One lie after another. Howard. Lieutenant? No, okay. Captain. Howard, this is Brider. This is Lieutenant King, my commanding officer, and Captain Kennelly, commanding officer of the 21st Precinct. How do you do? Mrs. Brider. What is your first name, Mrs. Brider? Rose. You live here with Mr. Brider? Yes. What's his first name? Phil. Philip. Is he at work? Yes. Where does he work? For the Board of Education. What does he do for the Board of Education? In the office, an accountant. You live here alone, you and your husband? Yes, all alone. No children? A married daughter in the Army. She's in the Army? A whack? No, her husband's a soldier in California. She's with him. Oh, I see. Were you out of the house this morning? Yes, to 34th Street. The stores are having sales. I needed seats. What time did you come home? 12 o'clock, quarter of. Did you notice the apartment had been entered? No. Didn't you see that the door had been forced open? No. Did you notice a purse containing $490 was missing? I had my purse with me. You've got more than one purse, haven't you? Yes. The detective showed you a purse containing $490, didn't he? Yes, it's not mine. We had a receipt for a pair of shoes you left to be repaired yesterday. The shoe repairman says he knows you. He remembers you. Your name's on the other half of the ticket. I don't care. The purse is not mine. Neither is the money. Look, Mrs. Brider, I uh, don't know what makes you reluctant to identify your own property. I don't care what makes you reluctant that money in the purse of yours, I know it, and you know it. They're not mine. I've got a burglar who's been robbing us blind. He got into this apartment and 32 more the same way. I don't care what your problems are. I've got mine. I've got to keep that boy off the street, and you're going to help me do it, whether you want to or not. It's not mine. It's not. You make up your mind to tell the truth about that property, or I'm going to ask the district attorney to hold you as a material witness. You know what that means, don't you? I don't care. Well, you will care. Means you get put under bail, and if you can't make the bail, you get locked up. I'm not kidding about this, Mrs. Bright. That's the way it's going to be. Now, how about it? Is that your property? No. All right, Howard. Take her in the station house. Yes, sir. Notify her husband. No. Maybe he can help us. No, don't call my husband. He don't know anything about it. At least maybe he won't lie. Don't call him, please. All right. Want to tell me the truth? Is that your property? Is it? No. All right, Mrs. Brighton. If you're not willing to help me, I'm certainly not going out of my way to help you. Take her in, Howard. Lieutenant King, Detective DeLuca, and I left the apartment as Detective Howard prepared to take Mrs. Brighton to the station house. We drove to the Queensboro Bridge and rode halfway across to the elevator which took our car and us to Welfare Island on which Metropolitan Hospital is situated. At the hospital, we located the ward to which the suspect, Alvin Board, had been taken and walked down the long corridor toward the room. Through the open door, we could see Patrolman Jacoby seated alongside the bed. How that guy took a fall that far and wound up with only a broken arm, I'll never know. Maybe he fell on his head. An honest citizen would have been killed. All right. Let's go in. Yes, sir. Hello, Jacoby. Captain. Lieutenant King. Hi, Dr. Jacoby. How's the patient? Complaining. What's the trouble, Alvin? This is better than jail, isn't it? The doctor's giving me a hard time poking around with needles. Well, Captain, the floor nurse came and said Sergeant Waters phoned us. The message is that Inspector McBride returned your call and wants you to ring him up at the vision as soon as you get here. All right. I'll be back right away, man. Take your time, Captain. Well, Alvin, how do you feel? Lousy. That'll teach you not to climb trees. There was only one place you could go that was down. But I hoped I could sprout wings and fly away. Wings won't do you any good, Alvin. I got your cage all picked out for you. Oh, yeah. See these? Yeah. He's a squeal as you're clearing for me. 32, and the one today is 33. Who'd set him clear? I do. 
You're clearing my 33, and the squad commanders from the 17th, 19th, and 23rd are coming up here, and you'll clear about 50 or 60 more. What will it get me? A clear conscience, Albert. I don't need no clear conscience. Listen, you've been robbing us blind for six weeks. You're hooked now. Make it easy on yourself. Let me tell the district attorney you try to help me. Why should I help you? What'd you do for me? I didn't do anything for you, Alvin. You want me to pin a medal on you? Then why should I help you? Because we got you good, that's why. I don't see how you got me. All I did was fall out of trees. Ah, look, don't be a wise guy. You dropped that tail in the jimmy. There was $490 in the lady's purse and a tail. We've been up talking to the lady. There are marks on the door where you jimmied it. So? So you're hooked on that one. After taking a look at your record, no judge in his right mind would hand you less than 10 years. I don't know whether I'm hooked on anything. I'll wait and see what you got. We've got you. We've got the $490. We've got the purse. We've got the lady it belonged to. And we've got the jimmy you used to get in her door. What else do we need? Well, you must need something. If you did, you wouldn't be here talking to me. I came here to talk to you about those other 32. Well, come around again after I see what you got with the lady with the $490. If you got something, I'll talk to you, maybe. You can't blow hot and cold, Alvin. It's got to be one way or the other. For you, maybe, but not for me. Alvin, in all my life, I never met such a miserable human being. Lying there with a broken arm and a bad ankle, looking ten years straight in the face. He won't tell me the right time of day. What's in it for me? That's all I want to know. You guys come around here wanting something. I don't have to talk to you. I don't, I'm not going to. Why should I, huh? Alvin... For six weeks before I met you, I didn't like you. Because of you, I haven't spent one evening a week at home. My wife is boiling mad. My kids don't even recognize me. That's all right. For a cop, I'm a compassionate guy. Anybody that's in trouble has my sympathy. It's always been my attitude in this job. But as far as you're concerned, Alvin, I don't even feel sorry you fell out of the tree. While I was out phoning, unsuccessfully trying to reach the inspector, Lieutenant King continued to question the burglary suspect, Alvin Board, for several minutes. He got no place. When I returned, I talked to him in regard to his fall from the tree. He confirmed by a statement what I had witnessed. No police officer was near him. He stepped on a dead branch and it broke. With Lieutenant King and Detective DeLuca, I left the hospital and returned to the car. When we arrived at the station house, the detectives went straight upstairs. I signed the blotter and asked Sergeant Waters on TS to try once more to reach Inspector McBride at division. The inspector was still out on patrol. I looked over the reports and communications that had accumulated. Then I went upstairs to see what progress Lieutenant King was making toward getting a presentable case of burglary against Alvin Boyd. Yes, sir, Captain. Lieutenant King in his office? Yes, sir. He's talking with our Mrs. Bryder. Go right in. Thanks. Well, where was it stolen? Yeah? 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 Captain Canale. Come in, Captain. Yeah, I understand. Captain? You remember Mrs. Bryder? Yes. She doesn't believe the court will detain her as a material witness if she continues to be uncooperative. You still say that purse and the $490 don't belong to you, Mrs. Bryder? They don't. I said it and I say it again, they don't. I think it's quite obvious that they do, Mrs. Bryder. No, they don't. Also, it must be a pretty serious matter that's making you deny ownership of nearly $500. I'm sure you don't like the idea of losing $500 any more than the next person. It's not mine. What are you going to do? Is your husband on the way, Mrs. Bryder? Yes, he's coming. Well, I'm sure that he'll take one look at the purse and the pair of shoes at the shoemaker and recognize them as yours. Is your husband involved in this in any way? No. Are you trying to conceal the fact from him that you had nearly $500 in your pocketbook? Is that the trouble? Well, he'll know it as soon as he gets here, Mrs. Bryder. Because that's the first thing Lieutenant King is going to tell him. Isn't that right, Matt? Yes, sir. Now, if you tell us what the trouble is, why you deny the purse so the money is yours, maybe we can help you. You know, we get a lot of people in here with all kinds of troubles. 
And usually things work out all right. You didn't want your husband to know about the money. Isn't that right? Yes. I didn't want him to know. Well, didn't you think he'd find out? I didn't think so. I cashed some war bonds. They were in my name from when I was working during the war. It was your money, wasn't it? Why couldn't your husband know about it? He'd leave me. He'd know what it was for. He'd walk right out of the house. He said he would. He said he would over and over. That's because you took your own money? It was to send my daughter in California. Oh. She's pregnant. She's going to have a baby and he don't know. Why not? She's only 18. She was 17 when she ran away and got married to the soldier. Phil was mad. He was so mad. He said if I ever wrote to her, send her money or anything, he'd leave. He'd walk right out, right out of the house. He doesn't know he's going to be a grandfather? No. Where did you cash the bond? At the bank yesterday. Why didn't you get a check? I should have. I know I should have. I didn't think of it. I was going to the post office this afternoon to buy money orders. When I came home, I saw that the door was broken. I ran in the bedroom and the drawer was open. My other purse was gone. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know why. I don't want him to go. I don't want him to leave without him. I got nothing. I decided not to say anything. I made up my mind. Yes, the Luca, Lieutenant. Come in. Mr. Brider is here. All right, ask him to come in. Yes, sir. Mr. Brider, the Lieutenant wants to see you. Let me tell him. Let me tell him myself. All right, if you want. In there, Mr. Brider. Oh, what's the matter? What's the trouble? Philip, you're going to be a grandfather. Me? Adele is going to have a baby. That's the trouble you're in? That, that's why you're at the police station? That's... That's wonderful. You're glad. Well, why didn't you tell me? What did you wait for? I thought, you know what you said. I was afraid. Well, as soon as I said it, I was sorry as soon as I said it. Every time. When, where, how is she? In California. Oh, you should have told me sooner. A baby. A grandbaby. Come in. Captain Canelli, Inspector McBride is ringing up here for you. Oh, all right. Yeah, but why are you here? Well, let's take it out here, Captain. Yeah, sure. I want why? Why? Well, Phil, so I... Oh, uh, excuse me. But there's nothing wrong. You, you, you're sure there's nothing wrong? Take it on that expansion, Captain. 21st Precinct, Captain Canelli. Sergeant Waters, Captain. I'm sorry the inspector rang in for you. But his man down there got on the phone and said the inspector just had a call from the chief and left to go downtown. Okay. He said he'd call you back at the first opportunity. Yeah. All right, Sergeant. Thanks. Well, everything's okay in there, Captain. I guess my trouble's over. You're lucky, Matt. I can't even find out what my troubles are. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah. What kind of a bomb? Oh, wait a minute. Just a second. Take it easy. In the art gallery where? Yeah. 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 How'd you find a bomb? Oh, I see. Yeah. Well, how many people? Yeah. And so it goes. All right. Around the clock. I through the week. Every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Kennelly, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Errol Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Martin Blaine, Ethel Everett, Frank Moss, Larry Haynes, and William Johnstone. Written and produced by Stanley Niss. Art Hannah speaking. Oh, the captain's out on patrol. Uh, yes, sir, Lieutenant Joyce. Lieutenant Joyce in the Chief Inspector's office. No, sir, he didn't say when he'd be back. I can put out a call for him. 
You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, Lieutenant. I'll tell him. Yes, sir. As soon as he gets back in the house. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st, 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants of whom I'm the boss. My name is Kennelly. Frank Kennelly. I'm captain in command of the 21st. I was doing day duty, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. The morning was a quiet one in the precinct, and I spent a good part of it cleaning up accumulated paperwork, reading and signing reports and communications. Shortly before noon, I met with the precinct youth patrolman, Ezra D. Winkler, in regard to plans for juvenile recreation activity that we would discuss with the precinct coordinating council, which is composed of community-minded persons who reside or conduct their businesses in the precinct. After I had my meal, a car came by the house for me, and I went out on patrol. At 3.25 p.m., while I was still away from the house, Lieutenant Gorman was on duty in the muster room as desk officer, and the telephone switchboard was manned by Sergeant Waters. My first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah? Who told you that? No, lady. You have to apply to the Department of Licenses. 112 White Street. Like the color. W-H-I-T-E. You want the telephone number? That's worth four, eight, six hundred. Yes, ma'am. It's all right. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Show me the inspector down there, huh? Yes, sir. Hello? This is Lieutenant Gorman. Let me talk to Lieutenant King. All right, I'll hold on. Uh, Lieutenant. Yes. How about that notification in the 44th? You want me to ring up there again? No, wait a while. He said they'd keep trying until they found somebody home. Okay. Yes, sir. Hello, Matt. Uh, listen, you owe me a plot to 51. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Are you the one I see? Uh, just a second, lady. Okay, Matt. Lieutenant will be with I'll you. I'll see you. Yeah. You can talk to him now. Yes, ma'am? I had my car parked for just two minutes over on Lexington Avenue while I took a dress back to a store, and the policeman gave me a ticket. It, it was just for two minutes, that's all. The sign says no parking. Doesn't say you can park for two minutes, lady. Well, he could have had the decency to realize, couldn't he? The sign says no parking. That's what it means. It was just for two minutes. Well, I think that's a lot of nerve. After all, how was I going to get into the store if I didn't park there? Lady, you parked in a restricted zone and you got a summons. There's nothing I can do about it. If you want to argue, I'd suggest you appear in court and talk to the magistrate. Well, what good will that do? You can do a lot more for you than I can. I can't do a thing. I don't know. It's getting so it's not a free country anymore. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Sergeant? Yes, sir? I'll speak if you want it. When Coley rings in, I want to talk to him. Yes, sir. And I want you to see it. Go ahead. Take the call. Okay. Twenty-first precinct, Sergeant Waters. No, sir, he's not. He's out on patrol. Lieutenant Joyce, Chief Inspector's office. Uh, yes, sir. I expect him in any minute. He's got to turn out the platoon at four. Well, I uh, I can put out a radio call for him. All right. Yes, sir. By the way. The Chief Inspector's office. Yes, sir. Lieutenant Joyce there wants to skip it a call. You better put it out on the air. Yes, sir. Hello, CB. Sergeant Waters is at 21st. Would you have 681 call at 21st? Okay. A message to call the chief inspector's office direct. You don't think the skip is getting made, do you, Lieutenant? No, sir, I know. I haven't heard anything about any promotions coming up. 
not impossible for them to make promotions without you hearing about it. No. I don't know about that. Here are sixty ones, Red. Oh, thanks, man. Uh, Lieutenant King, did you hear anything about any promotions? Yeah, I think I did hear something at the lineup this morning. We're supposed to be making a couple of captains and about ten lieutenants this week. Are they making any deputy inspectors? Why? It was just a message to Captain Kennelly to call the chief inspector's office. Well, well, could be. How about you, Red? Where are you on the captain's list? Way down. Oh, well, here's Captain Kennelly. We were just around the corner when the call came over. Hello, Red. Captain. A message for you to call Lieutenant Joyce at the chief inspector's office, Captain. Oh, yeah? Uh, as soon as I signed the blotter. Did you hear anything about any promotions, Captain? No, Matt. I didn't hear a thing. Uh, Lieutenant Joyce? Yes, sir. Uh, get him on the line for me, will you? Yes, sir. Right away, Captain. You want to see me, Matt? I can wait, Captain. What's doing, Red? Hello, Very quiet, Captain. Well, that's Chief good. Will you be around for a minute, Matt? Yes, sir. Uh, Sergeant, I'll take the call in my office. Yes, sir. Twenty first precinct, Captain Canelli. Lieutenant Joyce on the line, Captain. All right. Chief Inspector's office, Lieutenant Joyce. Twenty first precinct, Captain Canelli. Thank you, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Goodbye. Yeah. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Give me a line on here, Sergeant. tomorrow morning. You and the kids will be there. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Yeah. It sure took a long time. You know where you're going to be? No. No, not yet, honey. When will you find out? Tomorrow. You think it might be hot and green? Well, that would be fine if it's close to home. You wouldn't lose so much time traveling. Well, it may be, Ellen. I can't tell yet. Well, I hope so. Whatever the job is, the money's a lot better. Eight hundred and twenty dollars more, eight thousand and fifty. You don't sound very happy about it, Fred. Oh, I'm happy about the rank and the money. I, I just hate losing a command. That's all, especially this one. Well, don't worry, you'll get another one, Fred. You have to buy new uniforms again. No, no, the uniforms are the same, except the cap, just new insignia. If you want to, yeah. But uh, don't call my brother. I I'd like to tell him myself. I'll call him when I get home. Oh, what time do you think? Oh, about 7 o'clock, if I don't get stuck. Don't get stuck here, please. All right. I'll try not to. Bye, honey. Bye, Inspector. I love you. Yeah, me too. Waiting to see me, Matt? Uh, well, yeah, Captain. I just thought if you had a few minutes, we could talk about some of those pistol license applications. Well, why don't you save them and talk to the new captain? Oh, you're getting made. Yeah. Congratulations, Captain. Oh, uh, thanks, Red. 
All the luck in the world, Captain. Not thanks. You got me, huh, Captain? Our skipper? Yeah. Congratulations. Thanks, Sergeant. When's it affecting? Swearing in is at 10 a.m. tomorrow. I understand they're making some captains and lieutenants, too. Did you hear anything about that, Captain? No, not a word, man. Well, do you know what your new job's going to be? No. You don't have any idea who we're going to get around here, do you? Sergeant, I don't know a thing except that I was instructed to report at 10 a.m. tomorrow for promotion. You want to come into my office, man? Yes, sir. Where are you on the captain's list tonight? <laughs> Nowhere near the top. Go ahead. Thanks. Huh. Sit down, man. Yes, sir. Well, I sure hate to see you go, Captain. Yeah. No, I'm not too happy about leaving myself. The best I can hope for is to be the second man in the division. Yeah. You fight to get to the top of the list, and they promote you, and you're scratching around at the bottom again. There's no chance of you're going back into the detective division, is there? No, I doubt it. It could be you were a squad commander before the major captain. Yeah, but you know all the deputy jobs in the Bureau of Field. Yes, sir, I know. Your wife happy? Yeah, yeah, I called her. She's pretty pleased. That's good. In case you know what job you'd like and where. Yeah, I know, man, but there's no use saying. I've got no chance of getting it. Well, I... I can tell you this, Captain. I know the men around this command will be pretty sorry to see you go. I think that applies to everybody. Matt, if they're sorry to see me go, that's the best send-off I could ask for. When I turned out the platoon for the night tour at 4 p.m., I told the men that it would be the last time I spoke to them as their commanding officer. After the turnout, I went into the back room where I shook hands with the men of the 8 to 4 platoon who were just coming off the job. At 6 p.m., I changed to civilian clothes and packed my uniform into a suit box Patrolman Bailey, the station house attendant, had found in the locker room. I signed the blotter and left the station house. The next morning, with my wife, my son, and my two daughters, I drove to police headquarters at 240 Center Street in downtown Manhattan. While my family went upstairs to the trial room where the promotion ceremonies would be held, I reported to the chief inspector's office as directed. There I saw the 17 other men, patrolmen, sergeants, and lieutenants, who were to be promoted. I learned that I was the only officer with the rank of captain or above to be promoted. The chief inspector, the highest-ranking member of the force, spoke to us briefly in his office, and then we proceeded to the trial room for the formal ceremonies, which were presided over by the police commissioner. After we were sworn in by the chief clerk of the department, I took my family out to lunch at one of the several fine Italian restaurants in downtown New York. Meanwhile, back at the station house, Lieutenant Gorman was in charge as desk officer, and Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right. You'll take your meal now, huh? Or where you be? Yeah. Okay. Well, Lieutenant, I guess the skipper has that oak leaf pinned on it by now. Yeah. We could do a lot worse, you know that. An awful lot worse. I know. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Uh, no, Lieutenant King, nothing yet. Uh, no, sir. No, there hasn't been anything on the teletype for an hour. Yeah, I'll let you know. Yes, sir. As soon as it comes over. <laughs> Lieutenant King, he wants to know if we heard where the skipper was transferred to and who the new boss is going to be here. No, 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 no. What do you got there, pal? Willie Sutton, Jr., no. Sergeant. No, 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 no. Yeah, step right up to the rail there. No, I, I do nothing. Uh, what do you want? I, I do what nothing. Do got, no, pal? I do nothing. Thief, Lieutenant. No, no thief. I, I don't stole nothing in my life. No, I saw him coming down the block trying the doors of the cars. Oh. Found one that wasn't locked, reached inside, and took this package out. No, he, he, that's mine. I had it with me all the time. Yeah? See? What did you ever buy in Texas Avenue? I, I buy there all the time. It's your second home, huh? You know the name of the owner of the car file? Well, I got the registration number, Lieutenant. I left a note in the car for him to come to the station house that we got his property. No, no, I know lie. The, the package, 
He, he belonged to me. They wouldn't even let you inside Saks Fifth Avenue. What's his name? Uh, Ole Lagner, he says. No, he's mine. I just come from, from shopping. Yeah? Huh? What's in the package? What did you buy? Uh, uh, different things. Take him up to the detective. No, no, no detective. Come on, let's no. go, Ali. No, 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 no. Oh, uh, do we know who the new skipper's going to be at, Lieutenant? No, not yet. Oh. Go on, Ali. No, I don't suppose. Not I don't well, that might might turn out to be a pretty good color, Lieutenant. Yeah. Could be the boy who's been robbing us blind. There it is. Yeah. Special orders, that's it. The skip is on the top of the list. The following captain, having been promoted to deputy inspector, is transferred and assigned as indicated to take effect at 4 p.m. today. Francis J. Kennelly from the 21st Precinct to Manhattan West Borough Headquarters. Well, that's that. Manhattan West Borough Headquarters, that's not bad. Better for him than a division, I think. At least he's there with a high brass to see him around. It could be a good job. Ah, uh, get it. Yes, sir. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Well, they're coming through right now, Lieutenant King. Manhattan West Borough Headquarters. Yes, sir. Could be. Well, that's all that's come through so far. No, sir, we don't know yet. They didn't get to the transfers yet. All right. Yes, sir. Lieutenant King, he's coming downstairs. Oh, uh, how many lieutenants did they make, Lieutenant? Six and two captains. Do you know any of them? No. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven sergeants. Eight. There's a transfer. It ought to be fresh. The following transfer is hereby ordered to take effect at 4 p.m. today. Captain Vincent... Keith Cronin from the 17th Division to 21st Precinct. You ever hear of him, Lieutenant? No. Vincent P. Cronin. Well, we don't know him. I suppose we'll get there, huh? I don't doubt it. Oh, here's Lieutenant King. Well, who'd you get, Red? Vincent P. Cronin, 17th Division. You know him, huh? No. You ever hear of him? No. Excuse me. Well, it'll have to be something to make up for what we're losing. Yeah. Let's see the promotions, huh? Yeah. No, Captain Kennelly isn't here. And it's Deputy Inspector Kennelly now. <laughs> Don't know a soul on it. Neither do I. Well, we, we move up a couple of notches on the list, Red. Yes, sir. Well, we've got to move okay. faster than that. Yes, sir. He'll be coming back here, won't he, Inspector Kennelly? Oh, yeah, he's got an office full of personal belongings. Have you decided what kind of a guy this new skipper is? I've got a good friend, a squad commander out there in that division in Brooklyn. Maybe he knows him. I could ring him up. I'm sure, Matt. Why not? Give Lieutenant King a line, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Right away. I don't know how much good it'll do us to know, but I'm anxious to find out. Oh, so am I. You must have been in plain clothes work in that division, huh? You must have been, yeah. Hello. Lieutenant Ziegler there. Lieutenant King, 21st Squad. All right. He's there. Good. I was in the academy with a Cronin, I think. But I think it was Paul Cronin. Hello, Danny. Matt King. All right, it's fine. Oh, it's pretty quiet. How are things out there? Yeah, that's good. Listen, Danny, the precinct commander here got made a deputy inspector today. Yeah, that's right, Frank Kennelly. We're getting a captain from the 17th Division, uh, Vincent Cronin. Yeah, I know you do. That's why I called. The boys around here are kind of anxious to know what to expect. Huh? He is, huh? Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Maybe it would have been better to be surprised. Maybe. He what? Oh, yeah? Well, how is he working with the detectives? Hmm. I see. Well, thanks, Danny. Oh, she's fine. Martha? 
Good. Let's get together and cut up some scores. Okay, I'll see you, Danny. Uh, wait a minute, I'll be right back. He's not on plain clothes, dude. He's been a fly captain out there. What'd you say he was, Lieutenant? He's been a fly captain in the division out there. Oh. Did you say what kind of a guy he was? He works hard and he earns his pay. That's good. And so are you. After I finished lunch with my family, I drove them home to my residence in Ozone Park, Queens. I went into the house and got a suitcase out of the closet to bring into New York in order to pack my personal effects at the station house and take them to my new command. A precinct commander's night tours call for him to be on the job for 16 hours, and his office becomes a second home. When he's transferred, an accumulation of extra uniforms, toilet articles, and other personal effects must be packed and moved. I was about to go out the door when some neighbors dropped in to congratulate me, and consequently it was not until after 2 p.m. that I was able to start for New York. While I was driving in, a tall, well-built man in civilian clothes walked in the front door of the station house and headed for the desk. Yes, sir? Can I help you? I'm Captain Cronin. Oh, hello, Captain. Lieutenant Gorman. Lieutenant? I'll uh, come around and sign the blotter. Yes, sir. Here you are, sir. That's all right. I'll use my own pen. Yes, sir. All right. Let me know. What time do these special orders come through, Lieutenant? About 12.15, Captain. I gave Cahill that complaint, Lieutenant. Okay. Captain Cronin, Sergeant Waters. Captain? Glad to know you, Sergeant. I uh, want someone to help me get some things out of my car, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. The fowl's in the back room, Lieutenant. All right, get them, will you? Okay, Lieutenant. Inspector Kennelly still has most of his things in your office, Captain. Will he be in this afternoon? Uh, yes, sir. We expect him. All right. I believe he's on his way. Who are the other lieutenants attached to this command? There's John Bryan, Gerald E. Pope, and Harry Snyder. Snyder. Was uh, Snyder a sergeant in the 83rd? Yes, sir. And I think I know him. Captain, this is Patrolman Farrell, Captain Cronin. Farrell? Well, good to meet you, Captain. My car's parked out front, Farrell. Blue 52 Dodge, two yes, doors. Sir. The tan suitcase, a cardboard box in the back seat. Would you bring him in here? I'll get the rest later. Sure, Captain. Oh, uh, wait a minute. I'll go with him. Yes, sir. We'll be right back. Yes, sir. Well, what do you think? I should honor what I think. He looks tough to me. Well, that was the word, wasn't it? So don't be surprised. I'm not surprised, Lieutenant. I'm just curious. Take the call. Yes, sir. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. All right, 11. Oh, uh, listen. Be on your toes now. The new skipper's on a job. All right. Sergeant. Yes, sir? Bring upstairs to the detective. Tell Lieutenant King. Yes, sir. This is Sergeant Waters on TS. Let me talk to Lieutenant King. Oh, he is? All right. When you get a chance, will you tell him the new skipper is in the house? All right. Yeah. <laughs> Lieutenant King is talking to a suspect. Goldman says he'll tell him as soon as he gets a chance. Okay. Uh, Sergeant, would you give us a hand? May I get the door to the office? Oh, uh, yes, sir. Oh, I can take that, Captain. That's all right. Just open the door. Yes, sir. Go ahead, Powell. Yes, sir. Just set it down any place. Yes, sir. I won't put anything away until Inspector Canale gets his things cleaned out. Uh, open a window, will you, Sergeant? Yeah, sure, Captain. Thanks, Farrell. That's all. You're welcome, Captain. Glad to have met you. Yeah. Inspector Canale has the only key to his desk in the closet. All right. Oh, uh, there he is. Hello, Sergeant. Hello, Captain. Oh, I'm sorry, Inspector. That's all right. I'm not accustomed to it myself. Uh, Deputy Inspector Kennelly, Captain Cronin. Cronin? Let him eat, Inspector. Well, uh, I better get back on the board. Now go ahead and uh, close the door, Sergeant. Yes. Well, I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to clean my things out before you got here. That's well, all right. Don't worry about it, Inspector. It's been a pretty busy day mm -hmm. for both of us. That's well, a pretty nice office. Yeah, it's 
comfortable and big enough. Uh, sit down, Crony. Yes, sir. You'll find this a pretty busy shop. So I heard. For the most part, we've got a good bunch of men in this command. They work hard. They're interested in the job. That's good. There are a few I've had to watch. If you'd like to know about them, I'll be glad to tell you. No, sir. I'd rather you didn't tell me. I'd rather find out for myself. Sure. That's usually the best way. Go ahead, Captain. Take it. You're command now. Yeah. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Captain Cronin. Sergeant Ward is on CS, Captain. Yes? CB called with a report of an armed robbery and shooting. 71st election. All right. Have a car come by the house for me. I'll roll. Yes, sir. Armed robbery and shooting. 71st in Lexington. Well, you're off to a fast start. I guess I am. Oh, I'll uh, leave the keys to the closet on the desk with Lieutenant Gorman. Yes, sir. Is that all you've got on that, Sergeant? It's all CB had. Uh, your car's on the way, Captain. Anything more on that 70 person, Lex? Nothing, Lieutenant. Matt? We've got a job, Captain. Yeah, I know. This is Captain Cronin, Lieutenant King, the squad commander. Lieutenant? Hi. Right. I'll be out in the car in a minute. Go on. Okay. We'll get together later, eh, Captain? Yeah, sure. Oh, well, uh, if you're going over there, I'll ride with you, okay? Yes, sir. Glad to have you. I'll ride with the detective, Sergeant. Cancel my car. Yes, sir. Are well, you going to roll on that, Inspector? No, I... I don't think so. I'll, I'll just go and get my stuff together. Yes, sir. But, uh, Lieutenant... Yes, sir? Let me know what there is to it. When he first precinct, Sergeant Waters. Yeah. Yeah. Who is it? His wife? He didn't know with what? Oh, yeah? All right. I'll send the officers right over there. Do you live in a building there, too? And so it goes. Sure. Around the clock, through the week, every the day, right every over. year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct, transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, City of New York. Everett Sloan in the role of Captain Ganelli, James Gregory as Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Ralph Camargo, Santos Ortega, Frank Moss, and Ethel Everett. Written and produced by Stanley Niss. Art Hanna speaking. First precinct, Sergeant Waters. Who's dead? Who? Well, she was killed? How? Where is it? Where? What's the address on You are by transcription in the muster yeah. room of the 21st precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right. Just stay right where you are. The officer will be right there. Yes, right away. They'll take care of it. Yeah. Right away. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. 
My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I am captain in command of the 21st. I was doing day duty, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. When I arrived at the station house, I signed the blotter, read over the reports and communications that had accumulated since I went off duty 24 hours previously. Sharply at 8, I walked into the muster room, turned out the platoon for the day tour. As the men marched out the door to take over their posts, Sergeant Rosen, the patrol sergeant, indicated he wanted to see me. I came around from behind the desk where Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer. And Sergeant Waters was on telephone switchboard duty. Crossed to my office where Sergeant Rosen was waiting inside. Sergeant, that was a pretty sloppy turnout. Was it, Captain? You know it was. Now, I want the men turned out in a military manner. Get some snap into them. Yes, sir, I will. Uh, what is it you want to see me about? It's about Bradley and Warren, Captain. Mm -hmm. Bradley went sick today. Saw it on the roll call. Yes, sir. And what about them? Well, they've been riding together in sector car two. Bradley is operator, Warren is recorder. Yes. I noticed they hadn't been getting along so well together. Always scrapping about who's going to take what change and so forth. No complaints to me from either of them, but I could see what was going on. I warned them they'd better knock off or I'd talk to you about splitting them up. That didn't stop them. They were still scrapping yesterday. Well, what about Warren? Is he on the job today? No, sir, he's swinging. All right. Next time you get them together, bring them in here. I'll have a talk with him. Okay, Captain. <clears throat> 21st precinct, Captain Cronin. Sergeant Waters on TS, Captain. Looks like we got a bad homicide. Where? 695 Park Avenue. The board's jammed up, Captain. All right, I'll be right out. We got a homicide, 695 Park Avenue. Better get over there. Oh, wait for me. I'll ride with you. Yes, sir. You hold on a minute. I got to take another call. Go oh, in a second, Captain. 21st Precinct. No, we don't have any information on that yet. We don't even know the name. That's right, 695 Park. Well, that's all we know about it. The call came through CB. I caught it on the air. Okay. I'm sorry, Captain. That's all right. What do we got? He came over the air. There's signal 32, ambulance responding. I rang down a CB, and they told me a woman called in. A maid, apparently. He got to work this morning and found the lady's body. Homicide, for sure? Well, she was a little hysterical, and that's what they gathered. No name? No, sir, not yet. You uh, notified the detectives? Uh, yes, sir, just now. Uh, that's the press again. They've been burning in here since the call was put out. 695 Park, that's a good address. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Let's roll, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Look, you know as much about it as we do. The call didn't even come through here. The detectives are just on their way. With Sergeant Rosen and his operator, Patrolman McKenna, I went to the scene of the reported homicide. One of the sector men had been posted at the front door of the apartment house to keep the curious out of the entrance hall. He told us the occurrence did, in fact, appear to be homicide. We went inside and took the elevator to the third floor. The door to the apartment was standing wide open. The place was magnificently furnished. There were thick wall-to-wall -wall carpets. On instructions from me, Sergeant Rosen ordered one of the men to post himself at the front door to the apartment. Another was given instructions to man the elevator to keep the other tenants off the floor. The third to join his partner at the building entrance and admit to the building only authorized persons. I went over to talk to the maid who sat on the living room couch. She still wore the same hat she had on when she'd arrived at work. Poor Miss Edith. Poor Miss Edith. I'm Captain Cronin. She was so beautiful. So beautiful. To walk in the bedroom like that and find her sprawled out. Cold. Did uh, you call the police? Yes, sir, I called the police. When I first opened the door of the apartment, I knew there was something the matter. I knew it. The television was on, the newspapers and glasses were all over the front room, and the ashtrays were full up. Miss Edith never left anything like that. Well, it looks pretty straightened up in here now. Yes, sir, I turned off the television and picked up a little. Then I went back to the kitchen. That's when I saw. The minute I saw, I knew it. Laid on the floor there in the bedroom, just stretched out. That yellow hair she had all turned every way. She always had it so neat. So neat, mister. What's your name? My name? Yes. Alberta. Alberta Dalton. D-A-L-T-O-N? No, sir, with an O. My family spells it with an O. <laughs> Head back in like that. 
Who could do something like that to me, either? She never hurt nobody in the world. Never nobody in the world. She cried the night. Where do you live, Alberta? 134th Street. Where on 134th Street? 406 West. Poor me, Edith. Excuse me, Captain. Poor oh, sweet little thing. Yes? Never hurt The ambulance crew is here. Never. Is there a surgeon with him? Oh, no, dear, just good. Keep All right, take him back there. Yes, sir. <laughs> Her name was Edith Campton? Yes, sir. Edith Campton, yes, sir. Does she have any family? No, sir. No family. At least not in New York. She comes from Texas. She got brothers in Texas, too, I think. Poor, sweet little girl. So sweet. Well, she must have been pretty well off to live in an apartment like this. Did she uh, live here alone? Yes, sir. All alone. She wasn't married? No, sir. Was she ever married? No, sir. That was so me. Did she go to business? Uh, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you know, did she have a job or anything like that? Oh, no, sir. Not Miss Edith. Well, what did she do? She had a friend, Captain. Hello, Captain. Oh, hello, man. Alberta. Alberta, this is Lieutenant King. He's in charge of the detectives who will take over this case. Yes, sir. Now, you tell him everything he wants to know, huh? Yes, sir. Poor Miss Edith. I don't know what I'm going to do without her. I couldn't work for nobody else. Nobody else. Where is the Captain in there? Yeah. Let's take a look. You sit here, Alberta, all right? Yes, sir. It's all right. I'm not going no place. What do you think the rent is on this place, Captain? Four or five hundred a month? Something like that, I guess. Pretty steep. Yeah. Yeah, pretty steep. Oh, that uh, watcher here in the hallway, those those two books laying on the floor. Just like that. Mm. Looks like someone threw them here, huh? Threw them pretty hard. They hit the wall, I guess. Mm-hmm. Well, let's leave them lay for now. Yeah, I'm here, man. Lieutenant King? Hi. Sergeant. Mm. Pretty dress she was wearing. Not torn. She wasn't struggling with anyone. No, it doesn't appear that way. That's what she was hit with, I guess. What is it, do you think? Mm, I don't know. Looks like a fire tool to me. Mm. Who was she? What'd she do, do you know? She didn't do anything. She had a friend. No. Well, the tabloids are going to have a field day with this one. Made to order for them. It sure is. Has all the elements. A mystery, a blonde, and pocket. That's her. Too bad she's not around to read about it. The call had come in at 11 minutes after 8 a.m. It was now 8.32. At the moment, little more was known about the case than what we could see. A striking blonde named Edith Campton was dead from a blow across the base of the skull in her bedroom of a Park Avenue apartment. Within minutes, the apartment began to fill up with the police department specialists and experts. Detectives from the Manhattan East Homicide Squad arrived to work with detectives from the 21st Squad. As required, the Chief Medical Examiner's Office and the New York County District Attorney's Office were notified. Latent fingerprint experts from BCI and a photographer were summoned. Superior officers of the detective division, who had been notified in accordance with the manual of procedure, began to arrive on the scene. At ten minutes after nine, when I left the apartment, the investigation was well underway. On the street, a considerable crowd had gathered. The press was out in force. I suggested they direct their questions to the chief of detectives, the commander of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad, and the assistant district attorney. At 25 minutes after 9 o'clock, I returned to the station house where I signed the blotter and walked over to the switchboard. Sergeant. Excuse me. This board has been humming. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Chief who? Oh, uh, uh, he's not here. I haven't seen him. Uh, but just a second. Uh, Captain, it's the borough commander's office. Did you see Deputy Chief Wilkes this morning? He was over at the scene of that homicide. Hello? He was over at the scene of that homicide we had. Is he still there, Captain? He was there when I left. He was there when Captain Cronin left. All right. Call his office. I'll tell him. Yeah. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. Oh, listen. Somebody called in here and said there was a traffic station in the second floor hall at 622 East 64th. Well, how should I know? Some drunk must have carried it in there during the night. Walk over there and take a look. Yeah. All right. How should I know how the stanchion got in the hall? 
How does this uh, homicide look, Captain? Pretty heavy, Sergeant. It's all we need around here now. Another Rubenstein case. Now, what else is doing, Sergeant? A car struck a pedestrian on Lexington Avenue in 60th. Man. Man got up and walked away from it. Then he decided his back hurt. He went into Metropolitan. Did we hold the driver? I know, sir. The man walked out from between two parked cars and ran into the side of an automobile. 21st Precinct, Sergeant Waters. The detectives are all out. Can I help you? Well, that's what the detectives are all out on, that homicide. No, I don't know anything more about it. Okay. You're welcome. Some guy from the channel. Yeah, you'll have that all day, Sergeant. You might as well be ready for it. I know. Well, what's it look like, Captain? Hmm? What do you mean? Any idea who killed her? Well, they just started looking into it when I left. Oh. Well, how was she killed? With a, a fire tool, apparently. Well, uh, Sergeant, what time have you got Farrell and Eisman down for their meals? Twelve to one for Eisman and one to two for Farrell, Captain. Well, uh, switch them around because I'll want the car at one to take me down to the division. Yes, sir. Let Eisman take his meal at one and put him on a fixer until Farrell gets back with the car. Yes, sir. Uh, she was supposed to be a pretty good-looking babe, Captain. I imagine she was. Uh, one of those fellas in the press told me she won a beauty contest in Texas seven or eight years ago. Uh, that's how she first happened to come to New York. The judges picked her unanimously. The Texas Venus, they called her. Hmm. I wonder what the judges would have said if they'd seen her this morning. Back to 21st Precinct and Captain Cronin. Homicide is, of course, the most serious crime in the books. But it's not very often that detectives are called upon to deal with a murder mystery typical of detective fiction, in which the guilty party must be singled out from a, num a number of well-known suspects. Nearly all homicides fall into two other categories. Either they're crimes committed in the heat of passion, with the killer readily identifiable and easily apprehended, perhaps within minutes after the act. Or they are felony murders, committed during the course of robbery, burglary, arson, or rape, in which case the killer seldom had any previous connection with the victim. In the case at hand, there was an element of mystery. At 20 minutes past 10 a.m., I'd finished reading and signing reports and communications. I put them in the letter tray to be picked up by the precinct messenger who would take them to division headquarters for distribution. Then I sat at my desk reading the latest amendments to the manual of procedure concerning complaints against members of the department by civilians. 21st Precinct, Captain Cronin. Sergeant Waters out there, yes, Captain. Uh, Joe Duttweiler of the news is out here. He wants to see him. About what? About what? About the homicide, Captain. I'll tell him I don't know anything about it. You ought to talk to the detective. Yes, sir. Captain says he doesn't know anything about it. Talk to the detective. Uh, just a second. He wants to see you anyway, Captain. All right. Tell him to come on in. Yes, sir. Go on in. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Who's on post number six? Singleton, Captain. All right. When he rings in, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Come in. Uh, tell him I got a written complaint from a citizen. Hello, Captain. Hi, Joe. A uh, peddler selling fruits and vegetables from a wagon over there. Tell him if he runs across the peddler to check him, see if his license is okay. Yes, sir. Sit down, Joe. Well, this is pretty neat, Vince. Yeah. How do you like having your own command? Oh, I don't know yet. Haven't been on the job that long. Now, you're off to a good start. Your men think you're the toughest thing that walks. Do they? Mm -hmm. So you better be good to me or I'll let them know you've got a heart of gold from way back. Just don't mention from how far back, Joe. <laughs> I won't. Big doings up here today, Captain. Well, I can't tell you anything about it, Joe. I don't know anything. I was only there for a few minutes this morning. Mm -hmm. What would the apartment look like upstairs? Plush? Yeah, yeah, it was plush, if you want to call it that. But look, you better talk to Lieutenant King or the Chief of Detectives or the Homicide Captain. They got it all over there. We don't know anything here. Look, Vince, I got tired of waiting out there in the street. I saw all the big brass going in and none of them coming out. You know, you get awful tired standing around, first on one foot and then on the other. Now, what's the deal? Who did her in? Joe, I told you. I don't know anything. Look, you're the captain of the precinct, aren't you? I still don't know anything. What is this, the Wilhelm Strasser? Somebody's got to know something. Now, look, be patient, Joe. you got a morning paper. you got all day to get your story. You'll get it. I'm embarrassed to call my city editor. Don't be embarrassed, Joe. He understands. Uh, well, you never know what to talk to him. Hey, get your story out there, Joe. The chief of detectives. Excuse me, Captain. Thanks a lot. 
The muster room was alive with activity. Lieutenant Matt King of the 21st Detective Squad had walked in the door with the chief of detectives and the acting captain in command of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad. Close on their heels were reporters from all of the seven daily papers with general circulation in New York. The Associated Press and newsmen from radio and television. Lurking on all sides were photographers for most of the papers and motion, motion picture cameramen. It was apparent that these top officers had avoided talking to the press at the scene of the homicide. But now they were cornered. I walked out into the muster room where the questions were being fired at a rapid rate. Chief, did the medical examiner fix the time of death? Uh, not yet, not definitely. It was sometime during the night. Is it true that Edith led a double life? Were there any yeah, pictures of bring your power? Hold it down a minute. Hold it down a minute. Hold it down a minute. Now, listen, Chief, we don't have anything for a story yet. Oh, no. Nothing. Now, give us a break, will you? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what we'll do, boys. There are some things we know we can't tell you yet. <laughs> give us a couple of minutes to decide what we can tell you, and you'll have a story, okay? That's fair yeah, enough. That's we'll good. use the yeah. captain's yeah. office. Use that. Coming through, then. Oh, hello, Captain. James. Oh, James. Oh, I'm rough. It's wicked. Go back. Is it all right? Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, come ahead. Yeah. Thanks. Don't forget, give us a break, will you? Uh, close the door. We'll find a way, those guys. I guess I'll have to tell them something, Matt. They're entitled to their story. Yes, sir, but I'd like to keep quiet about the boyfriend for a while. I don't think there's any point putting him into it yet, Chief. No, neither do I. We can tell them that Edith Campton isn't a real name that she's just been using it since she came to New York. Yes, sir. What else? Well, she worked as a model. Not a cover girl. No, sir, for a fashion house and a store, but I think they know that. How about suspects? Who, oh, Chief? Well, supposing I say there's four or five people we want to talk to, but we can't divulge any names at this point. Yes, yeah, sir, that'd be good. Might want to mention her address and phone book that we're checking every one of her friends. I'd better say acquaintances. Yes, sir. Yes, that address and phone book ought to make them happy. Mm, always does. Thirty detectives assigned to the case. Uh, how's that? Fine. They want to know if there was any evidence of her being killed by a burglar or someone who entered the apartment with criminal intent. I think you can tell them the place wasn't broken into, Chief. Okay. Matt, uh, do you want to let him talk to the maid? I think all I want is pictures of her. We can go that far. Oh, and I guess that about does it. Okay, Matt, you can throw me to the wolves. Yes, sir. There he is. Oh, all right, how about it, Chief? Yeah. Who killed her? The neighbor said she had a gentleman friend. Huh? All right, fellas. Give him a chance. Give him a chance. Right, Come on, let me get out of here. Will you? All right. Chief, Chief, one question first, Chief. <clears throat> My desk wants to get a photographer into her apartment. Now, when can we do uh, that? I'm sorry, no pictures inside oh. the apartment. Oh, no. But we're making a floor plan of the flat. You can see that as soon as it's ready. What time? What time, Matt? 1.30 at the latest. That's too late for the afternoon. Well, you make it 12.30? Come on. Hold it down a minute. Wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it down, boys. <clears throat> All right, boys. This is the story. We've got uh, 30 men on the job. At this moment, we have no more idea than you do who the killer is. There are four or five people with whom we want to talk about this. <clears throat> In addition to that, Miss Campton had a telephone and address book. You mean a little black book? What color is it, Matt? Baby blue letter. Hey, boy. In addition to the four or five, we'll be in touch with every person listed in her phone book in order to get some idea of her movements yesterday and last night. Now, as I told you before, the ME's office hasn't yet reported it. So, the press had their story. All that could be divulged without hindrance to the investigation was given to them. In a few minutes, the reporters hurried out of the station house to find telephones. The chief of detectives and the acting captain of the homicide squad went upstairs to the 21st squad with Lieutenant King. Within an hour, both had left the station house. Now started the real work of the homicide investigation. Detectives of the homicide squad teamed off into pairs with men of the 21st squad to work as partners until the crime was cleared. At 1 p.m., a car came by the station house to take me to 6th Division headquarters for a conference with the inspector who wanted a personal report on my first week as precinct commander. While I was out of the precinct, a well-dressed, graying man in his late 40s was brought in by Detective Whitey Howard of the 21st Squad and Alvin Cooney of the Manhattan East Homicide Squad. They took him directly upstairs to the 21st Detective Squad. This way, Mr. Bellary. Yeah. You don't think it'll take long, do you? I wouldn't know about that. Come in. Lieutenant, we've got Mr. Bellary here. Oh, good. Come in, Mr. Bellary. Oh, thank you. Very much. Have a seat, Mr. Bowery. Thank you. Well, this is some shock. I have no, no idea what a shock when these officers told me it was like a bolt of lightning. Take a right, Mr. Bowery? No, much by. Ed? Whitey? Thank you, Sergeant. No, thank you. 
I'm Lieutenant King. How do you do? You know what this is all about, don't you, Mr. Bellary? Yes, I suppose so. Is Walter Bellary your full name, sir? Walter Crane Bellary. And where do you live? I have a home in Westchester. Where in Westchester? Winslow Park. Your business in New York? That's right. What is your business, Mr. Bellary? I'm a paper broker. And what is that? Well, I act as broker for mills and selling paper to printers, publishers. I see. Do you commute to New York every day? Every weekday, yes. You married, Mr. Bellamy? Yes. For how long? Nineteen years. Any children? Two. Two girls, 15 and 17. You were acquainted with Miss Kenton? Yes. For how long? Well, I don't know. Three, three and a half years, I suppose. What could I do with this? I really don't feel like smoking it. Yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> How well acquainted, Mr. Bellamy? Oh, quite well. Did you see her frequently? Yes. How frequently? Two or three times a week. Ever oftener? Yes, sometimes. At her apartment? Yes. There, and we go out to the theater, clubs together. Was that her apartment, Mr. Bellamy? She lived there, yeah. I know she lived there, but who paid the rent? Well, I imagine she did. Who gave her the money? Lieutenant, Edith and I were very close. My wife and I haven't gotten along for years. Someday, I hope to marry Edith. That's the way it is, I couldn't help it. A man needs some sort of life. You paid the rent. Yes. When did you last see her, Mr. Bellamy? Night before last. You didn't see her yesterday? No. No, last night? No. Were you in New York yesterday? Yes. Where? I was in my office until until 5.15. And then? I went to Grand Central and took the 534 home. To Winslow Park? Yeah, that's right. Was your wife at your home in Winslow Park? No. Where was she? She's visiting her sister in Boston. Your daughters, were they home? No. No, they're away at school. Oh, was anyone at your house in Winslow Park last night besides you? No. No, I was all alone. Did you see anyone you knew on the train? I think so, Lieutenant. Yes. Who? I don't recall at the moment. I'll I'll have to think about it. Sure. Uh, Go ahead. Think about it, Mr. Bowery. Look, Lieutenant, I know that this can't help coming out. This whole thing's bound to get in the papers. I don't care about myself, what anyone says about me. But those two young girls of mine, this is going to be terrible on them. Just just terrible. This is a homicide investigation, Mr. Bellary, but think of those two young girls, Lieutenant. That was your job, Mr. Bellary. I've got mine. The interrogation of Walter Crane Bellary continued. So did my conference at Division Headquarters. It finally broke up at 3 p.m. Patrolman Farrell drove me uptown to the 21st. I instructed him to pick up his partner and resume patrol. He drove away, and I walked up the steps and into the muster room. Hello, Captain. What's doing, Sergeant? Nothing like this morning, sir. Well, that's good. Where's Lieutenant Gorman? I'm filling in for him, Captain. The DA's office called from now in a hurry. Yeah? A burglary case went to bat this afternoon that he made the arrest on when he was sergeant at 64th last winter. This is a fine time to let us know, isn't it? Well, they didn't think they'd need him, but the boy denied his admission. Oh. All right. Stand right up to the desk there, would you please? Here. Okay, Whitey, let's book him. Yes, sir. Uh, just a second. Oh, man. Captain. Walter Crane. Man. Yes, Captain. What's this? That homicide. Middle name is C R A N E. Mm, that's fast work. Right. Yeah, he got twisted up in his own lies. Mm-hmm. 
How did it happen? When he finally told us, he said she was going to break it off. She had a guy she wanted to marry. Mm. He was so enraged, he picked up a fire iron and hit her over the head. Watch the charge. Well, why did he do it? What did he say? That he killed her because he loved her. Well, if you've got to kill somebody, that's as good a reason as any. When he first placing, Sergeant Waters. So you what? You're safe. Where's this? Where on Lexington? And so it goes. What is it? Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King, Harold Stone as Sergeant Waters. Featured in tonight's cast were Abby Lewis, Ralph Camargo, Mandel Kramer, Don McLaughlin, and Wendell Holmes. Written and produced by Stanley Niff. Art Hanna speaking. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Rosen. Well, what happened to it? Was it stolen? Yeah. Yeah. Well, where'd you keep it? You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct. How long? The nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. Well, I'll tell you what you'd better do. You'd better come on in for station house and make a report of it. No, you'd better come right away. Okay. Yeah. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing day duty, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. After I turned out the platoon and the men marched out the front door to take over their posts, I walked through the back room and out across the iron grating to the smaller building in back of the station house, where the detention cells are located. There I found Patrolman Bailey, the station house attendant, cleaning up. The doors of all six cells were standing open. There had been four prisoners held over during the night. But at 7.30 a.m., the patrol wagon had come by the station house to take them to court. With Patrolman Bailey walking a step or two behind me, I conducted an inspection of the cells to see that they were clean, supplied with paper drinking cups, towels, and so forth. After I completed this inspection, sector car number three came by the house for me. I went out on patrol of the precinct. While I was so engaged, Sergeant Rosen had telephone switchboard duty, and Lieutenant Gorman was the desk officer. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Give me the communications bureau on here. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Lieutenant Gorman. Uh, sick report, CB. Patrolman James Reels. R-I-O-S. No. S like in Sam. 10th Precinct. He went sick at 8.50 a.m. at home. 792 East 93rd Street. Surgeon to call. Okay. Yeah. Sergeant? Yes, sir. I want to talk to the carol when he rings in. Okay, Lieutenant. Well, excuse me, Sergeant. You'll have to talk to the desk officer, Mr. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Uh, excuse me, Lieutenant. Yes? I'm John Froud. I own the package store at 284 East 75th Street. Oh, yeah, yeah, Mr. Froud. What can I do for you? Well, Lieutenant, I got a license to keep a gun in the store. I had three stick-ups since I've been there. I got this license. Yeah, what about it? Well, the gun is gone. Disappeared. Well, what do you mean, disappeared? Well, it's gone. I, I don't know. It disappeared. Well, how could the gun just disappear? You think it was stolen? I don't know. It's, it's gone. Nothing else was taken. Well, where did you keep it? 
Well, I got wines on one side and, and liquor on the other. In the middle is this little counter with the cash register and wrappings in a drawer right under the cash register. When did you miss it? Last night. I went to get something else out of the drawer, and I, I, I saw the gun wasn't there. Well, why didn't you report it then? Well, I, I thought maybe my wife would know where it was. Maybe she saw it, or my son. I looked all over the store, and when I got home, I asked my wife. She didn't see it. And what about your son? Well, he, he wasn't home yet. I, I fell asleep, and I didn't see him until this morning. He, he didn't know anything about it. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Put a call out for the skipper, will you? Okay. I don't know what could have happened to it. I, I got no idea. How long have you had this gun? 21st precinct, Sergeant. Well, yeah, let's see. Uh, State one called it's the about will you? three, four years ago. Is this a license to carry or just to possess on the premises? Possess on the premises. All right, Mr. Proud. You wait right over there, huh? I put a radio call out for Captain Cronin. He'll come in and talk to you about it. Well, can I get back to the store? My wife is there, and she has to go someplace. Her sister is in the hospital. No, you'd better wait for the captain, and also for the detectives to come in. Well, I, I could come back this afternoon. He'll want to talk to you now. I'm sure of that. All right. I, I guess I'd better wait. Yeah, I guess you'd better. Section 1897 of the Penal Law of the State of New York, otherwise known as the Sullivan Law, is perhaps the most stringent and strictly enforced law relating to weapons in the country. A license to carry or possess a firearm that may be concealed on the person is extremely difficult to obtain. Applicants for such license are carefully investigated and personally interviewed by both the precinct commander and the detective squad commander. The loss of a pistol by a licensee is a serious matter, and the manual of procedure requires that an immediate investigation be conducted by the precinct commander. When the radio call was put out for me, I instructed my operator, Patrolman Fowl, to stop at the nearest call box. I rang into the station house, and Lieutenant Gorman informed me of the particulars. I told him to have Mr. Fraud wait. When I arrived, Lieutenant Gorman handed me the file copy of the LD-80, the application for a pistol license. And I took the liquor store owner, Mr. Fraud, into my office, where I began to question him. Crazy. I don't know. It's just plain crazy. How, how can it disappear like that from nowhere? Well, we know it didn't just walk out by itself, Mr. Front. Yeah, that's, that's a cinch, gentlemen. You kept the gun in a drawer in the counter under the cash register? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long you been keeping it there? Well, since I got it. Your license was first issued January 23rd, 1953. That's how long, yeah. Ridiculous, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Guns and S&W, 38 Terrier, blue finish. Yeah, yes. Sir. Did you get the draw a lot? Well, I locked it when I closed up the store at night, Captain, but, well, when the store was open, I, I didn't lock it, because what would be the sense of locking the drawer if suddenly I needed the gun? I, I was stuck up there three times, you know, in ten years. Who knew when it was going to happen again? Mm -hmm. When did you last see the gun? Yesterday morning when I opened the drawer, when I unlocked it. You're positive it was there then? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I keep in there also my bank book, deposit slips. I saw it in there when I went to get them out. And when did you miss it? Last night, 10 o'clock, when I, when I closed it. You had no occasion during the day to go to the drawer, see whether the gun was in there? No, sir, no. No occasion. How many employees do you have, Mr. Fraud? Employees? Yeah. Well, he, he's not really what you'd call an employee. Uh, who's that? Joe. Joe who? Joe Aguada. He, he's the fellow that comes in every morning, you know, he, he sweeps up, he unpacks some goods for me. And when I got a delivery in the neighborhood, he makes it. He, he does the same thing for delicatessen around on 3rd Avenue. Cleans up, makes deliveries. We, we sort of, uh, what well, we share his time, half and half. Like, How long has he been working for you? Oh, a long time. I don't know, three, four years. Did you ever miss anything out of the store prior to this? Nothing, no. Not a thing. I, I, I don't think Joe would do anything like this. Did he know you had a revolver on the premises? Well, it wasn't any secret, Captain. I, I didn't go out of my way to tell him, but uh, it wasn't any secret. Was he in the store yesterday between the time you saw the revolver in the morning and when you missed it at night? Yep. Yeah, several times. He he was in and out all day. Were you able to observe his actions on each of those occasions? Well, I, I didn't see him do anything suspicious, if that's what you mean. No, I, I don't think he'd steal anything, Captain. I really don't. You have any other employees? No, sir, no. no mm, you're open from about 10 a.m., 10 p.m.? Yeah, about. Were you there all that time? No, I, I live on 75th on the other side of 2nd Avenue. 
Uh, my wife comes about an hour when I go home to eat lunch, and, and then she comes again at supper time. Mm-hmm. You, you say your son helps you out in the store once in a while, too? Yeah, once in a while, Captain. He, he goes to CCNY, and he's in the store maybe, well, like one night or two nights a week. So Ella and I can eat supper together, maybe taking a picture, you know, something like that. Uh-huh. What's the boy's name? John, too. So we, we, we call him Bud. Was Bud in the store last night? He was there, yeah, for a little while. When I when I came back from supper, he was there with Ella, my wife. Do uh, you think your son might have taken it? No. No. Why should he? Well, you thought he might have last night. Who said that? I, I didn't say anything like uh, that. Mr. Froud, you said the reason you didn't report the gun missing last night was that you went home to talk to your wife and your son. To ask them if they saw it. Yeah, I know. Huh? But I'm... Now, your wife said she didn't. And your son wasn't home when you went to sleep. Oh, I didn't think he took it. I... I... I had to ask him, no, uh, you know, before I went off half cocked. Did you ask him? I asked him, yeah, if, if he'd seen the gun in the store, if, if he'd put it any place besides the drawer. He said, no, he didn't touch it. And what did your wife think? She said the same thing. She didn't touch it. Hmm. Uh, this, uh, Joe, Joe Guda. Uh, Guada. Guada. Mm-hmm. Where does he live? East Harlem, 126th uh, Street, I think. But he'd be around the neighborhood of your store or the delicatessen this morning. Yeah, yeah, he's supposed to be. Did you see him this morning? No, not this morning. Isn't he supposed to come in, clean up the store? Well, I didn't go to the store this morning yet. My my wife went to the store. Yeah. Uh, excuse me. Sure. 21st Precinct, Captain Cronin. Lieutenant King is ringing down for you, Captain. Okay. Yes, Captain? Yes, ma'am. Lieutenant Gorman says you have the man whose gun was stolen in there. That's right. You want to talk to him? Yes, sir. I'll be right down. Okay, man. Uh, Mr. Fraud, I've asked the commanding officer of the 21st Detective Squad to come downstairs. For me? Well, you've got a gun. Can't be accounted for. We've got to presume it's been stolen. <laughs> but I... I don't know who would steal it. And that's partly a matter of who had access to the drawer, isn't it, Mr. Fraud? Well, I guess so, yeah. Do you know anything about this Joe besides the fact that he's worked for you and the delicatessen for around three years? No, not, not much. Is he married? I think so, yeah. You know whether he's ever been in trouble with the police? Not since he's been working for me. At, at least I don't think so. He's been pretty reliable. How much are you paying? Well, he gets twenty two fifty from me and twenty two fifty from the delicatessen, plus tips on the deliveries he makes. How old is your son, Mr. Frog? But well, he's 21. He's going to be 22. In City College? Yeah. Pre-med, he's taken. Bright boy, real bright boy. He, he was in the Army two years. That's why he's a little late in school. But he's going to make a fine doctor. Real fine doctor. He's going to school on the GI Bill? Yeah. He, he just got in under the wire just by a month, six weeks late. How are his grades at school? But he didn't steal it, Captain. Not but I, I don't want you to accuse me. I'm not accusing well, anyone, Mr. Take it. I'm telling you. All right, we'll make sure. You don't have to make sure. I'm telling you. I, I, I just don't want you thinking he did because he did. Mr. Froud, apparently you're the one who thinks he might have. Seems to be on your no, mind. No, he didn't. I'm telling you. You were suspicious enough to want to talk to him before you came here. I just wanted to ask him if, if, if he'd seen it. You having any trouble at home with Bud, Mr. No. Froud? No, well, I mean, he, he's a boy, you know, he's a boy like any other boy. He's got ideas. 21 years old, he's been in the Army. He's not much of a boy anymore. What makes you think he took the gun? I don't think it. Now, look, Mr. Froud, if he has got it, you better help us get it back from him before he gets in worse trouble. What kind of trouble? The kind of trouble a gun can bring. Do you think he took it? Yeah, I think so. But I, I don't know. He, he, he says he didn't, but I, I think so. Now, why do you think he took it? If he did, who knows why? Who knows why he does anything? Why he wants to quit school? Why he wants all kinds of money? Why he wants to get married? <laughs> who knows why a kid does anything? Well, maybe we'll find out. Because theft of the revolver was suspected, Lieutenant King assigned one of his detectives to go to City College and get the son out of class. In order to pursue my investigation, I, in- I instructed Sergeant Rosen on telephone switchboard duty to have a car come by the house for me. When it arrived, Mr. Froud and I got in, 
I told the operator, patrolman Mercado, to drive us to the liquor store on East 75th Street. Okay, Mr. Fogg. Now it's something like this. Oh, wait here, Mercado. Yes, sir. We don't know that it was him, Mr. Fogg. Who else? Joe wouldn't do anything like that. I, I, I just know he wouldn't. Somebody could have walked in the store. When? Oh, sir, uh, Captain. Yeah? Please, uh, don't, don't say anything to Ellie yet. It'll be bad enough when she finds out. When, I mean, when we're positive. All right, Mr. Fogg. Twelve hours a day I spend in there with four wolves. I didn't want anything like that for him. It's my ambition. He should have a profession. Come in, Captain. Yeah, thanks. Hello, Ella. John, hello. Any business? A little, not much. Oh, uh, this is uh, Captain Cronin. This is my wife, Ella. Mrs. Brown. Glad to know you. Well? Well, what? Nothing. Uh, this is the drawer, Captain. Right here. Mm hmm. This is a very serious matter, Mrs. Froud. If a dangerous weapon like that gets in the wrong hands, it cause a lot of trouble. I know. Nobody knows better than me. I realize it. What time were you in the store yesterday? Why? Ella, answer the question. Don't ask them. Okay. Well, I was here when John went to lunch, and I was here when he went home to supper. At lunch? Uh, what time was that? Uh, what time, John? About 12.15, 12.30. About 12.15, 12.30. Anyone come into the store during that time? One or two customers, maybe. Were they ever in the front of the store alone, where they could get at the drawer? No, they stood there on that side of the counter, and I waited on them. Was anyone else in the store? Who? Joe, for instance? No, no, Joe didn't come in when I was here during lunch. I guess he was eating, too. What time did Mr. Frog get back? What time, John? A little after one. A little after one. And then what did you do, Mrs. Frog? I talked to him for a minute, and then I went. I went to go to the market and then home to fix supper. Mm, same. And what time did you come back to the store again? When it was time for John to go home for supper. You see, Captain, she eats and she puts my supper on the stove and then she walks over to the store and I go home. Uh-huh, and that was what time? Uh, last night, uh, about 6.30, huh? About, yeah. Did anyone come into the store while you were here alone? Well, my son, Barty, came in. Oh, does he usually stop in when you're here alone? Sometimes. He was at his girlfriend's house. He went there from school in the afternoon. And what did he do while he was here? We talked. I asked him, did he eat? And he said no. And I told him to go home and have supper. It was on the stove. He wouldn't come home because I was there. If you'd leave him alone and stop nagging him, he'd be all right. If you won't leave him alone. I want him to get those crazy ideas out of his head. I want him to finish college. I don't want him to get a job and get married. What, what, what could he have? He could have a wife. Joe. Come here, Joe. Oh. Hello, Mr. Brown. Miss Brown. Joe. No, this is Captain Cronin, police department. The policia. Uh, oh, policia. Oh, uh, 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 glad to uh, to know you. Yeah? Huh? Uh, Mr. Frog keeps a gun in the store. Did you know that? See, si, see, si, I know. You know where he keeps it? See, si, I know, I know. Where? He in the drawer. Here. In the drawer. You already know why he keeps the gun. See, si, for robber. There's no right, Mr. Proud, for robbers? Yeah, Joe. Yeah. When did you handle that gun last, Joe? Me? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I no, I no, touch, not me. I, I, I don't want nothing to do with no gun. I, I don't like it. You afraid of the gun? No, 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 not afraid. I, I just don't, don't like it. Somebody took it yesterday, Joe. The gun? Yeah. Who took it? Well, we hope maybe it was you, Joe. No, 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 no. You know that you were cleaning the drawer and you took it out no, by no. mistake? No, I no touch. No, 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 not me. No, I don't like it. I don't go near these drawers, and you're never. Uh, do I, Mrs.? Not that I've ever seen. No, uh, Mister, do I, eh? No, Joe. No. No, I, I don't like guns. I don't go near the drawer. No, I never. Uh, you want me to take out the cartons this morning, Mr. Froud? You said yesterday. Uh, you... Captain Cronin is talking to you, Joe. Oh, oh uh, excuse me. That's all right, Joe. I'll talk to you later if I have to. You go on. Get back to work. Uh, see, see. Come on and back, Joe. Oh, I, I didn't go near the door. Never, never. No. I'll be right back, Captain, as soon as I show him what to do. All right, Mr. Go ahead, Joe. I don't like long. 
I don't think he did it, not so. Doesn't look that way. But... Maybe somebody came in from the outside while John was in the back and just took it. That could happen, couldn't it? Maybe. Mrs. Froud, how long has this trouble between your son and your husband been going on? Trouble? Oh, it's not trouble. It's just a family disagreement. How long has it been going on? Oh, since Bud came back from the army, almost. He says he's too old to go to school. He wants to earn a living and get married. And John's got it in his head that Bud should be a doctor, but he don't want to be a doctor. He's tired of living off the GI Bill and going to college and studying when he says it doesn't mean a thing, nothing to him. Oh, why doesn't he quit? Oh, he'd never hear the end of it. John's crazy enough on the subject. Do you think Bud might have taken the gun? Bud? No, why would he take it? Well, he doesn't have much money. Maybe to sell it? No, he wouldn't do that. Somebody could. Well, not Bud. Was Bud ever in trouble, Mrs. Frog? What do you mean, trouble? I mean, was he ever arrested? No. He didn't take it, not Bud. He was never in any kind of trouble? No. Well, wasn't Joe? You see what I mean? Yep, I see. John, would Bud take the gun? No, huh? Why? Why should he? Well, I don't know. I just asked. No, I... All right, excuse me. I sure. But what can we do with it? Liquor store. Is Captain Cronin still there? Yeah, sure, he's here. Captain, for you. Okay. Thanks, man. All right, sure. All right. Captain Cronin. Matt King, Captain. Oh, yes, Matt. I sent Whitey Howard up to CCNY to get that Bud Froud out of class. Yeah. He just rang in said he got him out all right. He admits taking the gun. Oh, that's so. Yes, sir. Whitey's on the way in with him. Okay, Matt. Thanks. I'll be there in a little while myself. Yes, sir. Well, I've got to get back to Station House. Oh, do you? Yeah, and uh, I think you better come with me, Mr. Frog. Well, Captain, I was just there. And I can't stay in the store all day. I came here without making the bed seat. And my sister's in the hospital. I think I... you'd better come, Mr. Frog. All right. Hello, I'll come back as soon as I can. All right. Have Joe sweep out in front as soon as he gets through, huh? All right. Bye, Mrs. Brown. Goodbye. Captain. Yeah. What is it? Did Bud take the gun? Yes, Mr. Brown. Why? Why would he do such a thing? I don't know. I, I tried to do the best for him. Make something out of my... I spent my whole life trying to do that. So he could get someplace. Well, maybe it's a good thing he didn't get too far. We got into the car and were driven to the station house by Patrolman Mikado. Mr. Frow didn't say a word all the way. He just sat there looking straight ahead. Possession of a gun by an unlicensed person is a serious crime in the state of New York. I wondered, as much as the father did, as to why the young man took the gun. There were two obvious reasons. One, to sell it. The other, to use in a robbery. A few minutes later, the car pulled out in front of the station house, Mr. Froud and I got out. I instructed Patrolman Mercado to pick up his partner and resume patrol. As the car pulled away, we crossed the sidewalk, mounted the three worn stone steps that led to the muster room. While Lieutenant Gorman was desk officer and Sergeant Rosen still had telephone switchboard duty. Uh, you wait here, Mr. Frog. I have to go around and sign the blotter. All right. Wait, 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 Sergeant Rosen. Captain. Oh, Sergeant. All right. Seven, two. Oh, Captain. What's going, Lieutenant? Not a thing, Captain. Very quiet. Good. Oh, uh, you see Whitey Howard go upstairs with the young man? Uh, yes, sir. Just a few minutes ago. Okay. I'll be up there with the detective. Yes, sir. Come on, Mr. Frog. All right. I'm going to go upstairs. That where they have him? Yeah, yeah, he's up there. I don't understand what's got into him. No, right ahead, Mr. Frog. I just don't understand. He struggles, he works. What do we do it for, for him? To take a gun to hold up somebody? Now, we don't know that that's the reason. Ah, Jim, what other reason could there be? No, that's just... He never should have got that gun. Not if I had 40 stick up that if he'd wanted one, he'd have got one someplace. You can be sure of that. There. There he is, a little off. All right, all right now. Proud, take your time. Take your time. Matt? 
Come in, Captain. Go ahead, Mr. Fon. Hello, Butch. Huh? I'm ashamed of you. I'm so ashamed of you, I can hardly look at you. It's bad enough to steal, but to steal from your own father and a gun. Uh, what are you trying to do to me? Didn't you eat my heart out enough since you got back from the army? What are you trying to do to me now? Kill me, eh? Hey? You've got it all wrong. I Mr. got Brown. it terrible. I got it lousy. That's how I got it. Ah, listen. Don't touch me. Leave me alone. I didn't steal the gun. You didn't? No. What? What did you do with I took it out of the drawer and hid it in a case of wine on the floor by the window. Why did you do that, bud? Because he's been carrying on about my wanting to quit school and wanting to get married. He's been carrying on like mad. You're not going to quit. I quit already, Pa, today. And I got married last week. No, you didn't. Yeah, I did. I was going to tell you and Ma last night in the store, but I lost my nerve. I didn't know what you'd do or what you'd say, and that's why I hid the gun. I didn't want it around. You... You thought I'd, 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 that I would do something with the gun? That I'd be that crazy to kill myself? I just didn't want to take the chance. Oh, but, but how, how could you think that? I, I know, I, I know I've been a little... You got married, huh? Yeah, last week at City Hall. I'm sorry, Pa, we didn't want to keep it a secret, but I wanted to get it done. I wanted it my way for a change. My way. You're right. You're right to do what you wanted to do. But I'm, I'm glad for you. I'm very glad for you. Captain, what can I say? I caused you so much trouble. We've got plenty of real trouble around here, Mr. Franz. This kind of trouble I like. First precinct, Sergeant Rosen. Oh, no, sir. The captain's not in the house right now. He's out on patrol. You, you've got who? And so it oh, goes. Is? Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry go round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed. A factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Jack Orison, Bill Zuckert, Martin Newman, Ralph Camargo, and Ethel Everett. Written and produced by Stanley Ness. Art Hanna speaking. Twenty first precinct, Sergeant Lyons. You caught a what? A burglar lady? With a butcher knife? Well, where is this? Where? What you are by transcription in the Thank muster you, room at the twenty first precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st precinct. All right, lady, I'll send the officers right over there. Yes, ma'am, right away. Just be careful till they get there. 21st precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and four lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing night duty 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. After I turned out the platoon for the night tour and cleaned up the paperwork that had accumulated since I was last on duty 22 hours earlier... Sector car number two came by the house for me, and I went on patrol of the precinct with patrolman David Meister as operator. When the commanding officer is on patrol in an RMP car, he assumes all the duties of the car's recorder, which includes signaling on the two-way radio 
and keeping the desk officer informed by telephone of all police action taken by the crew of the car. Uh, pull over to the next call box, Meister. I want to ring in. Yes, sir. I'll just be a second. Yes, sir. Captain Cronin, box 14. Uh, yes, sir. I'll be in in a little while, Sergeant. The man named Doyle coming by to see me. Now, you tell him that he can wait to... We just had a call. A woman's holding a burglar at the point of a butcher knife. 613 East 92nd Street, apartment 2B. 2B? Yes, sir, that's right. We're right near there. We'll roll on it. Yes, sir. Uh, excuse me, would you, officer? Yeah, what is it, Sailor? Where's the subway, please? Well, you walked two blocks over here to Lexington, one block down to 86th Street. Would that take me to the Brooklyn Navy Yard? Well, you ask the station agent there. We've got an emergency call. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. What might my supply? 613 East 92nd, my son. Yes, sir. The call just came over the air. Let's go. The crime of house burglary is often the specialty of narcotic addicts, many of whom are dangerous when cornered. A citizen who attempts to detain a felony suspect is in grave danger. The fact that this citizen was reported to be a woman and was also reported to be holding a burglary suspect at the point of a butcher knife made the call all the more urgent. All emergency radio calls are directed at a particular sector car. In addition, the sergeant's car must respond to every call, and according to the manual of procedure, all department vehicles within a radius of five blocks from the scene of the crime must make the run, irrespective of sector, precinct, or division boundary line. In this instance, it happened that we were closest to the scene. The run was a short one. We were the first car to arrive. That's it, Captain. Pull in. Now, let's go. Yes, sir. Apartment 2D, wasn't it? Well, they said 2B at the house. Lock, Captain. Hit the bells, all of them. Somebody will push the button. I can see to the top of the stairs. You hit them all? Yes, sir. There it goes. Put the door in the lock. Yes, sir, I did. All right. There's an apartment door open up there. That could be it. Yeah. It is it. Inside. Well, you got here fast enough. It's, uh, that the burglar? I'm not a burglar. Oh, yes, you are. Ridiculous. All right, now, sir. Ridiculous. I said it's all right, so. lady. Give me that knife, lady. You won't let her get away. Give me the knife. All right. All right. Now, what's this all about? I'll tell you what it's all about. There's you not a word of truth in it. I right. wish you well, have to say Both it. of you take it easy, huh? Okay, just answer my question. Sergeant Lyons, Captain. Is everything okay, Captain? Yep, yeah, that's all right. I'll get the others back on patrol. Okay. Okay, everything's under control. Secretary Is this please. your apartment? Yes, that's right. And what's your name, please? This is Equity. This is Catherine Equity. Do you know what she did? All right, was... all right, hold it. What's your name? Mrs. Equity. Mrs. Marie Equity. You live here? She does not. Let her answer, please. Do you? No. You two related? In a way, sort of. Not by blood, we're not, not by I'm blood. That's her. one thing. Ladies, ladies, please, now blood. just a second, huh? One at a time. Now, you, how are you related? I'm married to Joe, and she's married to Eddie, and Joe and Eddie are brothers. Is that right? Yes, she's Joe's wife. At least they're married. Now, what kind of a crack you is that? You know what I'm talking about. I don't about. know what you're right, talking now, about. Now, please, well, ladies. Okay, now hold it. What's this all about? Why did you call the police? And why the knife? I caught her stealing. I was not apostles. stealing. You were. I caught ladies, her Ladies, just a second. What do you mean you caught her stealing? I came home and found her taking some of my things. They're not your things. They're dad's. They're mine. Things. You know they're, they're not. mine. You know they are oh, not hold yours. Hold it just a minute, please. All right. My sir. Yeah, Captain. It's a fine thing. That's all I've got to say. Everybody's back on the job, Captain. Oh, good, Sergeant. Uh, Mrs. Eckerty. Yes. Yes, what is it? Uh, this, Mrs. Eckerty. Marie. Mm -hmm. You wait in the kitchen with a sergeant, please. I want to talk to your sister. I don't know why I should. There, there, you see, she's just plain stubborn. Don't you call me uh, stubborn. You please, just a minute. Sergeant, this is Mrs. Marie Eckerty. Would you go into the kitchen with her? Yes, sir. Miss? All right. Don't let her get away now. Don't worry about that. I'm not going to get away. What do I want to get away from? Shut the door, Sergeant. Okay, Captain. All right, now, Mrs. Eckerty. What do you say happened? She was trying to rob my apartment. I caught her. Look, let's, uh, let's start a little further back than that. Hmm? I'll start any place you want. Nice. 
Yes, sir. Pay attention to this conversation. You may need it in court. Sure, Captain. Hello, Captain. What have we got? What? We got a key? Right there. Well, this is certainly getting involved, isn't you it? You called the police, Mrs. Eckerty. This is Lieutenant King. He's in charge of the 21st Squad Detective. How do you do? How are you? The call was a signal 30. A burglar was being housed. In the kitchen. It's his sister-in-law, man. Oh? But she's a burglar. She was trying to rob me. I sent, him in with, I sent her in with Sergeant Collins, Matt. I couldn't get a straight story with both of them in here. I was willing to tell you a straight story. Well, what did happen, Mrs. Eckerty? Well, you see, I was out. Out to the movies. I go once a week, every Monday night when my husband's working. And she knows it. It's been a habit. Well, tonight I went and I didn't realize that I'd seen the picture. So I left after the cartoon. When I came home and opened the door, she was in the apartment. <laughs> how do you like that? Well, how did she get in? I don't know. I don't have any idea. Did you ask her? That didn't matter. All that mattered was she was in. She was in here and she was going through the drawers of that chest there. That one right there. As a matter of fact, she broke the lock of the top drawer. She admitted it. That much she did. She admitted it. Well, what did she say she was after? Doesn't make any difference, does it? She broke into my apartment. That's a crime. She's your sister-in-law, Mrs. Eckerty. Why did you find it necessary to threaten her with a knife? Well, she was robbing the place. I came in and I said, what are you doing here? She started to go. I said, I'm going to call the police. She said, all right, call them. She sat right down in that chair there, just as bold as you please, and said, call them. So I did. And why did you need the knife? Well, who knows what she'd do. I thought she might leave or try to hit me, so I went in the kitchen and got the knife, and then I called on the telephone. Seems obvious that you and your sister-in-law don't get along very well. That's no fault of mine. I assure you, I've tried for years. For years, I've tried. Anybody can tell you. And your husband's name is Eddie has his show. Is that right? Yes. How do they get along, Eddie? Well, all right, I suppose. After all, there's blood between them. They're brothers, and there's the business. And the partner's in it. Oh? Uh-huh. What kind of business they is it? They have trucks, and they have a contract for some of the newspapers to take the papers out to certain towns in the suburbs. You know... It's only a small business. They have four trucks, and they drive themselves and hire two other drivers for the others. That's where they are now, working. The morning newspapers come out at night, you know. Yeah, I know. Now, uh, Mrs. Eckerty, this trouble didn't start just because you came home and found your sister-in-law in your apartment. What's the real trouble, Mrs. Eckerty? Now, I'm glad you asked me that, Captain. There is a real trouble. She has alienated the affections of my father-in-law, my husband's father. That's what she did. She caused him to move right out of here and over to her house. Right out of here after he'd been living with Joe and me for five years. Since my mother-in-law died, she poisoned that nice old man's mind against me and moved him right out of the house. Right out of the house. That's what she did. Now, uh, now wait a minute. You mean there was an argument over who your husband's father should live with and you both wanted him? Well, I wanted him for himself. But she's after his money. She expects Dad to leave it all to her just because she has two bratty grandchildren. Oh, I see. Well, why do you think she broke in here? Oh, that's easy. My father-in-law left some war bonds in my safekeeping. She came here to get them, that's why. Not only war bonds, but my mother-in-law's jewelry, the diamond pin and the ring. Look, Mrs. Eckerty, this is just a family squabble. You're not interested in having her arrested. Who said I'm not? Why do you think I call the police? I want to get this settled once and for all. All right, we'll get it settled. You stay here. I'm not going any place. We'll talk to her. I might be come along with us. No, sir. I'm just supposed to wait here. That's right. right. All right, if you say so. Okay, Sergeant. Yes, sir. You can get back on the job. Yes. Hello, Lieutenant. Sergeant. Okay, I'll get rolling. Uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Vitaly was talking to one of the neighbors. Take a look for him in the hall. Tell him I want to see him. Sure, Lieutenant. You want this closed? Yes. Mrs. Eckerty, this is Lieutenant King. Oh. How do you do? I'm glad to meet you. How did you get in here, Mrs. Eckerty? With a key. Where'd you get the key? From Dad, uh, my father-in-law. Is it his? Well, he used to live here, you know, before he moved in with us. And how did he happen to keep the key? He said he should, in case he ever wanted to stop over. Did he give you the key? Well... Did he? I took it. Without asking? I'm sure it was all right with Dad. When was this you took it? Tonight, after supper. I took it off his dresser. Oh, if your father-in-law had some things here, why didn't you suggest that he come over here himself and get them instead of causing all this trouble? I asked him. I asked him a thousand times. But he's afraid of her. He's afraid to death of her. He was living in a chamber of terror here. You can believe me about that. How old is your father-in-law, Mrs. Eggerton? Oh, about 70. 
71, I think. And uh, when did he move over to your house? Well, we finally got him to come three weeks ago. He'd been wanting to come for years, but finally he decided definitely that he wanted to spend more time with his grandchildren. I've got two. Uh, Joe Jr. is four, and Jamie's almost two. But there wasn't anything for him to do here except sit around and read the newspaper. You, you couldn't get a word of decent conversation out of her. Nobody can. Well, where's your father-in-law now? Oh, at my house with the children. Of course, they're asleep, but he just loves to sit with them. Does he work? Dad? No. He retired years ago. He started the business Joe and Eddie run. Uh, they have contracts to deliver newspapers to dealers in the suburbs. Yes, we heard about them. It's a nice little business, and they both work very hard, I'll say that. And her husband, Eddie, is a very nice and easy to get along with. Nothing like her. I understand your father-in-law has a little money. Well, he worked hard all his life, and he's comfortable. Uh, that's just the trouble. She's trying to get her big fat hands on it, and I'm not going to be the one to let her. Yeah, you see, you just got to tell you. You were I'm listening. My house is if you can call it. All right, ladies. You're a scheming, conniving little Okay, now. Don't you call me names. Don't you I'll dare call, call me names. That's, that's about enough, huh? Want, now, I cut it out. Wait. Well, this is some treatment I'm getting after all the trouble I've been through. There are people with bigger troubles, Mrs. Eckerty. I'd sure like to know who. Well, I would imagine, for instance, your respective husbands. Although the circumstances seemed to indicate little more than a family argument, Mrs. Catherine Eckerty insisted on making a complaint. And to get the matter straightened out, both women were taken to the station house in the custody of David Meister, the first officer on the scene. If an arrest developed, it would be his case. At 9.20, I returned to the station house and walked into the muster room where Lieutenant Garman was desk officer and Sergeant Lyons now had telephone switchboard duty. I walked around the desk to sign the block. All right, stop by there before the end of the tour. Captain? Oh, Sergeant? Yeah, I want you to check it again. Lieutenant? Captain? What's doing, Red? Oh, the teletype order, Captain. A conference of all precinct commanders in the lineup room, 240 Center Street at 1 p.m. Thursday. I'll put a copy on your desk. Okay, good. Excuse me, is this, is this where I go? Step right up to the desk, sailor. Oh, uh, yes, sir. What's the trouble? Listen, I think uh, somebody stole my wallet. What do you mean, you think? They, uh, uh, sailor, didn't I give you directions how to get to the Lexington Avenue subway a little while ago? You, you wanted to go to the Brooklyn Navy, huh? Well, y yes, sir. What happened? Well, I was on my way, all right. I was walking to the subway, and I passed this bar, and uh, I decided to stop in and get a beer. Uh, I was thirsty. Is that where you lost your wallet? I think so, yes, sir. Well, you said somebody stole it. Well, uh, I got to talking to a couple of people in there, a man and a girl. They were an interesting couple. You think they stole it? I don't know. See, I, I was talking to them, and, and she was... Uh, Leaning on my shoulder, and he told a joke, and we all died laughing, and that's all. All I know, it was gone. I got to the subway, and I wanted to get some tokens, and I had about 40 bucks in there. Over 40 bucks. Where is this bar? Well, that's just the trouble. I don't remember exactly. I, I tried to think which way I came. I, I walked back, and I tried to find it. See, I, I don't know New York very good. I... Couldn't locate it. You spoke to me on the corner of 87th Street and 2nd Avenue. Did you follow my directions when you walked to the subway? Well, I was... Sergeant, uh, who's catching upstairs? Dan Goldman, Lieutenant. All right. I'll tell you what to do, sailor. You see that door over there? Yes, sir. You go through that door and upstairs to the detectives. Ask for Detective Goldman. Yes, sir. He'll take care of you. Will he try to find my wallet? If he can find the bar you were in. Through that door. That's right, and upstairs. Yeah, thanks a lot, sir. Watch your bar. Red, ring up to Goldman. Tell him I gave the boy directions to walk across 87th Street, down Lexington, one block to the subway station. From 87th and 2nd? Yeah, that's right. Sergeant. Yes, sir. Sergeant, will you ring the detective? Okay, yeah. Yes, Captain? Uh, patrolman uh, Fowles uh, working the first platoon. When he comes into the house, tell him I want to see him. Yes, sir. Oh, and check the surgeon's chart. If it's Dr. Rollman on reserve tonight, get him on the phone for me. Yes, sir. Let's stop over at the switchboard a minute, huh? Yes, if you want. Hello, the telly. Sergeant. Hello, Captain. Hey. Where, where are they, anyway? Upstairs, Mr. Reggerty. Oh. Would you ring upstairs for Lieutenant King, Sergeant? Yeah, sure. Are those his two daughters-in-law, Stansby? Yes. I'm Captain Cronin, Mr. Reggerty. Oh, how are you? I don't know. I can't understand what goes on between those two. Why can't they get it straightened out? That's what we brought you in here for, to help get it straightened out. You want to take it on the extension back here, Pete? Yeah, Okay. 
Give me a minute, Mr. Agatha. Yeah, sure. Uh, take it behind there, will you? Listen, okay. Captain, what am I going to do about Hello, these two? Yeah, I've got a... I don't know, Mr. Agatha. It's, it's right been there. going on like this for years. I well, I, I guess this will put an end to it one way or the other. No, I don't know. With oh, police anyway. and detectives, I don't know. Captain, Lieutenant King wants to know if you can talk to Mr. Eckerty in your office a minute. Yeah, sure. It's all right. He'll be right down. Well, come on, Mr. Eckerty. You know, I, I try to be impartial. I try to like them both. Mm -hmm. Go right ahead, Mr. Eckerty. Thank you. Thanks. I don't know. All I ask is that I live out my last few years in peace. That's all I want. Uh, sit right down here. Half the time they don't speak. And when they do speak, they fight until they don't speak again. When this detective came to the house to get me, I knew what it was. As soon as he said he was a policeman, I knew the two of them were at it again. I had to get a neighbor woman to come in and sit with my grandchildren while I came over here. You know, a man is entitled to have two sons. And he's entitled to have two daughters-in-law. Now, why can't the atmosphere be peaceful? That's all I want. Live and let live. Oh, excuse me. Sure, sure. 21st precinct, Captain Conan. Uh, Sergeant Lyons, OPS, Captain. It's not Dr. Holman who's on reserve tonight. Want me to try and get hold of the surgeon who is? No, no, that's all right. I want to talk to Dr. Holman personally, but no, nah, it'll keep. Yes, sir. Come in, Matt. Hello, Captain. Pete, hey, Lieutenant. Matt, this is Mr. John Eckerty, Lieutenant King. How do you do? How are you? Miss Thaler, come in here a minute. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. Mr. Tally, this is Seaman First Class Carl Donowitz. Yes, sir. Looks like somebody lifted his wallet in a bar somewhere between 87th and 2nd Avenue and the 86th Street Station of the Lexington Avenue line. He doesn't know exactly where the bar is. Yes, sir. Goldman took the squeal from him, but he's tied up right now. You go out and see if you can find the bar and find the wallet. Okay, Lieutenant. Come on, Sailor. Yes, thanks, yes. Lieutenant. All right. How'd you get there? You, walk across you seem to be very busy here tonight. It's always busy, Mr. Raggedy. Oh, where are they? Uh, upstairs, uh, Katie and Marie? Oh, that's right, they're no. upstairs. Now, look, Mr. Eckerty, we've got all kinds of troubles around here. We've got car thieves, got narcotic addicts, got robbers, everything you can think of. You don't need family arguments. Yes, I know. Where are your two sons, their husbands? Couldn't they try to get here? Well, the detective said he tried to locate them, but they're out on the trucks, I'm sure. They're delivering the first edition. Well, uh, Mr. Raggedy, have they taken any action to stop what's going on between their wives? Oh, they tried. They tried for a long time, but they, they gave up. It just got too much for them. They're brothers, and they have the business. They don't want to get into the fight themselves, so they just ignore it. Well, it can't be handled by ignoring it. Well, I try to make peace, but what can I do? Mr. Eckerty, your daughter-in-law, Catherine, accuses Marie of breaking into her house and attempting to take some war bonds and some jewelry. Oh, that, that stuff yours? Yes, sure. The bonds are mine, and the jewelry was my wife. Did you intend for Marie to go over and get them? Did you tell her you wanted her to do that? Well, oh, I don't know. that they're, they're safe in one place, the other. But did you ever indicate to Marie that you wanted her to go get them? We talked about it, the pro and con. Did you tell Catherine you wanted to leave the stuff there? Oh, well, I didn't say anything definite. Mr. Eckerty, what do you think is the basis of the trouble between your daughter-in-law? Well, I suppose they don't just like each other. I mean, what do you think the real source of the trouble is? Well, I, I guess it's money. My money. You mean which one you're going to leave it to? Yes. Yeah. Now, isn't it a fact that you've first given one one reason to believe that you'll leave it to her side of the family, then you've turned around and said the same thing to the other? Not exactly, no. Well, you move from one family to the other every few years or so, don't you? Well, that's only because I, I, I want to share my time. That's and all. you have stated on occasion to either one or the other that they're going to be the principal legacy of your estate. <laughs> my estate doesn't amount to that much for them to fight about. I understand it's considerable. Isn't that true? Well, I'm no millionaire, if that's what you mean. I I have a little money, a few dollars. You've gone out of your way to encourage this conflict between them, haven't you? Hmm? Haven't you, Mr. Eckerty? I wouldn't say that. I no. would, Mr. Eckerty. Yes, well, I suppose you're right in a way. I haven't done anything to stop it, I'll say that much. Captain, I'm over 70. I'm all alone. and Fortunately, I, I do have a little money. I, I sat down, you know, one day, and I wondered what would happen to me if I didn't have any money. 
Instead of fighting about which one I'd live with, it'd be just the opposite. They'd fight about which one should take me. I'd rather have them fight than to want me. Don't you feel a little bit bad about the dissension you've caused in the family and the trouble you've caused your sons? Yes, I've felt bad about that for a long time, but I don't know how to stop it. Well, here's your opportunity, Mr. Lane. Yeah, I suppose it is. Uh, we'd better go up. But I hate to get in the middle of it. Mr. Raggedy, where do you think you are? Yes, uh, that's true. That's <clears throat> very true. Come on, Captain. Yeah, I'm coming, man. We're going to need lots of help. I'm going up to the detective, Sergeant. Yes, sir. That way, Mr. Deputy. No, no. All I wanted was peace and quiet. A little peace and quiet, that's all. And, and a little home life. Now, you can't blame me for that. Up the stairs. I suppose I was wrong, but it seemed so natural to have them want me. I guess I should have made them want me for myself. Not for my money, huh? Don't you think? That would have been a lot better, Mr. Raggedy. Yeah, I know. Just a second here. Mr. Eckerty, I've got Catherine sitting in the squad room. Yeah. And Marie is in my office. I want you to talk to Catherine first. All right. There shouldn't be any arrests in this case. Let's get it straightened out. All right, I'll do what I can. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Well, Dad... You see where she finally wound up in the police station. Katie, uh, You know what she did, don't you, yeah, Dad? Yeah. She broke into my apartment. She broke now, into look, my car. A red-handed, uh, I Katie, I her. want to talk to you. I told you what she was like. I yeah. saw it coming. I saw it plain as day. She's a thief, a plain thief. All right, thief. all right, all you right. You can't go on uh, staying All here, right, Dad. Katie, now, where's but, Maria? I want to talk to her. You tell her, Dad. You give her a piece of your mind. In my office, Miss Eckerty. A plain thief, just a plain thief. Go ahead, Miss Eckerty. Marie, now... Dad, why did they have to bring you in, Miss? Oh, who's with the children? When the detective came, I got Mrs. Quinter to sit. Oh. You know Captain Cronin? Yes, we met earlier. Hello. Now, now Marie, what is this all about? You said you wanted your bonds in the jewelry bag, didn't you? Marie, well, as Marie. long as you didn't do anything, I just went over there to get them for you. Well, that, that wasn't very well. Well, I Marie. did it, and she had me Marie. arrested. Now, you're not going to stand by and let her have the mother of your only grandchildren arrested, are yes. you? Are, are you going to stand for look, that? Look, Marie. Your only grandchildren, Dad. Supposing I have to go to jail, yeah. and those poor little things wouldn't have any mother, and it'd all be her fault. Uh, no, wait all a minute. her fault. I said, wait a minute. <laughs> All right, Dad. All right. Look, is it all right if Katie comes in here? Why? I think it's time we get this thing straightened out. Sure. Well, I'm glad. I'm very glad you're going to straighten her out. Miss Eckerty, would you come in here a minute? Now, you said it was all my fault, Captain. Isn't that what you said? That's Down what there? I said. No, it's yes. not your fault, Dad. It's hers. What do you mean, uh, mine? Just what I said. Now, now he lived me. with me for five years, and he wants to come back. Oh, does he? You ask him. There's no need to ask you, you anything. Ask him. All right, all right. You now. have no right to speak that way. Oh, oh don't I? Shut up. Now, both of you, shut up. Dad. Now, I'll admit that I was partly to blame for what happened. But from now on, I'm not going to be made a, a bean bag to be tossed between the two of you. I'm through with it. The war bonds and the jewelry and, and my money and my stocks and everything else. You'll both get your share in time. So don't worry about it. Now, good night. And thank you, gentlemen. Dad, Dad, wait. For what? Where are you going? I'm going to YMCA. To live in peace and quiet. Dad, Marie, we better stop now, him. Now, wait a minute. You've got some unfinished business here. But he's going to the Y. You want to forget about this whole thing? Well, I don't you know. You don't hurry. You'll be checked in at the Y. Come on, Marie. I'm coming. I'm coming, Dad. You think the situation is cured, Captain? Well, at least a step has been made toward recovery. Excuse me. Sure. 21st Squad, Lieutenant King. Uh -huh. Oh, yeah. Well, the detective, my colleague, told me to call him. Caught the man and lady that took my wallet. They took it out of my pocket in the bar, all right. The man still had it on him. Uh, detective, my colleague, asked me to ask you to send a car to bring him in. Well, where are you? It's 194 East 87th Street, in the bar. All right. Tell him we'll be there right away. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. I'll tell him. Okay. What is it, man? What do you got? A crime, Captain. A real, honest-to-goodness crime. First precinct, Sergeant Lyons. What do you mean, missing? Lost? 
Well, how old is the little girl? Four and a half, huh? Well, who's she with? With her mother? Yeah. Well, where is this? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct Transcribed, a factual account of the way the police work in the world's largest city, is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Abby Lewis, Elaine Ross, Bill Quinn, Mason Adams, Bill Smith, Santos Ortega, and Wendell Holmes. 21st Precinct is written and produced by Stanley Niff. Art Hannah speaking. Twenty-first briefing, Patrolman Jacoby. No, sir, the captain's not in. Yes, sir, he's working today. He's on his way to court with a prisoner, uptown arrest court. Well, I don't think he's had time to get there yet. Patrol wagon just left here about seven minutes. You are by transcription in the muster room at the 21st Precinct, the nerve center. A call is coming through. You will follow the action taken pursuant to that call from this minute until the final report is written in the 124 room at the 21st Precinct. All right, Inspector, I'll tell him. I'll leave a message on his desk to call as soon as he gets back in the house. 21st Precinct. It's just lines on a map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their prisons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing day duty, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. It was a little before 7.30 when I entered the station house and walked behind the desk to sign the blotter. I conferred with the desk officer for the 12 to 8 tour, Lieutenant Snyder, who gave me a quick summary of occurrences in the precinct since I was last on duty. He also informed me that he had been notified by the Communications Bureau that Sergeant Waters, scheduled for desk duty on the 8 to 4, had gone sick at his home. I looked over the roll call for that tour with Lieutenant Gorman, the desk officer, and instructed him to have Patrolman Jacoby fill in on telephone switchboard duty. Later, on patrol of the precinct, I instructed my operator, Patrolman Farrell, to drop me on 86th Street, a neighborhood business area. There, I walked along both sides of the street, observing the crowds of Christmas shoppers, and finally headed toward a small jewelry store near 3rd Avenue. Can I help you? Mr. Benfeld? Yes. Uh, I'm Captain Cronin, the commanding officer of the 21st Precinct. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. How are you, Captain? I'm glad to know you. Oh, fine, fine, thanks. Yeah, Captain Canelli used to come in here once in a while. I got to know him pretty good. I heard he got promoted. I didn't hear to what? Uh, Deputy Inspector. Oh, that's good. He deserved it all right. Where is he? Borough headquarters, Manhattan West. Oh, yeah, no kidding. What's that? Well, he works under the assistant chief inspector who commands all the precincts on the west side. Oh, that must be a pretty good job. Yes, it is, it is, yeah. yeah. So how do you like it here? It's a nice neighborhood. We've got everything. You've got the richest in the world on Park Avenue and Fifth Avenue. You've got the poorest in the tenements. It's some variety, all right. Yeah. Uh, listen, Mr. Benfeld, mm -hmm. I, uh, I saw the boys watch and all the girls watch you donated for the kids' Christmas party at this station house tomorrow. I, I want to thank you. Oh, it's nothing. Don't worry about it. Well, they're very nice gifts. They're going to make a couple of kids pretty happy. But they, uh, they look too expensive. Look, I get them wholesale, so it ain't so bad. And I've been doing it for, well, let's see, it's three years now. So it's getting to be a tradition with me. Hmm. You know how it started? No, 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 I don't. Well, it was right before Christmas on a Saturday night late. Everything was closed up. Well, a truck came right racing by here and skidded on some ice in the street and whammy plowed right through the front of the store. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, this isn't Tiffany's, you know, but there's a lot of inventory even in a small store like this. Sure. I was out someplace uh, to a party in New Jersey. I didn't get home till like four in the morning, and it was five before I got here. In the meantime, they had a policeman standing right here guarding everything. Yeah. So I was so pleased, I said to Captain Canelli, I said, Captain, what can I do for you? What can I do to show my appreciation? Well, he said he put the man here because it was the job, but 
If I wanted to do something, there was this Christmas party for the kids coming up at the station house. E each kid that comes gets a present, you see, and that if I had something for a present for a kid, that'd be fine. So I gave them two watches, one for a boy and one for a girl. A kind of expensive gifts, all for kids, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, that's what he said, Captain Canelli. But then uh, he thought of the idea they could go to the boy and to the girl that was best in the precinct teams during the year. Not the best athletes, particularly, but the ones that attended practice the most and, you know, showed the best general all-around cooperation and interest mm -hmm. in the teams. They'd get the prizes for the year, the watches. Well, it worked out fine. I did it every year. I certainly appreciate it, Mr. Benfo. Oh, listen, it's the least I can do. Say, Captain. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, look, look out there on the sidewalk. What's that lady arguing with the Santa Claus about? Yeah. You uh, seen him around here before? Oh, yeah, I, I've seen him off and on this week with his doll and lion pot. Man, she's given Santa Claus what for, huh? I should say. I better go see what's going on. Oh, uh, and thanks again, Mr. Benfo. No, don't mention it. Don't mention it. And a Merry Christmas to you and yours. Same to you. Go away, lady. You bother me. You're bothering the whole neighborhood. Bother. All right, all right. All right. Now, what's the trouble here? Officer, he's now, a disgrace to the symbol of Santa Claus. That's only her opinion, Captain. Now, go away, lady. I I'm a very charitable woman. I'll help out any organization, anyone. I'll do my bit every time. Well, you did your bit. Now, go home. Now, you just keep quiet a minute, huh? Now, what's the trouble, madam? Well, I walked by here, and I said to myself, what a nice-looking Santa Claus. So I stopped, and I dropped a quarter in the pot. No. Then I asked him what organization he represented, and he got very insulting. I don't think he represents an organization at all. What do you want for a quarter, lady? An auditor's report? And I think he's drunk, too. A drunken Santa Claus is a disgrace to the spirit of Christmas. It's a horrible influence on the children of the neighborhood. Uh, give to the spirit of Christmas. <laughs> give to the spirit of all Christmas. All right, all right. Now, let's cut that out for a minute. Hmm? There's only so many working hours in the day, Cap. Yeah, I know, but just hold it. You see, know. he's drunk. He is, really. He can hardly stand up. Madam, I am not drunk. You've been drinking? I can smell it. I may have been drinking, but I am not drunk. I am as sober as a judge. Yeah, well, uh, what uh, organization do you represent? Uh, sir, I am a brother of church. What's that? I've never heard of it. Well, where are your headquarters? Well, uh, it's a worldwide organization. Yeah, but uh, where's the office? Well, we have no office. We spend no money on administrative expenses. The brothers of charity. Yes. Mm -hmm. I don't believe it. I don't believe a word he said. He's lying. Now, if there's any such thing, and you know it. All right, madam. Now, we'll get it straightened out. Uh, how many members are you? Untold thousands. You have a permit from the Department of Welfare to solicit on? The uh, Department of Welfare? Mm -hmm. Yes. You need a permit to solicit charity on the street. Our work is above the Department of Welfare. Our license comes from a higher authority. The spirit of Christmas. The spirit of Christmas. All right, the spirit, spirit of Christmas. Christmas. Let's put that away. Uh, now. Captain, every person that passes is an opportunity. An opportunity for a swindle. Madam, you've done your duty. Go home and attend to your family. Well, I will not stand here and be insulted. Good, I don't want you to stand here and be insulted. You have no license from the Department of Welfare? Well, as a matter of fact, I don't. But as I told you, the Brothers of Charity operate on a higher authority. Well, how many Brothers of Charity are there? How many members? Uh, well, sir, that's rather hard to say. There's only one member, isn't there? You? If you want me to make a rough estimate, yes, that's uh, about right. One member. Oh, what a disgrace. What a disgrace to the yeah. spirit of Christmas. Yeah. All right, Santa. Fold up your stuff here. We're going to the station house. Me? Yeah. Well, I'm sure glad you're going to get him off the street, Captain. I'm sure glad. I bet you are, lady. You go around making life miserable for everybody. That's your pleasure. All right, now, look. You keep quiet. Is it all right if I go now? You'll take care of him. Yes, Santa. I'll take care of him. Well, then, goodbye. Yes. And a Merry Christmas. Thank you. And Merry a Merry you. Christmas to you. All right, Santa. Come on. Pick up your stuff. Well... Yes, let's walk down to that call box. You know, Captain, the man is entitled to make an honest living. You're not entitled to stand on the street and give the impression you're soliciting for a legitimate charity. Charity begins at home? Maybe, but not at your home. Well, you've got to admit it was a good idea anyway. Yeah, a good idea, until you got caught. All right, now you just stand right here. You know, I, I know it's going to be a long day, Captain. We couldn't stop in and get a little drink. Before we go through the ordeal? Uh, no, I, I, I didn't think we could. Now, Captain Cronin, Box 17. Uh, send a car over here, will you? I've got a prisoner. A prisoner? All right. Okay. A, a prisoner? Am I a prisoner? Yes, you sure are. What will the children say if they find out Santa Claus is a prisoner? Paul Santa Claus is a prisoner. 
Well, Santa, you better start worrying more about what the judge is going to say. The duties of a superior officer of the police department in the city of New York are essentially administrative and supervisory. Consequently, it's not very often that he's in a position to make an arrest. But every member of the force is a peace officer. And it is his duty, as defined by law and the rules and regulations of the department, to take proper police action when an offense, no matter how trivial, is committed. After I rang into the station house, we waited at the call box for a few minutes until sector car number five, with patrolman Coley as operator and patrolman Farrell as recorder, arrived. Santa Claus and his paraphernalia were piled behind the seat. I got into the front of the car with the officers. They drove to the station house where I instructed Coley and Farrell to resume patrol. I then directed my prisoner to walk up the three exterior steps of the building and into the muster room. Yeah. All right. Walk right up to the desk, then. Eh? Oh, indignity. Indignity. Look, Captain. Lieutenant. Come on, a little closer. Go on. Put that stuff up on the desk. What have we got, Captain? Disorderly conduct, soliciting arms in public. 21st precinct. What's your name, Santa? Uh, Charles Edgar Edding. All right, 11. Edgar or Edwin? Edgar. How do you spell the last name? E-N-N-I-N-G. Edding. Stand up straight there. Don't lean on the railing. How old are you? Well, I'll be 58. I know you'll be 58. How old are you now? 54. Where do you live? Now, that is a question. Don't you know where you live? Well, last night, for instance, I lived at the New Gem Hotel. The New Gem Hotel? The New Gem, yeah. Where's that? On the Bowery, uh, near Pell Street, uh, I think. What do they charge you there? A quarter per bed per night. The New Gem, huh? I'd like to see the old gem. Gentlemen, before we complete the formalities, couldn't we send out for a nice little bottle of wine? On me? Ah, stand up straight there. You've had about enough wine. I All right. <laughs> I respect authority. Yeah, that's a good idea. Uh, where was this, Captain, on the street, 86 and 3rd Avenue? Yeah, that's right. He was annoying a woman. The meanest woman in the world. Absolutely the meanest woman in the world. Listening arms in public. That's Section 722, Article 7, Penal Law? That's right, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Let's see what you got in your pockets, Charlie. Uh, 25 breaking the dormant Stand Jacobi. still, will you? Yeah, that was a little difficult for me to stand still with He's here. nothing to hold on to, yeah. Captain. Come on, come on, make the effort. Okay. Captain? Yes. Lieutenant King wants to know if you've got a minute to talk to him. Uh, is he in the house? Yes, he's upstairs. All right, tell him to come on down. Unzip that, Charlie. Uh, yes, yes, come on okay. downstairs, Lieutenant. Uh, uh, this sacrilege. Zipper's on a Santa Claus okay. outfit. It's a plain sacrilege. Now, let's get into those pockets. Lieutenant King was right down, Captain. All right. Well, looks like you had a pretty good day, Charlie. Is that my life saving? Well, you're going to need it for your old age. Mm, here's some more. People sure believed you, didn't they, Santa? Hearts are filled with charity at this season. And you're just the boy to empty them. Well, let's say it. That that is my medicine. Medicine? Mm. If this is medicine, you should be good and cured by now. Well, you shouldn't expect too much for 79 cents a pint. I'm a great champion of domestic wines over the imported. Have you been hitting the bottle this morning already? Lieutenant, I must confess that's the second pint this morning. After all, it's an occupational necessity. It's uh, it's cold working outside. <clears throat> yeah. Well, you'll have plenty of time indoors to warm up. Don't you have any identification on you, Charlie? Yes, to return ticket to the North Pole. Uh, sir. <laughs> All right, never mind the wise, Greg. No social security card, anything like that? I don't believe in social security. It's creeping socialism. Hello, Captain. Hello, man. Where are you? Red. I heard Sergeant Waters went sick. What's the matter with him? Oh, you know, the virus that's going around that. He'll be all right in a day or two. Why don't you send him some of my medicine? Well, what have you got here, Captain? Aren't you in the wrong place, sir? That's, that's what I keep telling you. I count up the change, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. And I'm watching you. 25. Yes, man. Well, uh, I've got a little problem, Captain. Yeah. You remember you were telling me about the English bike you bought for your boy last Christmas? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, I had one on order for my kid. But the store called up this morning and said they were sorry, but they didn't think the shipment they were counting on would arrive until after Christmas. I don't want to disappoint the kid. 
Did you get a pretty good deal last year? Yeah, I think it was pretty good. Well, where is the place? I'd like to try there. They may have something in stock, and I could pick it up on the way home tonight. Well, it's a store called the uh, uh, Fairland Sporting Goods. It's downtown, Lafayette Street, right near Broom Street. Uh, you know, just, just around the corner. From oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah. Uh, you know somebody there I could call? Well, sure. The owner, a fellow named Dahomey. Just tell him who you are, and I suggest you just call. I've known him for years. If he's got anything there, he'll, he'll give you a good buy, man. <laughs> certainly get me off the spot. Well, you uh, try him, Matt. Oh, thanks, Captain. I will right away. Yeah, and uh, let me know how you make out, huh? Seven dollars, ten, twenty, twenty-five, thirty. Seven dollars and thirty cents. You verify the amount, sir? Uh, it, it seems all right. Okay, let's have the beer. The beer? Come on, take it off. I, I protest. Let's have it. It is part of my clothing. You have no right to take part of my clothing. <laughs> he's, uh, you got a point there, Lieutenant. Let him keep the beard. All right, Senator. It's seven dollars and thirty cents in coin. A handkerchief, an open pint of wine, a book of matches, an iron pot, and a bell. Sir, yes. here's your receipt. Don't drink any of the wine. It's safe here, Senator. I guarantee you. Court's in session now, and you'll be taken there for hearing. That's Upper Manhattan Arrest Part, Magistrate's Court, West 151st Street. Is there anyone you want notified? We'll make three telephone calls. No, 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 there's, there's no one. All right. Give me communications you're on here, Jacoby. Yes, sir. 21st Precinct, Lieutenant Gorman. One prisoner for Upper Manhattan Arrest Court, you be. Okay? Call wagons on the way, Captain. All right? Oh, me, my, my, my. Don't you uh, have any other clothes, any place, Charlie? Uh, musty? <laughs> musty, yeah. Well, I have a suit, or as you might call a suit, in the storeroom at the New Jam Hotel. Where did you get this outfit, John? From the storeroom at the New Gem. Do they know that you've got it? Of course. I'm supposed to play the part at the annual Christmas party. At the New Gem? Yes, it's a brilliant affair. Everyone comes. And the Bay Rum flows like beer. Huh? Everything flows, and I'm to be St. Nick. Not this year, Charlie. You uh, might be out in time to be the Easter Bunny, but not St. Nick. The law of the state of New York is quite explicit about the rights of persons arrested for a crime or an offense. If a court of competent jurisdiction is in session at the time of an arrest, the prisoner must be taken there for an immediate hearing. If no court is in session, a person arrested for an offense can post bail with the desk officer in the precinct where he's booked. When the patrol wagon arrived at the station house, my prisoner was loaded into the back. As required, I, as arresting officer, got in with him. We were driven uptown to Upper Manhattan Arrest Court, a part of the Magistrate's Court of the City of New York. There I unloaded the prisoner and took him inside to the detention pen where I signed him in, and an officer of the Department of Correction took custody. Then I went upstairs and made out a complaint against the prisoner. This was given to the clerk of the court to be docketed. I returned to the detention pen where I got my prisoner and took him to the enclosure just outside the courtroom. Then I went and sat inside the railing where the magistrate heard other cases. <laughs> Let's uh, see that record. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Can we have some order in here? Order, order in the court. <coughs> you seem to have been through every police station in the city, Willie. Now, you can't go around this city stealing little items in every store in every neighborhood. I don't know whether you're a thief at heart or whether you're sick. I think you need psychiatric help. Mail $500. Remand for... Special sessions. All right, Willie, step this way. <coughs> Through that door. Captain Cronin, case of Charles Edgar Henning. Okay, come on, Santa Claus. Uh, don't rush me. Christmas isn't here yet. <laughs> <laughs> Captain, you stuck your neck out a mile when you made this arrest. What will all the little children think of you? That's beginning to worry me, Your Honor. All right, Henning, stand over there in front of the bench. Well, here we go again, eh, Captain? Captain Cronin, raise your right hand. You tell us where this complaint is true. I do. Charles are getting a charge with violation of Section 722, Article 7 of Penal Law, and that you solicit arms at 86th Street and 3rd Avenue under 7th, 23rd, 1955, without a permit from the Department of Welfare while dressed Santa Claus in the annoyance of possession. How do you plead guilty or not guilty? Guilty with an exclamation, Judge. Hey, where's your range, you Inspector? To leave Miss Macy? <laughs> <laughs> we will not have another outburst such All as right. that. The attendant will try to find the party responsible and remove him from the courtroom. This is not a vaudeville stage. This is a court of law. You see, Judge, I am an honest, 
hard-working man. Now, wait a minute, Santa. Before you start your explanation, you've got to have something to explain about. What's the story, Captain? Well, about 10.15 this morning, Your Honor, I was inside a jewelry store on 86th Street near the corner of 3rd Avenue. I was uh, talking to the owner of the jewelry store on police service. From the interior of the store, the sidewalk could be plainly observed through the display window. While I was talking to the owner, I noticed this man, the defendant, standing on the sidewalk near the curb. He was dressed as he is now in the costume of Santa Claus. He had a tripod and iron pot, and he was ringing a bell, soliciting arms from the passers-by. Is this paraphernalia in court? Yes, sir, it is. Santa, you want to show me how you rang the bell? I just rang the bell, Your Honor, if you want me to show you. Yes, I'll show you. There you are. (laughs) The spirit of Christmas. The spirit of Christmas. The spirit... You observed this from the inside of the jewelry store through the window, Captain? Uh, uh, yes, Your Honor. He was soliciting passers-by, and occasionally I saw an individual drop a coin into the pot. That was the primary idea? After I talked to the jewelry store owner for a while, my attention was called to the fact that this man, the defendant, was engaged in an argument with a woman on the sidewalk. I went outside to see what was going on. She was mean. The meanest woman in the world. All right. You just keep quiet. You'll get your turn. Apparently, she dropped a coin into the pot and uh, made an inquiry as to what charity he represented. He couldn't give her a satisfactory answer. She started to argue with him. I learned he was doing this for the purpose of personal profit. It was 10.15 in the morning, Your Honor. It was apparent that, well, he'd already had several drinks. I placed him under arrest, took him to the station house. We found $7 and some small change in his pockets. I'm making the search. Also, a, uh, a pint bottle partially filled with wine. He admitted that this was already his second bottle of the day. Well, Santa, what have you got to say about that? That pretty much the story? Well, pretty much, Your Honor. It's the bare facts. But it doesn't get to the heart of the matter. I mean, the heart of the matter. Of course, I have to have money. I have to live and eat and drink. I take a drink occasionally, yes. But the money is entirely secondary. I decided to become the personification of Santa Claus, merely to give pleasure to the million of people in the city of New York, to the, to the little children and to the grown-ups, to stand in front of the stores on 86th Street and, and to greet the people and to say hello to the children and, and to ask them what they want for Christmas and give them all a kind word. To take crass commercialism out of Christmas. That was my object in the whole thing. The the money was entirely secondary. Now, don't give me a snow job, Santa. A snow job? (laughs) That that is funny. (laughs) Don't don't give me a snow job, Santa. It wasn't intended to be funny. Captain, did you notice him uh, spreading any good cheer along 86th Street? Did you observe him uplifting any spirits? Well, Your Honor, I imagine the only spirit he uplifted was his own when he took a slug of wine. I object. The fact that I required a stimulant occasionally to shelter myself against the cold isn't germane to the question before you, Your Honor. Where do you live, Santa? Well, I've I've seen hard times, Your Honor. I don't live. I exist. Well, where do you exist? Downtown in a hotel. On the Bowery? Uh, yes, in that general neighborhood. He gave his address as the New Gem Hotel, Your Honor, on the Bowery near Pell Street. You've been here before, haven't you? On occasion, Your Honor. Well, can you recall any particular occasion? Well, to tell you the truth... That's uh, what I want, the truth. To tell you the truth, my recollection isn't as good as it ought to be, but... I, I, I've been here. How many times? Well, let's say occasionally. On the same charge? On similar charges. I didn't have the opportunity to become a Santa Claus in July, you know. Were you here in July? Well, I was here when it was hot. I I don't know whether it was July or August. Have you been here since? Well, let's see. Uh, after the time when it was hot, I, I was away for a while. On a vacation? Yes, a vacation after the fashion. In the workhouse. What did you get that time? Thirty days. Have you been back since? Well, not here. I've been to the downtown court. When was that? Well, I would say October. What were you dressed as then? Christopher Columbus? No, just as myself. What did you get that time? Fifteen days. 
Well, you've been in as much as you've been out lately. The workhouse is almost as good as the new gem hotel. Do you have much trouble like this in your command, Captain? Well, not too much, Your Honor. These fellows stay downtown most of the time. Well, I should have stayed downtown today. It wouldn't have been a bad idea. Yes, I'm beginning to think so, Your Honor. All right. It's not a pleasant thing for a citizen to walk down the street and see a man begging on the sidewalk. It's a public nuisance, and it's degrading to our society. Now, you've been through here several times before. You said on one occasion you got 15 days, and on another occasion you got 30 days. If we take you back and fingerprint you, we'd find you'd been standing right there in some court or other at least four or five times a year for the past 10 years. Isn't that right? Well, I couldn't make a precise estimate, Your Honor, but I would be inclined to accept your figures. All right, see if you're inclined to accept this figure. 30 days in the workhouse. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Don't go away yet. I'm not through. Now, this is the last session of this court before Christmas. You've come in here charged with an offense that I said was degrading to our society. And you've come in here dressed as Santa Claus. Now, I don't want it on my conscience that on the last day I sit on this bench before Christmas, I'd send a man who purported to be Santa Claus to the workhouse. I know any admonition that I may make to you about staying off the streets will have no effect whatsoever. You'll be out there tomorrow grubbing nickels and dimes again. I've got to eat, Your Honor. And as you say, drink. In any case, the spirit of Christmas is upon me. Sentence is suspended. You, you mean I can go? That's what I mean. Adjourned till 2 o'clock. All right, now, guys, at 2 p.m. Well, Captain, I, I guess I beat that rap. Yeah, yeah, looks like you did. No hard feelings? No, it's all part of the job. I know, and I appreciate it. You've got your job, and I've got mine. Mm -hmm. but, uh, let me tell you something, Charlie. You stop doing your job in my precinct, or I'm going to find me a judge who never heard of Christmas. Twenty-first precinct, Patrolman Jacoby. Wait a minute, wait a minute, not so fast. He what? Well, who told you this? And so it goes, around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh and blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring, or the brass ring can catch anyone. Twenty-first precinct transcribed, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the Police Department, City of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Santos Ortega, Larry Haynes, Ethel Everett, Eric Dressler, Joe DeSantis, and Wendell Holmes as Santa. 21st Precinct is written and produced by Stanley Niff. Art Hannah speaking. Speaking.